Okay, that should be better. Great. Well, I am very excited about today. Um, again, my name is Jennifer Brager, the current president of Housing Land Advocates and a land use attorney at Tomasi Brager Dubay. Welcome to the Housing Land Advocates Conference, our first uh, hybrid live and virtual conference, fingers crossed on the virtual participation element working out, but I think we're looking good so far. If you are attending virtually, you can use the Q&A to ask questions throughout the day. Um, I want to welcome back attendees who have been loyally uh, participating every year for the last about 19 years of Housing Land Advocates conferences and welcome new attendees taking advantage of this virtual platform to participate from across the country. Before we begin, um, I want to just say how exciting it is to be back in person and to see all these lovely faces and to have a time together at, and at a day where I know our board puts so much effort into this conference every year and we look forward to a, a full debate about a, a range of topics and getting the perspective from people in the room from across the state who can inform how we look at policy uh, in the years to come. I do want to use this introduction to the conference to express our heartfelt thanks and to let the community know what our active volunteer board has been hard at work advocating on over the past year. We would not be here today without the hard work of our entire board who planned this conference, but special thanks goes to Sam Goldberg, who uh, without his effort, we wouldn't have anything going on. Um, he has just put in so much blood, sweat, and tears into this conference. So thank you, Sam. I'll... Also, Jean Dahlquist, Andre Tremolet, Ben Schoenberger, and June Bradley, thank you for putting together the, this great program today, spanning the legal and practical ways we can affect affordable housing development in Oregon as we look forward to the state's next 50 years governing land use. We have spent several months coordinating a dynamic group of speakers. In addition, individual board members are actively involved in shaping affordable housing decision making and policy development, whether on a day to day basis or strategically as part of our board work. Fair warning, you will hear a bit about our post acknowledgement plan amendment project or PAPA project now, but I promise by the end of the conference, you will have a clear idea of those efforts. Our co-founding board member, Ed Sullivan, has continued to work with others on the PAPA project to comment on local government compliance with statewide planning goal 10, housing, and is helping with the transition to a new liaison with the Fair Housing Council of Oregon on that project. He also continues to advocate for housing with the Oregon chapter of the American Planning Association and works on legislation and rulemaking. He writes and comments on housing matters in the Portland Daily Journal of Commerce, the Oregon State Bar, real estate and land use section, and other media. And he also spoke about Oregon's housing changes to an association of planning experts in Portugal last June. Sam Goldberg and Jean Dahlquist are our post acknowledgement plan amendment gurus who work in conjunction with the Fair Housing Council of Oregon to comment on the adequacy of goal 10 findings for changes to local government land use code and zone changes that have a housing impact. Ed Sullivan, Andre and I help in this endeavor. In addition to Ben's leadership in planning this conference, he has also been invaluable as the board's secretary. And Professor Sarah Adam Shane has participated on behalf of HLA in a range of activities in Eugene in relation to its middle housing efforts in her writing on affordable housing topics and inspiring a new generation of land use attorneys. Our newest addition to the board is Angel Falconer, who joined recently, the, um, and some of you may know her as the former city council member in Milwaukee, and she did a great job uh, to help turn out for the, today's conference and in agreeing to meet, moderate our climate session at the last moment. Um, Andre Tremolet and Kathy Wilde assisted in the board and strategy on legislative matters, including implementation of that Oregon housing needs analysis and advising the board on comments in support of legislation supporting fairness in citing manufactured homes. Both sat on citizens advisory committees for the Department of Land Conservation and Development as HLA representatives this year. 
And finally, June Bradley has taken an active role as our law student board member to put together a panel for today's conference and to help with our legislative tracking and comment letters on House Bill 2889, now House Bill 2001. Andre, Kathy, Ed, Sarah, Ben, Jean, and I have spent years as HLA board members and much of our careers advocating for affirmatively furthering fair housing. And we are on, on the brink of including that important language uh, uh, to affirmatively further fair housing in state legislation and rulemaking. And it is certainly an exciting time for housing policymakers. And HLA is just thrilled at this moment and to be having our conference at this moment while a lot of important work is being done in Salem as we speak. So I suspect that we have many students attending this conference and we encourage you to consider applying to be our student board member. You can reach out to me, Ed Sullivan, um, or Ed Sullivan, if you are interested, and June can also give you feedback about her experience with the board. So um, I'd like to ask the board members to stand up and be recognized. So thank you so much for all your work all year long. I also want to take a moment to recognize Housing Land Advocates as a springboard for many of our state leaders who served as board members in the past. Uh, Taylor Smiley Wolf is the governor's lead housing policy advisor. Karen Power is the state's natural resources climate advisor. Caleb Hugel is working as staff attorney for the Land Use Board of Appeals. Alexis Biddle is working as DLCD's policy lead. And Sean Edging is working on all of DLCD's rulemaking related to housing. And although not a board member, Mari Valencia, also at DLCD, had an early role in our PAPA project. We would like to thank our financial sponsors, Tomasi Brager Dubay and Winterbrook Planning for ensuring our ability to provide five scholarships to the Urban League and 10 scholarships for students to attend today's conference. In addition, we would like to thank the American Bar Association State and Local Government Section for helping to expand our virtual reach and to the Fair Housing Council of Oregon for Sam's time and for the use of their technology today to allow our virtual participation. We are making a difference in the land use planning process every month and look for ways to expand our reach. Please consider making a contribution of between 50 and $75 today to support all this work in the annual conference at housinglandadvocates.org or using our new Venmo uh, code that, that you can find around the conference today. Think of all the CLE and AICP credit you are getting today. Um, for those attorneys who are seeking CLE credit, make sure you sign in today with your bar number or email me your bar number if you're watching virtually. After the conference, we will submit, but we are volunteers, so it might take a little bit of time. Remain calm. You will get your CLE credit, I'm sure. Um, so today, our focus is on teaching you about what we've learned as a board and learning from you about how we can make our advocacy more effective together. So thank you for joining us today for this day of learning and inspiration to plan for a better tomorrow as we face the daunting challenges of realizing the dream of goal 10. And with that, I am going to do a brief introduction for our first keynote speaker. Um, our, our two keynote speakers today are the heads of Department of Land Conservation and Development and Oregon Housing and Community Services later this afternoon. And both of these women are kind of brand new. And they're brand new at a time that is wonderful, <laughs> a time where all of our work and efforts as housing advocates is sort of coming to roost and to develop new programs and new ways of thinking about how we can meet our housing needs. So I'm very excited that Dr. Brenda Bateman is here to join us um, and talk about her efforts at DLCD. Uh, uh, she's going to give us a look back on the first 50 years of the land use process and what the next 50 years are going to bring, particularly for Goal 10. Her background is in um, water resources. And I think it's interesting, you know, uh, we, we tend to end up in silos sometimes in government and in land use. I think we bring together everything in one place because how we live together is affected by the availability of water, transportation, housing design, housing location, industrial uses, all of this at once. And so 
it's it's an exciting way to see new leaders being chosen who bring kind of disparate different perspectives to their jobs. So I think we'll have um, a great time to hear from Dr. Bateman and uh, and then OHCS later this afternoon. And I think that these choices really signify what HLA has been doing for the last at least, I'd say five to 10 years is trying to break down that silo between DLCD that does the land use planning for housing and OHCS that funds housing and the housing production strategy that we're going to see coming out of the legislature and, and House Bill 2003 in the past and now making it happen and, and realizing how we're going to do it is just, it's, I'm just beyond words. I'm so excited. So Dr. Bateman, please come and uh, start our day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Brenda Bateman. I'm the Director of Department of Land Conservation and Development. I'm so pleased to be with you here today. Um, thank you for that very kind introduction. I was I was studying the name tags and the program and checking out folks in the room, and I'm thinking there's the titans of industry are here um, and have been, you know, it, you all have been in this space for quite some time. You're very knowledgeable. That's very daunting. Um, but then I was reminded there are some things that we bring to the table in terms of other experiences and other industries that I think are really key. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. So um, just by way of introduction, I've been in the public um, policy space, public administration and public service for the past 30 years, uh, the past 15, the most recent 15 of those years have been with the state. And so um, as, as you heard just a moment ago, it's my origins were in water, water resources, um, was with the water resources department for 12 years and co-authored the state's water plan, the integrated water resources strategy, integrated water resources strategy. So we were trying to pull in all the threads that somehow um, implicated or were associated with water. It turns out there are 18 state agencies that have something to do with water. And we're not very good at getting together and comparing notes. So it was really fun to work on that strategy and have people around the table for the first time comparing notes and saying, oh, no, we should probably be partnering together on, on that. Um, DLCD was one of the agencies that, that we pulled in and that was really that was really neat to see. From where I was sitting in my chair at the time, I thought, of course, everything revolved around water. Turns out everything revolves around land. Who knew? Um, but they're, of course, they're closely integrated and they're, they're so much more integrated on the landscape than we give them credit for in our bureaucratic structures and our management structures. We do tend to work in silos. Um, and, and, you know, the odds are stacked against us, even when we want to partner and we want to bring a joint program or project to the legislatures. It, they say, that's great, but you water folks, you go into that committee room and, and fight for your budget over there. And you land folks, you go into that room and you fight for your budget over there. And so we're constantly, just because of all of the structures all the way through our government, from federal to state to local to tribal, um, we're constantly just pulled, pulled apart and, and really siloed just for the ease of, of purpose, for budget, for policy. And those types of things. It's so so very difficult. Um, but I, from water, I went to our economic development department for the state. So the, that's um, doing business as Business Oregon and um, got a chance to actually work in the economic development realm for a couple of years. And so what I bring to this particular position is both a background in conservation and also development. That's the name of the department, Land Conservation and Development. It's a nice, it's a very nice mix for me. Um, and it's very interesting because folks say, how can you, you know, doesn't that make your brain explode that you're trying to do both things at the same time? And in fact, I think both are very necessary, right? We are going to grow as a state, but how we grow and how we do that, how we go about making um, everything fit together and balance across the landscape, that's that's kind of the, the beauty of it. Um, it's really hard work, but I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And doing both, I think, is possible and very much necessary. So, um, just a little bit of background in terms of who we are and what we do. Um, if you've ever looked across the landscape in the state of Oregon and thought to yourself, there's, there's something special here, um, I would encourage you to maybe just take a moment and think about your favorite place 
in Oregon, either the place that makes it feel like home, the place that makes you feel like you're connected, the place where you go to ground yourself and kind of get yourself back. Um, think, think about that for a moment. I bet you've thought of a place right away. Um, and I would invite you to just cut a popcorn if, if you want to shout out, what's your favorite, what's your favorite place in Oregon? Metolius. Metolius. Oceanside, I'm sorry. Okay. Other, park. which park? Forest Park. Forest Park. Arts Cove. Others? Bay. I'm sensing a lot of water <laughs> theme here. Any other spots that are your favorite locations? Smith Rock, very good. Okay, two more. Anybody else? Okay, uh, it's interesting. We've done this exercise, you know, with our commission, with our staff, with stakeholders, and the kinds of things that we get back are so interesting. You know, a lot of them are in nature. A lot of them are with um, beside water of, of some sort, rivers, lakes, coast. We also have gotten a lot of folks who have said it's the public spaces. I'm a people watcher and I like to just go where there are people and see what's going on. Um, but these are the, the places and the things that keep us connected, right? Either connected to each other or connected to nature. And if if it strikes you that Oregon is a special place, it's because it is. We've been very deliberate with our planning. Um, we had some some incredibly thoughtful, incredibly brave people back in the day um, put a system in place that allowed us to still have these special places. And so, um, of course, referring back to Senate Bill 100, which was um, put in place 50 years ago, 2023 is our 50th anniversary of that piece of legislation, and it really set forth our land use planning system as we know it today. Um, just a side note, we're, we've got a celebration coming up in May put little postcards out on the table there, but not enough. So what you might do is take a picture of the front and back if, if they're running out, um, because we'd like to invite all of you to an actual event that'll be in Salem on May 24th. In the shadow of the Capitol, we had this these grand plans of, you know, a party in the shadow of the Capitol. If you've seen the Capitol recently, it's under construction. So, you know, our grand picture that we had in mind probably won't work out exactly as we thought. But May 24th, which is the Wednesday before Memorial Day, um, we'll be out on the Capitol Mall from noon to two. And we'll just be celebrating with speakers, with music, with a bit of an Oregon market, a bit of a farmer's market, um, celebrating the fruits of the land and the, the types of uh, benefits that we have received because of our land use planning program over these many years. So we would love to have all of you um, join us us for that particular event. But we're not going to confine our celebration to one day. We're going to celebrate all year long. Uh, so we have a number of things going on. And the other thing that I would like to invite you to participate in is a survey that's up on the front of our website. We've opened the survey because we're asking folks both in, um, you know, face to face, but also in written form, what kinds of things do you think we should be celebrating about Oregon's land use system? Um, because there are a lot. One of the things that we we note and we, we try to, to tell folks when we're doing our educational programs is um, one thing you'll notice that's different in Oregon is that our cities are distinct, right? You can tell when you're entering and leaving a city. There's, there's, there's a visual cue there. Our cities don't run together. And it's pretty easy, pretty quick to get to um, farm and forest land in Oregon. Um, we've also protected our working lands. And we don't do that just because they're pretty. And they are. Um, but we do that because they are working lands that are part of our economy and that um, provide our food security and actually provide an economic benefit to us. That was the, you know, part of the original purpose. Those lands still exist. And that's not true in other states and other places. Um, so it's pretty special. It's something to celebrate. But we're also asking folks, you know, what didn't work out quite the way we thought it would? Where do we still need to do some work? And I know that will be a lot of the discussion that you're having here in the room today. Which things aren't working out for everybody? What things do we need to be focused on doing differently or investing in? Um, so that survey is up on our website. It's open to everyone. And um, I wanted to share just a couple of a couple of things that we've gotten back from it so far. Um, we we have a couple hundred 
responses. We're expecting many, many more. We'd love to hear from all of you. But the kinds of things that folks have identified so far, I think are pretty, pretty special. Celebrating farm and forest preservation, celebrating the fact that we've been able to pretty effectively contain, contain sprawl, that we still have coastal access, and that's not true everywhere, that we do have an emphasis on community engagement. It hasn't been perfect. We have a lot of work to do, but but it's there. And again, that's quite different than other places. And that we have a creativity and an individuality with, with our comprehensive plans at the local level, that they're, they're not all the same. They're quite individual and they play to the strengths um, of different communities. Some of the things that we asked about, what should we be doing differently or where should we place a greater focus in the future? I think we're spot on and are many of the themes that you're gonna to hear today in the room, um, the need for affordable workforce and other housing for better public engagement in local land use planning and for grants and plannings, uh, planning assistance for local governments, especially the smaller ones um, that don't have much capacity at all, especially for long-term planning um, and, and don't get a chance to do this concept of periodic review that is coming around again and saying, what's the new information that we've learned? What do we need to build into these long-term plans of ours? Um, we need to do a better job with data, maps, and analysis. Um, we do some, but really not nearly enough to be helpful at the local level. Um, my favorite one was more emphasis on water resources and understanding what water we have, where it is, and whether the carrying capacity of the land matches the water um, that we're requesting from it. Uh, and then the other one I thought was interesting was infrastructure maintenance. Um, and I, I, it struck me, it, it caught my attention because it, it struck me as being uh, very parallel to this idea of periodic review, right? Just like any maintenance program at your home or in your town or wherever you are, if you don't stay on it, you don't stay up with the upkeep and pay attention to the maintenance, whether it's a plan, whether it's infrastructure, whatever it may be, if you let it get away from you, it becomes overwhelming. And I think that's where a lot of our um, communities are at this point. We haven't truly invested either the time or the money, and we've let some of these ideas um, get away from us. And then the other thing um, that I thought was interesting in uh, what should we be doing differently or where should we be putting our focus was the concept of infill development and really placing much more of an emphasis and an investment there, um, whether it be brownfields or other infill, infill, there are lots of opportunities um, for using space in a way that we don't really use today. So those are some of the comments that we've we've seen so far. Um, I just wanted to <laughs> digress for just a moment and talk about how special it is to be able to ask these types of questions and get this type of feedback. Um, I did a lot of international work early in my career. My my undergrad was actually international relations, and um, and my master's was too. And so I, I had the opportunity to interact with quite a few international delegations. And at one point, um, I was able to host a delegation who was here in the United States from a, from a country who shall remain nameless. And we were having this conversation about planning and strategic planning, goal setting, and how we go about a two-year budget cycle where we try to figure out, all right, what, what more is needed? Where are we falling short? How are we going to get better? And they stopped me and they said, just, just to clarify, just to confirm what you're saying, are you telling us that you make it a practice and that you're allowed to question your agency and your government. And that, that was like really powerful to me that folks aren't allowed to do that in other places, not everywhere, but we are. In fact, that's how we operate, right? We're constantly asking, what's not working? What could we be doing better? Um, we invite public comments and we get survey responses like this, some of which are not very nice, um, but that's okay. That's okay. You get a thick skin and you, you invite the comment. You wanna know what people are thinking. 
what's not working for them, what's frustrating them, what's making them angry. Um, you know, even when they lash out, it's because something that we're doing is not working for them. Um, and that's that's how we get better. And that's how we do our work as um, government and in public service. Um, you can tell I'm, I'm emotional even now. This happened to me years ago. Um, but the fact that someone was just incredulous that we're allowed to question and self-critique and um, strive to do better, um, they thought that was amazing. They were going to see if, see if they could try it when they went home. I hope they're okay. Um, but it was such a special moment for me to think this this actually fits perfectly with what we do and how we do it, and we need to be doing more. Um, so again, invite your invite your comments and your perspectives in our 50th year anniversary survey. Um, I wanted to note a couple of the big policy items in our agency's portfolio. Department of Land Conservation and Development has, I was uh, telling Mayor Kaufman a few minutes ago, our portfolio is so much broader and deeper than I appreciated before I came to the department. It's really quite incredible for the number of staff that we have, um, the amount of issues and geography that we cover at the department is, is stunning. And so um, we are working very diligently, of course, on the governor's priorities around housing, and we'll be talking about that much more in the moments to come. But we're also very much in the space of equity and working with local partners, trying to model some behavior, trying to provide some guidance documents, trying to be in conversation about um, what diversity, equity, and inclusion really means when we're trying to engage with our public. Um, where do you seek out folks who haven't been um, invited or participating before? How do you make them comfortable? How do you make sure that you've um, included and and uh, reflected the comments and the concerns that they have? Um, we also, of course, have a quite a quite a bit of a climate portfolio, and I wanted to talk about that just just briefly here in the next couple of minutes. Um, so, one of the things that that our staff is working on is a, a climate vulnerability assessment. Many of you may know our um, climate change specialist, Chris Shirley. She's been out um, on the landscape in the last several months with, par with local partners conducting town halls and workshops and, um, and focus groups in communities across the state. And she's asking them specifically, and she's trying to use words that mean something in each community. She's, she's wanting to know, can you tell me how hazards and... Um, weather and climate have affected you. Can you tell me your story about fire and smoke and ice and flood and drought and sea level rise? I mean, the, the, list, the list goes on and on and on and everybody has a story to tell. And further, she's asking not just about you, but how has it affected your family and your health and your ability to earn a wage and your cultural identity? Can you tell us more about that? Um, and the, the feedback that she's getting is incredibly rich and also heartbreaking. Um, and every community, it's, it's a really good opportunity to see how every community has been affected differently, quite differently. Um, she's taking all that down because she'll then reflect that back out to our program staff and say, hey, this is what I'm hearing in communities as you're doing your programmatic work on transportation and housing and these other topics, you need to be very aware of this is what this community is going through. This is what they've experienced. This is what they're fearing for the future. And you need to build that, that information and that data into what you're doing. Um, we're so incredibly proud of that work. And that is also interagency work. She's she's working with our partner agencies across um, at the state level and um, bringing those folks to her workshops so they can also hear firsthand what some of the struggles are and so that they can take that information back and build it into their agency programs as well. So climate change is a huge piece of, of what we do at the department. Um, and then you may have heard, we also, um, our commission passed some climate change rules last July um, that were pretty sweeping in nature and are ultimately geared at driving down greenhouse gas emissions through vehicles. And so that the gist of it was designing um, communities and neighborhoods into the future that are more walkable, less dependent on vehicles. And so um, a lot of what's in there ties directly to what you're talking about today. It's how we're going about designing our transportation system, our housing, um, and the other components and features of a neighborhood. 
This is particularly exciting to me because as I take an integrated look at, at the work that we do, um, I want to make sure we've had a conversation with amongst housing advocates that as we get all this housing production out on the land, can we have a conversation about where it's going to go? And I know I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> you guys know this already, but it's really important to say out loud, we don't want to fling we don't want to fling houses along across the landscape and just have them land wherever, right? We want to make sure that they're directed into places where infrastructure exists and can support them adequately, where the folks who are going to land there and, and have a walkable experience can find jobs and you know their meet their daily needs through shopping, have a chance to be near green space or recreation and find all the pieces that make you know a good quality of life um, with within their sphere, you know, right right near them. Um, it's really important to have those conversations and be really continue to be really deliberate about where we put things uh, on the landscape. So our climate change work, I think is, is very much integrated into this housing conversation as well. Um, and then a couple of other things that we're, we're involved in or tracking as part of the 2023 legislative session, uh, renewable energy siting, both um, solar as well as offshore wind. Um, so that whole bundle of renewable energies, we're following that very closely. We're following industrial lands and what's going on there, and then housing, of course. So we'll have a whole other panel and a whole other conversation later today about the housing bills that are moving through the legislature at this point, um, how they've been bundled together, how some of them are moving super fast and some of them are on a more of a traditional um, speed but there's a lot going on in the housing space that we're very excited about that our um, staff has been integral um, and so have our commissioners and I should mention at this moment that I have a commissioner here in the room Alan Lazo who's one of our seven um, co commissioners at the um, Land Conservation and Development Commission this is a seven member board that each serve four year terms and um, and those folks are actually my boss um, there are about half a dozen of us agency directors that do not that are not appointed by the governor but are instead hired by our boards and commissions so this is this is one of them Alan's my boss <laughs> Um, let's see. So that that's just a brief look at our policy portfolio. And um, we've got folks who are here sprinkled throughout the room, um, including Alexis, who I think has probably stepped out for an emergency call, but he's part of our legislative team. I know many of you know him already. Um, and so he's been uh, hard at work for us in the Capitol every day, meeting with members and appearing in front of um, committees, providing testimony and providing, you know, factual statements about what this bill, what the impact of this bill or this amendment would have on either the programs and systems or the department itself. Um, and so we've got a couple of folks who are practically living over at the Capitol and providing that day-to-day -day input and resource to the legislative members. Um, let's see, I wanted to just end briefly uh, about talking about how folks can continue to plug into the housing process. I think um, probably our staff that are on this next panel and then also Director Bell, who will be here later this afternoon, will pick that theme up and, and run with it a bit more. But just wanted to let you know, we have um, this housing bill 2001 that's moving through the legislature very quickly and will contain a lot of the Oregon housing needs analysis work in it that we've been hard at, hard at work at the last several years um, that gets us to um, talking about calculating housing need and looking more closely at the housing production and accountability. But then there's a whole other bill that will be trailing along just a little bit more slowly through the legislature. And that's House Bill um, 3414. And that really is more of a, an intense look on the concept of accountability. Um, as we get our methodology and these other things under us, we get our feet under us, how are we going to make sure um, that local jurisdictions who have some housing responsibility are actually carrying that forward um, as, the, as the legislature would like? So there's a, an extra bill there that's trailing. Um, I think there will yet be additional bills as well. Some things are moving so fast that there will be, be some cleanup bills that trail along behind them and pick up some pieces and unintended consequences, fixing those along the way. All of that will um, 
come to an end at the end of June. The legislature is scheduled to adjourn sine die on June 25th. And so at that point, we'll know which pieces have, have passed through um, and what our programs and budget are likely to, to look like. Um, I just wanted to note that one important piece for us, as always, when we move through the legislative session is the department's budget. Um, and so that, yes, that's how we keep our staff employed and that's how we keep the lights on, but it's also where we, um, advocate for and argue for the technical assistance and the dollars that are needed from uh, that we want to pass through to our local partners. Um, one of the things that I've been doing since I started in this position was some meet and greets and some traveling around the state to talk to local um, city and county officials, um, both staff and electeds, and just kind of see what they're thinking, how things are going, um, what what's top of mind. And there are two things that are always top of mind, um, regardless of where I've been in the state. One is housing, of course. And the other right behind it is this idea of technical assistance, grant funding, and some manner of getting help for local officials who have no capacity to be working on this when they're putting out, you know, when they're dealing with day-to-day -day emergencies and putting out fires, how can you possibly get the capacity and the time and the energy to look out on the landscape and do some long-term planning. It's, it's even seems like a luxury um, in most places. And they've said, if, if you want us to be deliberate and thoughtful about what we're putting where, you've got to help us get more capacity, um, either directly from the department or through a consultant or a contractor or directly into staff, into these offices. So that's a conversation that we've been having with um, the governor's office and legislators to make sure they know, and they do, um, how thinly spread our local jurisdictions um, and and planning departments in particular, how thinly spread they are, um, because they, I know that they care, they want to do the right thing, and they've really got the heart for the service, um, but they've got they've got to get some help. Um, so that's a huge piece of the conversation that we're having as part of this legislative session. Um, how am I doing for time? I will take. I'm happy to take a question or two. Although I'll say, if it's quite technical, I'm going to turn to my staff for help. But um, I'm happy to to take a question or two. I think we've got a a moment. If anyone has anything you want me to address, all right, I'll be here all day. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. The question is, and the other question is, as our climate um, specialist is out in the communities and collecting information from them about um, their different experiences, um, will that information be made available? And the answer is yes. And I think maybe some of the early ones are already posted. Um, I'm not quite sure yet. But yes, the idea is that we we are collecting those ideas, of course, uh, you know, um, not attributed to folks um, and making sure that that's available so that other people who are working in these communities and in this space can learn from that and, and make use of that very valuable information as well. Yes. Um, I know we've spoken about the forestry as far as like more people out development versus urban rural spaces. Is there much integration when it comes to planning for forestry policy with development? Because that's where you need the most high opportunity in terms of urban renewal for forest planning, any of the public amenities that we really enjoy, and actually having a rich wildlife structure that can actually hold uh, more water um, across the into of the soil and make mm -hmm. much soil structure. There's no integration for like plants and flowers in terms of developers making buildings to end the thing for people. Yes, thank you for the question. The question was about the integration um, of, of urban design and forestry. And again, I note that Alexis is not in the room, but I know there's a the bill um, that's currently moving through that they've 
they've named the trees act i can't remember what the acronym is for um but he's hard at work on that um he, he have the details but yes that's definitely the kind of design that is anticipated and that they're looking at as part of this bill um i will note that uh, we actually not too long ago had a delegation um here in oregon from indonesia who were here particularly because well this is just the strangest thing they've decided to move their capital they gave up on jakarta and they decided to go somewhere else because of the traffic and just well lots of things so they ca they came because they were really starting over with design they said we understand you you plan here we'd like to have a conversation about how do you put a forest in the middle of a city and how do you put a city in the middle of a forest i was like wow um so lots of issues there and lots of really interesting conversation but we thought it was fascinating that they would come here just because of the reputation for planning and they're basically starting from scratch um and 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 what was even more interesting was that was the very question how do we protect our forests how do we protect what we have um even as we know we've got a huge population that continues to grow so definitely the the reputation is out there um but i know we still have a lot more work to do in that space so i'm gonna match you with alexis when he comes back in the room um i don't know how we're doing for time but yes on the federal Yes. Um, so the question is, are there federal funds available for the things that you're working on? And there are several, actually. Of course, our coastal program is our, is is very tied into funds already coming from NOAA. Um, and then our hazards program is very tied into to FEMA grants already. Um, we are looking with interest at the money that's coming that coming available through the Inflation Reduction Act. And in particular, there's a um, there's a slice in there for climate change and planning. What's interesting to us and slightly frustrating is that we think we have actually moved beyond what the money is available for the money that that we're seeing is for early planning and we are beyond that as a state we're actually looking for money now to actually implement and put zoning in place we're, we're so far down the road so we'll we'll continue to stay in that space but we went looking for specific dollars for specific reasons that probably won't match up real real well at this point we'll stay at the table on that and then of course there's hud um, funding that we're we're looking at our staff is very actively trying to make sure we understand what opportunities are coming and when for for our housing work and then the um the last thing is the economic development association administration eda um has dollars that has have been made available to us already for mass timber work um and getting that industry more fully developed here in oregon and possibly pointed at housing um needs as well Can you explain to me why I'm all about uh, Intel building? It's been I think it's sort of been happening for many years. But what is taking behind requiring high density uh, uses and eliminating parking at the same time? Yes. Um, so that actually points to the climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking that the commission completed last July. And the fundamental idea there is to um, help encourage communities to um, develop develop as they develop in the future um, to look at opportunities for less dependency on cars. Um, so that's that's two things there. One more dense development means that the services, jobs, education, and things that you need on a daily basis are closer to where you live. Um, but also trying where where possible to um, remove parking mandates. That is, deregulate parking and not require it, allow it, but not require it, so that um, you've got an opportunity to build houses today where traditionally you might have built parking lots um so trying to free up some of that space for housing and i know it's a very simplistic um response so we've got more folks in the room who who will be speaking to that later this morning as well should i take one more i'm not i don't want to okay yes sir um you're aware you're aware of the standard dialogue about the problems with the urban areas during the pandemic looking at what's occurring in cities right here 
is an opportunity, not you know, not not like a, a burden on the communities. Is your department? I know the city is thinking about this, but is your department involved in really a visioning process to really kind of take advantage of the opportunity of what you know, kind of where we are right now, post pandemic, as you're trying to figure out what the future is? How involved in your in your department? How involved is your department? I would say that we're actually probably a step removed from from a lot of those conversations because a lot of what oh sorry the question was um we've our urban areas had um quite a bit of an effect and, and quite a bit of a change um and and maybe now that presents an opportunity post covid but there there are a lot of things that maybe we could be visioning differently and is our department involved in, in any of those urban conversations. I, I think we're a little bit of a step removed because um, our primary clients and day-to-day -day, um, contact is with the cities and the county planning department, and then their primary contact is with the household level and individuals themselves. And so um, we're there as a resource to cities and, and counties, but we're pretty much setting the table with our 19 land use goals probably should have mentioned the 19 land use planning goals earlier than just now, but we were setting the table with, with those land use goals. And then from there, local jurisdictions kind of run with that and they, they use that to inform their comprehensive plans and then all of the implementing work that they're doing with zoning, permitting land use ordinances. So it's really at that level that a lot of the visioning and conversation take place. Um, we're always happy to, to serve as a technical um, assistance to that, particularly when it involves community engagement, you know, helping to maybe design and set up what that conversation looks like. But um, we haven't really been in the middle of the visioning itself and helping to shape to shape what the future would look like in each individual community. With that, I would like to thank you all so much. I'll be here all day and I'm looking forward to, to meeting um, you as we move through the program. Thank you.
I know we, we just started. We've already got a few crises. We're out of coffee. There will be more drinks coming. Um, also, if you're just joining on the live stream, uh, I do apologize for the uh, problems this morning. All of this will have a really good quality uh, uh, recording, so we're going to get that up as soon as we can. So if you miss the morning keynote, um, you'll have a chance to watch that in just a second. Um, but we're going to jump right in. We've got our first panel of the day on the future of Goal 10. Um, it's uh, about delivering on the promise, obviously, as uh, Director uh, Dr. Bateman was talking about. It's, we're, we're 50 years on uh, from the Oregon land use uh, system being created, and we need a lot more housing. So we're going to talk about the reforms needed to Goal 10 to make that happen. Uh, as well as to do it in a way more equitable than it has been done before. So I'm uh, honored to be joined by uh, our three panelists today. First is Alan Lazo. Alan Lazo is the executive director of the Fair Housing Council of Oregon, a statewide civil rights organization founded in 1990, whose mission is to end housing discrimination and ensure equal opportunity to housing. He has been a longtime community advocate for civil rights and social justice, especially in the areas of housing, homelessness, and racial equity. As Dr. Bateman mentioned, Alan is curr currently serves uh, on the state's Land Conservation and Development Commission and served on the state of Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development Housing Rulemaking Advisory Committee. Uh, he also currently serves on the City of Portland Housing Bureau's uh, Affordable Housing Bond Oversight Committee and Fair Housing Advocacy Committee. He is a longtime resident of Portland. He is also my boss uh, in my day job. Uh, Mari Valencia Aguilar is a housing planner at the Department of Land Conservation and Development. She joined the agency's housing team in March 2022. In her previous role as a housing and community development specialist for Washington County, she oversaw the county's Fair Housing Action Plan. Uh, she applies her fair housing expertise and her lived experiences as an immigrant woman of color uh, to her housing planning work at the agency. And finally, we have uh, an HLA alum, Sean Edging, a housing planner at the Department of Land Conservation and Development. He joined the agency's housing team in 2020 to support the implementation of middle housing and housing planning legislation passed in 2019. Uh, he has been the lead on developing legislative recommendations to implement an Oregon housing needs analysis into the statewide land use plan planning system. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to the panelists. Uh, we've got... Yeah, clicker. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Sam. And uh, thank you for saying all those nice things about you that I made you say because I'm your boss. That's not true. That's not true. All right. Um, again, thanks, Sam. Uh, as Sam said, my name is Alan Lazo. I wanted to tell you a couple other things about me. My pronouns are he, him. I am a um, Filipino American. I'm the proud son of immigrants from the Philippines. And now that you know a little bit more about me, I want to get a little sense about who's in the room here today, if we could. Um, and I don't, I came in a little tiny bit late, so I don't know if you all already did this or not, but um, just if you could just let me know today, how many folks here are, I know there's a couple of uh, legislators and lawmakers here. So how many legislators or lawmakers or elected officials? Okay. Thank you. Uh, how many, how about folks who are um, attorneys? Okay. And how about land use planners or other types of planners? Wow. So who are the rest of the folks? We have some students here today, right? Welcome. Fantastic. Um, and then uh, I don't know who else, who does that leave? Who else is here? Affordable housing. Oh, that's right. You're right. That was, oh my gosh. That's like my whole presentation. Who, how about the affor <laughs> how about the affordable housing or how other housing developers, right? Where are you? Right. Thank you. Wow. And then finally, uh, how about my people? Where are my fair housing movement folks? All right. And actually, there's a lot of it. That's right. So actually, there are some of us that are fair housing movement specifically, but all of us cross over into that fair housing movement. And, and I hope by the end of our time together today, you'll understand why that is so important. Um, oh, OK. We're going to slides. So as I jump into my presentation here, you know, I'm guessing that you probably weren't expecting this morning at this uh, affordable housing conference to start out with uh, what will be two love stories. Or I should say at least uh, one love story and another that's at least a burgeoning relationship. And I'll let you decide uh, which is which uh, after you hear these two stories. 
One of those stories, as you see on the screen here, is going to follow the relationship between this, this important section of the Federal For Fair Housing Act, known as Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, or we'll call it AFFH this morning. This was part of the original Fair Housing Act in 1968, and we want to understand how we developed this relationship with Oregon's statewide land use planning goal 10, adopted in 1974. So this is a relationship that has been nearly 50 years in the making and culminates well, right here today or down in Salem, we hope, this session. You know, I've been talking about this relationship between Goal 10 and AFFH for several years now. Um, I feel like this is like the, the fourth part of a series in HLA conferences. This is like the fourth time that I've spoken at HLA. In 2019, um, I spoke about the intersection between fair housing and affordable housing. We talked about, um, whoops, again, about how do we close the divide between specifically affordable housing and fair housing? At that time, there was a report that talked literally about how we bring those two things together. I use, you could tell this is from 2019 because the graphic is so ugly, but um, the, it was really a list of how do, the, the intersection between the work we do in affordable housing, that list on the left, and what it means to us in the fair housing movement, and that there's an intersection in the middle there that really probably is, is much bigger than what we see here. Uh, the work that we've been doing as an organization at the Fair Housing Council in partnership with the folks here at Housing Land Advocates over the last six years has been really around also reviewing and commenting on comprehensive plan amendments here in the state. Uh, you know, what we refer to as, for those that aren't in the business, post-acknowledgement plan amendments that, are, that come from cities that are um, making changes to their comp plans that is part of the Goal 10 process. And again, our, our role in that was really acknowledging the fair housing perspective in these important housing planning processes, but we still really hadn't quite developed this relationship or close connection between these two parties. As the work evolved over the last several years, I really I started out talking to, and if folks have heard me talk about this before, really referring to the, the fact that, that these two things were very divorced, right, from one another. But as we move forward, maybe um, so as not to jinx either of these relationships with that more negative connotation around divorce, um, let's talk about it, about how we see AFFH and Goal 10 building a relationship together as we move forward. And as we do that, I'm reminded um, of my own relationship. Uh-oh, you surprised me. About my own relationship story and how my relationship with my wife now of 23 years um, developed. Uh, and also just note there that um, it, it is our 23rd anniversary this year. I was smart enough to get married in the year 2000 so that I could keep track of my anniversary. So all credit to me. So, uh, so the Oregon Duck plays an important role in this because my wife and I were both students at the University of Oregon at about the same time, but we didn't meet there. And we really actually didn't know one another when we were there. We lived in dorms that were very near one another and we traveled in many of the same circles, but we never met in Eugene. As you saw from this next photo, when you look at the photo of the two of us here, it's clear that we were destined to be together. After we both graduated and left U of O, I returned to the Portland area, uh, did some jobs here and there in other places, um, and my wife left and went to New York City for several years. Uh, but we still, we didn't meet and build that relationship together until she returned to Portland and we were introduced, like so many other folks, by a mutual friend who recognized how compatible we might be. So why is it that this story reminds me of that relationship that we're trying to build between AFFH and Goal 10? It's because that wonderful partner of mine and I really didn't find each other and build that connection all those years ago at the U of O. And we didn't really build a relationship until the timing was such that we both got to the same place and began making those connections that build a solid relationship, despite how fated we were to be together. So it really does take a moment in time and a connection to build a lasting relationship. Goal 10 and AFFH are like that relationship that we've been waiting for nearly 50 years to build and have now finally been introduced and brought together after being adjacent to one another so closely and so closely related over all these years. When we look at what AFFH is next to what the intention 
of goal 10 is, it seems like there's a very natural relationship between them. Yet it's taken us nearly 50 years to build what should be a critical relationship that would be fully implement this statewide land use planning system. Sean and, and Mari are really gonna talk more extensively about the history and the nuts and bolts of goal 10 here shortly, so I'll leave that to them. But I'll talk specifically as a person in the fair housing movement about what is AFFH. So again, the concept of affirmatively furthering fair housing is a key component of the original 1968 Fair Housing Act. This has been the law for more than 50 years. It requires that, uh, it literally requires that recipients of federal fair housing, federal financial assistance, and I'm gonna leave that there because I don't know that it's clear that it's only federal housing. Um, there's a question I think about um, who is obligated here, but we'll leave it at that. That's a whole other topic, maybe the fifth year of the conference for me. But certainly uh, funding like um, community development block grant funding um, for HUD comes, comes under that obligation. And as HUD notes, the duty to affirmatively further means that jurisdictions who receive that federal funding need to do more than simply not discriminate. They must take meaningful actions to overcome patterns of segregation and foster inclusive communities. So again, when we think about the, what the intention of Goal 10 is, um, it is really about creating those communities through housing, meeting the needs of everybody in a community. So those two things really should have met um, long, long, long ago. AFFH calls on jurisdictions to remove barriers that might restrict access to opportunity based on uh, the work that we do under fair housing laws, which are civil rights laws, are based on protected characteristics, which at the federal level include race, color, national origin, religion, sex, uh, meaning uh, gender and including sexual orientation and gender identity, familial status, meaning families with children under the age of 18 and disability. And when you look at that, uh, that list or hear that list, it's really important to note that these are demographic groups. These protected classes um, are characteristics that we often identify with having some of the greatest inequities in housing. And these really is based in part on historical discrimination that's given rise to the need for fair housing laws we have today and for housing protections, but also have inequities that are perpetuated today. That was like the second or third year of the series that I, I presented here on, on HLA, so I won't cover that again. So, but again, while AFFH has been in the Federal Fair Housing Act since its inception 50 year, 55 years ago, it hasn't been well enforced um, because rules around affirmatively furthering weren't promulgated until 2015. And then those rules were suspended in 2018 under the preceding administration. And if you are following this work right now, there are actually new AFFH rules that are proposed to reinstate the 2015 AFFH rule. They were published just last month and comments on those new rules are due on April 10th. So, uh, so go out and take a look at that and um, provide comments to the feds if you're, if you're able to. What the rule, what it means for the rules of AFFH really prescribe processes for those jurisdictions that are obligated under AFFH and other entities that they have to undergo to assess the fair housing barriers in their communities. In the proposed rules, I think there's a notable change in this, in, in that really recognizes the importance of what AFFH can do in lots of processes, but particularly in housing planning. The name of the uh, plan that jurisdictions and other entities are required to do changed uh, was originally something called an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. Under the 2015 rule, it was going to be called the assessment of fair housing. In the new proposed rule, it's called simply the an equity plan. And so when you think about the elements that we are asking folks to consider under fair housing, it really characterizes that opportunity that we have in affirmatively furthering to bring those questions of equity into our housing planning processes. And we're gonna hear more about how those connections have been made in the evolving goal 10 process when Sean and Mari talk about that today. But at the federal level, these new equity plans ask jurisdictions to identify issues in housing in several areas, including demographics, segregation and integration, racially or ethnically concentrated areas of poverty, access to community assets, access to affordable housing opportunities, access to home ownership and economic opportunity and other policies and practices that are impacting fair housing. So again, when you, when you hear that list, and particularly for folks that work in land use or housing planning, 
Um, those are all factors that, that we've been talking about for a long time, right? So it's a little odd that these two things lived in dorms very near each other and have never really um, talked or been together. So again, we start to see, you know, really the important intersections between AFFH and housing planning, and particularly when we talk about this, you know, that um, this sense about where the work that we do in affordable housing intersects with the work in fair housing. I think what we need to recognize from this further is that, you know, I don't believe, as the title of our panel suggests, that we can fulfill the promise of Goal 10 as it was instituted 50 years ago until we build this relationship between Goal 10 and AFFH. You know, it might be odd for us to think about, um, and, and I think this is what that Venn diagram would look like when we bring it together, and the, the words that are here are actually what are proceeding in the owner work, the work that Sean and Mari are gonna talk about here when we talk about having fair and equitable housing outcomes. Um, and I think the nice part of the way this is evolving is we're not only talking about housing and housing production, um, but we're talking about fair and equitable housing outcomes. Uh, I think that that conversation, that battle continues about um, how we balance those tensions. Uh, if this were a different room with a different set of folks, uh, you know, there are some that tip the scales towards this production piece. You know, I think today I want to make sure we're tipping it toward the fair and equitable, equitable housing outcomes piece with some urgency from sound effects. Um, but again, it's, it may be a little odd for us to think about this, um, this as, as a love story. Um, but since we started talking about love stories today, I think it might be more appropriate for us really to think about and visualize our work together this way. You know, it might be a stretch for us to think about this as a love story, but I think for those of us in the fair housing movement, all of you who are housing planners, affordable housing plan, uh, developers, legislators, lawmakers, and, you know, those policy folks of mine, amongst us, these two elements finally coming together after nearly 50 years really is a welcome and much needed burgeoning relationship that will ensure fair and equitable housing outcomes in our all of our communities. So to give us the details of where we're headed with goal 10, I'll now pass this over to the real heroes and heroes of this love story, our practitioners from DLCD. Does that work? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Sam, for that introduction. And Alan, thank you for that presentation. I'm always all about love stories, and I'm happy to continue that on. Um, my, my presentation probably won't be uh, as amazing uh, and touching, but it will be in that same vein. So with that, um, I'm just going to get started. Um, today, Sean and I are covering um, the Goal 10 process. I'll strictly stay at a very high level and describe what the housing paradigm looks like in our state right now. And then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sean, who will uh, describe some of the exciting policy changes on the horizon to our paradigm. There we go. And I, I, maybe some introductions. My name is Mari Valencia Aguilar, and I use she or they pronouns. And um, some, I might offer some words of appreciation for all of your participation here today. And please know that I'm humbled to be here and excited for the discussion at the end of our uh, panel. So with that, um, let's just dig in some context. Um, we heard, we've been hearing about the statewide planning program's inception now 50 years ago. Um, our anniversary is coming up this summer, and we are excited. Since, then, since the adoption of our planning program, housing was a, was a goal that was included in that package. It's goal 10. And since then, cities have been required to... Um, to assess their housing need in their communities. The mechanism for how they would do so was strictly just by undergoing what is called a housing needs analysis, or also referred to as a housing capacity analysis. What you see here on the screen is exactly kind of a visual of what 
is in, included in a housing capacity analysis. Um, and I might just say HA, HCA um, for, for short going forward. Um, and I'm going to get into the details a little bit deeper on what's included in this analysis. But for now, um, I'll just say the main focus of the HCA is really to respond to the question of for cities, is there enough housing? Um, is there enough residential uh, res <laughs> residential? Um, yikes. Let me let me go back here. Is there enough residential land available to accommodate our housing need over a 20 year period? That really is the core of the HCA. That is exactly how uh, cities were responding to their obligation under Goal 10. Now, fast forward to 2019, just a few years back, the Oregon legislature passed House Bill 2003. This bill was a game changer. It was really to um, better support local governments, our communities in meeting their housing need expectations under Goal 10. Three components were included as part of House Bill 2003. The first one is a um, directive by the legislature for our agency, DLCD, and our partner agency, Oregon Housing and Community Services. Um, and we do have a colleague here from OHCS uh, in the front there. And um, together, we were um, charged to develop a pilot methodology to evaluate and, and allocate uh, housing need across the entire state. Um, Sean's gonna kind of go into a deep dive on this particular component in his presentation. Um, so I'll just leave it there for that piece. The second component of the HB 2003 was um, putting cities that have a population of 10,000 on a schedule to produce their housing capacity analysis. For cities who are within the metro um, boundary, they are required to produce their HCA on a six-year track. And then um, for those cities outside of the Portland Metro that meet that population threshold, they are required to be on an eight year track. Um, annually, uh, um, our commission, our Land Conservation and Development Commission, LCDC, um, adopts the schedule. Um, we're uh, annually updating it and we're um, ensuring that it's the most up to date as, um, as the years go forward. The final component is the most recent and I think the most exciting um, component that we've added to our Goal 10 planning uh, paradigm. This is really the connection that we were hearing about in, in Alan's portion. It's really advancing that affirmatively furthering fair housing mandate into local our, our local planning housing um, process. The requirement here for cities is um, for them to develop a HPS within a year of their HCA deadline. So on this slide, you'll see um, a visual depiction of the existing um, uh, planning process uh, for, for cities to ensure that they're meeting their obligation under Goal 10. Um, on the slide is the words that we saw also in um, Alan's presentation. It's really, it's the charge that uh, was adopted 50 years ago under goal 10. And really at the core, it is about cities meeting their housing needs for all community members, regardless of their income. Um, and essentially for them to be able to thrive. So, the first component, let's just dig a little deeper. I um, will not get into the very technocratic component or the details or the weeds of this, but we totally can on the side if, if anyone's interested. Um, but at a very high level, a housing capacity analysis has two components. There's a housing need piece, and then there is a um, land capacity piece. Collectively, cities are responding to that question of, is there enough land zoned uh, sufficiently to accommodate um, 20 years of projected growth? 
On the housing need, um, cities are obtaining a population forecast. They're pairing that with local housing market data and ultimately resulting with their housing need information. On the other uh, side, uh, the land capacity side, uh, cities are inventorying their lands. They're producing what is called a um, BLI, a buildable lands inventory. And here um, they are um, essentially uh, trying to identify uh, land that is uh, feasible and usable for residential use, feasible and usable and available for residential use. Combine those two components and that responds to the question of, is there enough land um, to meet the housing need over a 20 year uh, period? If the answer is yes, that's great. A city has accomplished their HCA. If the answer is no, there is another track that really is, that, that is about efficiency measures and an amendment. But really, the first step there is cities um, crafting what are called efficiency measures, and and those are strategies to essentially build up before they're able to build out. Um, and that, at a very high level, is essentially the HCA. Now let's talk about the HPS, the latest and greatest uh, addition to our housing paradigm. It is the, the heart at the end of Allen's um, eye in my eyes. And I, and, and I keep saying that because I also have been in the fair housing space and um, it's been a thorn in my side for as a planner and a professional in, in a year ago working on the affordable housing side and the fair housing piece and finally being able to merge these disciplines together. Um, and so I love that love story. The HPS requirement for this for cities is really a game plan. It's it's a it's a report a document that has a collection of strategies that are um, really getting at housing production, affordability, and choice. And so the elements within um, the HPS include taking the housing need that was um, developed or uh, coming out of the HCA and contextualizing that with quantitative and qualitative data. On the quantitative side, it's just um, cities are taking or are looking to various sources to kind of disaggregate data to add um, to add information to, the, to their housing need. So things like um, what are population trends? What are demographic um, trends in their city? Um, who owns versus who rents a home? Um, how, do, uh, how do people of color uh, bear or compare it to ownership versus uh, rentals, that sort of thing. And then on the qualitative side, it's a community outreach. It's about ground truthing that data and, and you know, filling the, the gaps with lived experiences that cities are hearing about and are very real. Collectively, all of that information then informs the city's um, set of strategies that they choose uh, to include in their housing production strategy. Um, there's a component, they, they submit this HPS to our um, team, and they're uh, um, at the midpoint period, whether it's three years because they're on the six-year track or four years because they're on the eight-year track. Um, they have this uh, midpoint period where they can evaluate um, their HPS, essentially really reflect how well they're progressing on what they outlined within their housing production strategy and offer the opportunity to course correct. Um, the housing production strategy is not is more than just zoning. Um, before I get to that, though, I do want to know in 2019, the housing team was undergoing rulemaking for the housing production strategy. Um, they crowdsource uh, a list of an, an intensive and an excellent list of uh, HPS strategies and organize them into these bucket areas here that you see on the screen. The first one being zoning and code changes. So there's a list of strategies that cities can um, uh, can include or could defer to 
that um, would uh, to update their zoning and code. But then there's also an, uh, 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 other categories that go beyond just zoning. And it's really getting at that intention of um, responding to not just production, it's affordability and choice by, with the selection of the other items. Here is a snap of just what the HPS menu of tools, actions, and policies looks like, um, just to give you kind of a reference. Um, but I think the more important thing is the collection of strategies and totality that a city includes must um, achieve fair and equitable housing outcomes under the six factors that you see here listed on the screen, location and transportation, fair housing, housing choice, housing for people experiencing homelessness, affordable rental and home ownership, housing stability and displacement. So really at the core, it's putting agencies in more of a driver's seat um, and, and, and putting them a, 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 on the driver's seat on housing production, affordability and choice and giving them um, that uh, space to be more intentional about how to respond to the question of affordability, housing production and choice. Um, that is the conclusion of just the planning process at a very high level. One thing I'll note before I hand it off to my colleague, Sean, is we have um, on our team have an exciting partnership right now. And that is with um, Commissioner Lazo here and his and the Fair Housing Council of Oregon and Dr. Andre Tremole, who her her name has been um, mentioned earlier um, in her Common Works Consulting. She uh, both are fair housing experts, and they uh, are partnering with us to help us develop a new module to better support cities in their development for their HPS. And really, it's it's about uh, um, ha helping cities meet that obligation under the fair housing factor that we saw in that previous slide. Um, we hope to continue to develop resources and tools to better support um, communities in the housing planning work that they are required to do under goal, statewide planning goal 10. And so this is just the start of it. Sean will talk about more too. So with that, I'll just hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Mari. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, this is on. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sean Edging. Uh, he, him pronouns, a housing planner at the Department of Land Conservation and Development. If you read the Oregonian, too, I also come across as a very grumpy bureaucrat, uh, which is uh, fun. I'm going to be talking. So Mari did a, an excellent job at setting up a lot of what the kind of current framework looks around uh, looks like, especially with the implementation of the housing production strategy. Um, and Alan, I think, really uh, just did an excellent job at crafting a narrative around the love story between Goal 10 and affirmatively furthering fair housing. What I'm going to be talking about uh, at a very high level um, is some work that kind of on the horizon is going to be changing a lot of the foundation of how we actually implement the the policy that is goal 10 and incorporating a lot of the the you know pieces that we've discussed today um i know there are a lot of people in this room who are aware and and are you know following closely a bill that is working its way through the legislature right now um that encompasses a lot of these these recommendations um i'm not going to be talking about a lot of the details on that I, I you know i apologize we only have 20 minutes um but i will for for those who really love love details um, I did develop a uh, kind of section by section summary of that bill describing things in plain language. Um, I did that yesterday, so we'll be distributing that today. I'll, I'll share that with Sam Goldberg, and you know we can share that with folks in, in the conference today. Again, if you really love the details. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Oregon housing needs analysis. On the previous slide, we referred to this as the regional housing needs analysis. That was a term that was borrowed from California, but we're not California and we don't like California. So we <laughs> decided to rename it <laughs> to the Oregon housing needs analysis, which which better reflects uh, its, uh, you know, Oregon specific approach. I I'm going to talk a little bit about the story of how we got here, because, you know, when you read this provision in the original kind of founding bill, House Bill 2003, it came across as a very kind of technocratic exercise. It directed us, right, uh, DLCD to partner with Oregon Housing and Community Services to prototype and evaluate 
a, you know, just a pilot methodology that estimates housing need for the state, divides state into regions, it, it estimates housing need, estimates under production, and, you know, has a prototype allocation to cities and counties within there. And, and if you were to look at the surface of this, it seems so technocratic, really focused on data and focused on, um, you know, measuring. But by the time we got to the end of the process, it became so clear that there were these foundational and systemic questions that it raised in the way that we implement goal 10 uh, in the way we've structured that implementation uh, that really warranted a broader policy conversation. So the legislature um, in 2021 kind of directed us, gave us some resources and said, all right, go facilitate conversations with people around the state, uh, have conversations related to this and come back to us with a series of legislative recommendations on the implementation of this analysis. And of course, in the short session when, you know, politics happen. Uh, they added to that direction um, with with actually a much more broad and comprehensive uh, direction to say, all right, you know, also come back to us incorporating a broader set of recommendations on what they called land supply issues. But really, it means come back to us with recommendations on how we can better facilitate housing production, affordability and choice too. And that includes um, building within urban growth boundaries. And that includes the UGB expansion process itself. So I'll start just harken back to the, um, you know, what both Alan and, and Mari have referenced with goal 10. And I don't even have to talk about that kind of intrinsic connection between affirmatively furthering fair housing and goal 10, because Alan did such a great job, but just articulating that the language that, that um, you know, articulates the principles behind goal 10 are really something that, uh, you know, set forth that we have, you know, as a state and at the local government level, responsibilities to implement policies that promote, and I'll use this phrase a lot, housing production, affordability, and choice, right? That's kind of, if you really boil it down into three words, that that's what it comes down to. I'm gonna be leaning on that phrase a lot. And, you know, as, as Mari kind of covered there, we have that historic document, the housing capacity analysis, that really has only focused on the you know amount and zone capacity of lands. And then of course, we also have added to this in 2019 with the housing production strategy that also adds to that, the uh, tools, actions, and policies that a city adopts or plans to adopt to promote uh, production affordability and choice. And in that implementation of goal 10, it, it became clear to us that there were just a lot of pretty substantial systemic shortcomings that were really reinforcing, you know, underproduction, re reinforcing patterns of uh, uh, exclusion um, and disparities between communities and, and really raised a lot of broader policy questions. Um, I think the first one that was just kind of most evident when we came out of the uh, analysis is that the numbers were way higher than what we were planning for. This is a consequence of the fact that at the kind of local government level, we were never really able to uh, plan for a variety of needs that very much exist, but but are just difficult to measure. Things like how many housing units should be on the ground today, but aren't. That was something that local governments never really were able to, to calculate or measure. But also things like housing for people experiencing homelessness, the effect of second in vacation homes because they take units off the market, that type of thing. And you know, just when you look at this consequentially and look at you know the local implementation of goal 10, we were essentially always missing a lot of housing production that that needs to be here even today, uh, especially for uh, subsidized affordable housing or just affordable housing generally, that was not captured in in analysis. So we were always planning for this underproduction that that happened. Um, similarly, when we look at the historic implementation of goal 10, it focused on, well, how much land do you have within your urban growth boundary? And if you don't have enough, you need to do something about it, either, you know, adopt these efficiency measures or expand your urban growth boundary. But that only focuses on one dimension, an important dimension, uh, uh, but, you know, just one of housing production, which is just, do you have land? But there's all of these factors that go into whether or not land is actually available and ready for development, right? You have to annex lands. You have to make sure that they're served with public facilities. You have to make sure that they're entitled. You have to make sure that there's all these different factors that go into whether land is going to develop or not, develop or redevelop, that were never really considered historically. And of course, the housing production strategy starts to address this. But again, there's, there's still some gaps in that implementation. And then finally, maybe to harken back to affirmatively furthering fair housing, 
one of the things that we found pretty consistently in all of the analysis that we did is that we have all of these patterns of exclusion that we see throughout the state, right? When we look at housing outcomes by all of these different kind of uh, demographic factors, many of which are protected classes, we can see that there are just consistently disparate housing outcomes between say like people with disabilities or communities of color, people over the age of 65, people you know, who speak English as a second language, they consistently have worse housing outcomes when you, based on the data that we have, and we also see that, you know, not only do we see patterns of kind of racial and economic segregation between communities, we see a pretty direct connection with the policies that we adopt and, and those outcomes. So just, just really noting that our, our policies really reinforce rather than affirmatively address these patterns of, of exclusion and segregation. I'll, I'll just talk about this really quickly. Um, on the left, this is uh, part of the prototype analysis that shows those disparate outcomes in terms of just cost burdening. That's just one dimension uh, between different demographic groups. But on the right, this is something that an analysis that we were able to do in the metro region because we have data on zone capacity for census tracts. And what you see, that this requires a little bit of explanation. On the left part of this access is the zone capacity of a census tract. This is pre House Bill 2001, so just keep that in mind. And then on the bottom here, the relative proportion of whiteness. So it's the white location quotient. So it's kind of a proxy for racial segregation. And what we found is that there's a direct correlation, specifically in the metro region, between the policies that we adopt and at least racial segregation, but we also know economic segregation as well. So just, just really putting a point on the fact that our policies very much reinforce this and our system of goal 10 planning treated individual cities and communities like islands. So they were always kind of planning to reinforce the dynamics that exist in their communities rather than a broader kind of shared responsibility among all communities in a region. So that gets us to the Oregon housing uh, needs analysis. We had gone through this entire kind of statewide process to really evaluate and not just deliver the what the legislature directed us to do, implement an Oregon housing needs analysis and work on these issues related to housing production, affordability, and choice. But we kind of knew that, you know, this was a broader conversation. We know that the legislature wasn't just interested in reforming the, the laws around goal 10. They want to see outcomes on the ground. And what what other factors, you know, some of these are going to be definitely connected to goal 10 and, and our work as the agency. But more broadly, if our goal is to achieve these outcomes, what what do we need to have at the state level too to actually achieve these outcomes? And so that really gets us into our policy recommendations. We have a total of eight in, in this report. Um, the first one really connects to that legislative direction, implement the ONA, uh, uh, work on these issues related to kind of uh, uh, land, land and, and housing capacity. And that's where we get towards uh, these first four recommendations, but the latter two are really saying we, we need to have these broader statewide conversations if the goal is to actually achieve these outcomes. It's going to require things like funding. It's going to require a much more coordinated governance structure at the state of Oregon to respond to housing need. And, you know, you might have noticed that there has recently been a bill that was introduced uh, that starts to address some of these pieces, specifically on the local implementation of Goal 10, and it encompasses some of these recommendations. Um, I'll talk about these briefly, um, and I'll talk about a little bit how they interface with Goal 10. Again, I'm not going to get into the details, uh, but if we look at Recommendation 1, there's really kind of four major recommendations that are kind of incorporated into this bill. The first one is actually establish this program by which we estimate housing need at the statewide level, en encompass all of those things that we have been historically not really counting, and have an allocation process to, to cities that they really use as the basis for their housing planning. So that's the first recommendation. That's you know the, the core of the Oregon housing needs analysis. The second one seems very obvious, but is not um, something we do, which is to articulate goals and track outcomes over time. Um, so the basic premise of this is, hey, we should articulate how much housing should we build over you know a period of time six or eight years is kind of the 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 that time frame and let's use that as the basis for tracking and evaluating how are we doing not just on production but publicly supported production how are we doing on different uh indicators to the best of available data on things like equity um and let's use this as the basis for kind of evaluating our progress over time 
The third one really connects into, you know, we've talked about this housing production strategy, which kind of serves as this game plan that cities take on for, for you know, addressing production affordability and choice. Let's make that the centerpiece of goal 10. And let's really ramp up the state's role in articulating the types of kind of off the shelf policy options and, you know, just different things to support local governments in, in supporting production affordability and choice. And then the fourth one is let's also think about, you know, as part of our legislative direction, that idea of kind of land capacity and really facilitating and preparing land for development. And, you know, some of that relates to the urban growth boundary in terms of providing cities more, you know, readily available methodological options to make the process more straightforward. But a lot of it really relates to that other piece, like let's get land ready for development. Right. And and really ensure that the conditions are right to ensure that, you know, what what home builders would refer to as shovel ready um, to ensure that we're actually able to kind of, you know, build. Um, but then we also incorporated other pieces into this. One of the, I think, kind of major tie ins with affirmatively furthering fair housing is articulating like we've talked about these principles that we share, but we're never they were never reflected in the statute. Right. So let's make that very clear. Let's let's articulate that goal that the the the, you know, what we're trying to do is affirmatively further fair housing. We are trying to explicitly plan for things like accessible housing, right? We're trying to explicitly address, you know, these fair and equitable housing outcomes, address kind of these disparate impacts that we see between communities. And that's part of our obligation under goal 10. And then finally, um, it implements part of a conversation that we've had of saying like, well, hey, local governments have all of these things that they're doing. We really need regional governments and the state government to step up. Um, some of these are ongoing conversations, but there is a piece in here on the metro piece with a, a, a kind of housing coordination strategy. But one of the things I do want to also note is that there are some pieces that are not encompassed in this bill. We know it's going to take a lot of funding, right, to actually build the housing that we need to see on the ground, especially affordable housing, right? Um, and very importantly, uh, we need some type of way of coordinating the state response around production affordability and choice. We we have all of these different silos that exist between communities. I think a previous question raised the, you know, federal funds on things like, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act. We're going to have a bunch of infrastructure investment coming in that we can leverage for the purpose of supporting production. But, you know, I don't have any ability to go to ODOT, DEQ, Business Oregon and talk to them about like, hey, let's, let's you know, be thoughtful and let's let's leverage this funding for the purpose of of addressing the housing crisis right and and part of that really relates to this kind of systemic shortcoming on having this coordinated structure i'll add that obviously this these both are these are huge priorities of both the legislature and the governor's office we expect there to be a lot of policy work around here but they are broader statewide conversations if I can just talk through the implementation, and again, I'm sorry, this is just not going to be enough detail for I know everybody in the room. What this, what the kind of sum total of these policy recommendations are going to equal is kind of a change in the way that we implement goal 10 on the ground at the local level. It's going to relate to planning for a lot more housing, especially affordable housing. It's going to relate to how cities translate that into housing types, characteristics, and location. It's going to relate to how they think about land and prepare land and get it quote unquote development ready. And of course, also expand a UGB when a need is identified. Um, but then they also connect into the housing production strategy, really articulating all of these kind of off the shelf policy options that support production affordability and choice um, and uh, affirmatively further fair housing. And then, of course, also implementing this feedback loop, actually evaluating our progress over time. How are we doing on production? How are we doing on affordability? How are we doing on equity? Right. And using that as the basis for uh, evaluating our progress and, and implementing future actions. I also want to mention, too, one important part of this uh, bill that was uh, really, you know, um, developed during the legislative session and, and led by the chair of the House Committee on Housing, uh, Representative Maxine Dexter, um, is this piece on housing accountability, building a framework that that connects into that that feedback loop that says, are we doing everything we can, both at the state and local government levels, to really pull the levers to support production affordability and choice. And again, I won't get into the details, just recognizing time, but it really tries to articulate this framework to say, hey, if we're not meeting our goals, we should evaluate that. We should look into it. What are the barriers that are happening at the state and local levels uh, uh, 
that might be inhibiting housing development. And let's use that as the basis for kind of an agreement between DLCD and local governments to not just address you know, local barriers, but also bring in to the extent that we can state funding and resources to bear to really start to address some of those barriers and support production affordability and choice. There's gonna be a lot that we need to articulate around this in terms of how DLCD and LCDC partner with our local jurisdictions to implement this in a thoughtful way and really recognize, and you see this in the policy, to distinguish the, the you know, things that are inside of a local government's control and within DLCD's control, and the things that are, you know, definitely outside of it and things that we need to be continuing to partner, um, things like infrastructure funding, you know, all those types of things. What I'll add to this, is that you know this policy is not going to be the end of this work if anything it's the beginning we have a lot that we need to do on implementation to actually make this a reality um i'll add uh you know we're going to be doing a lot of rulemaking next biennium it's pretty rare that i would describe a rulemaking as fun uh but <laughs> this is actually going to be be that because our job next biennium in addition to standing up all these different programs is you know, providing a lot of options, right? Be they methodological or assumption type options for how to get through the goal 10 and goal 14 processes, um, but also like off the shelf policy options, like providing like permit ready plans for, you know, diverse housing types, right? That type of thing. And, and off the shelf policy options related to public facilities, uh, related to, you know, any variety of things that, that can be implemented that really support production affordability and choice. I'll also add that we are gonna be hiring uh, in the next couple of months uh, <laughs> to really build out a much more strong and robust program. I haven't even talked about the Housing Production and Accountability Office, which is a priority of the governor's office that will also be stood up over this time. We're going to need a lot of like bright like policy minds and and practitioners to help us actually achieve this this program. And also I need a vacation. So please, <laughs> please apply to DLCD. <laughs> and I know there's also a lot of attorneys in this room too. Part of that is going to be, I mean, you know, DOJ is going to have a, a, a role in this as well too. So, you know, please consider um, joining our team. Um, and I'll also add, you know, as part of this, we, we also expect this work to continue. One of our kind of transitions as this policy moves forward is to pivot. And this is just a preview, so don't read too closely into this. This is still a draft. Uh, but pivoting from, um, you know, working on kind of the, the, the policy and technical refinements towards how do we actually communicate this with our, our local government partners, communicate this with the public, and really, you know, describe like what's in this policy, what's going to be changing on the horizon, and trying to articulate that. This is just an example of, you know, kind of a uh, like graphics heavy, plain language explainer that's not super plain or speak that we can distribute to folks. Um, but there's going to be a lot of additional materials. Of course, that section by section summary of the bill is something that should be coming out today and we'll be sharing it with folks in this conference. Um, but with that, I think we can move on to talking through questions. I, I know there was a lot that I didn't cover in the details, so we're, we're happy to speak to that. Sean, before you move on, I also just want to, oh, yeah, Sean, thank you so much. I get to hear Sean speak about this a lot, like over the last several years, and it's amazing every single time that Sean and Mari speak, it's just more and more really great stuff. So thank you. I just want to take a moment to note that, um, you know, we aren't at this moment by accident. And, and if you don't think, um, if, if you don't think it's important that we have conferences like this, that we have advocacy from folks like Housing Land Advocates, um, then you're not paying attention to how important this moment is. This is a watershed moment in the implementation of Goal 10, right? I can imagine that 50 years ago in a room um, before SB 100, there was a, a, a group of advocates like this saying, we need to do something about the way land use works in our, in our um, state. And that was the result of that was SB 100. Over the last four or five years, um, the, this has been the last part of the conversation with folks like HLA. Folks like Ed Sullivan have been having this conversation his entire career, right? But this is the result of that. Um, and I think we, we should take a moment to celebrate that. Uh, so, so Ed, everybody else here, thank you so much for the work that you all have done to continue to push these two pieces together and to get to the place we are today. I also will note, as Sean said, this isn't the finish line. Um, there is work ahead of us in rulemaking and making sure that the implementation around production, affordability, and choice um, are balanced, right? And that's a, a fight to come too. So thank you all for the work that, that you're doing um, around uh, pushing these two pieces together. A fun fight. <laughs> What are we about?
All right, thank you. Uh, we're gonna jump into questions. I know this is gonna be really annoying, but I wanna fully incorporate the audience on Zoom and make sure that you they get picked up on the recording. So there is a microphone right there. So if you're in the room and you have questions, please use that microphone. Um, I will also be reading off of the, uh, the Q&A from here. Um, so if you have questions, go ahead and go over there. Jennifer, were you gonna kick things off? I just wanted to make a, a comment or two. Um, one is that we would be remiss if we didn't know that Governor Kotek is a champion, absolutely uh, has paved the way for these bills to move through in the last session. And, uh, you know, I think Sean said that it's hard for him to reach out to some of the other organizations that are going to be getting federal funding. But I would say that the governor has passed some executive orders that call exactly for that kind of coordination. So don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Um, and, and so I'm excited to see what comes from that. And then I also want to say that, um, you know, this doesn't have to be scary. I've talked to some other lawyers uh, who are, you know, kind of approaching a, a more senior status in their practice, people I kind of grew up under, and they're like, oh, it's a young person's game. Some some younger people are gonna have to figure this out. But um, I think people like Sean and Mari are putting together the toolkits that practitioners are gonna need to pay attention to and learn about. So really appreciate you taking these steps today to introduce and know that you're building capacity in, in DLCD to to teach us all how to do this better. So thank you. And um, I know there's a line forming, so don't be shy. Hello, my name is Shane. My pronoun she, they. I represent, I was a board member of Portland Neighbors Welcome, a grassroots housing advocacy and uh, renters coalition i'm curious when it came to affh you were stating that sex was a part of the protected classes which includes gender identity and things like that i would like to add my sense of urgency um, as a trans feminine person who's been transitioning for four years and i've always taken for granted um, the um, acceptance and variety of sexual diversity that's within our region specifically in the northwest on the west side of the mountains um, not that there aren't rural queers around the reason that i bring up that sense of urgency is that right now there are over 30 states in this union that are criminalizing people like me. When they say, oh, it's just against drag queens, there's language in Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi that specifically states, if you present as a gender not co conducive to your biological sex, that you are essentially committing a misdemeanor and you can be arrested for felony. So me walking now, being honest about who I am as a person and all the people that are moving to this region who are trans or queer or gender diverse, I feel the sense of urgency on a federal level, but also on a personal level, because for the last 10 years, I've lived in this region for 34 years. The last 10 years, I have been displaced again and again and again and again. I've lived in seven different homes in the last two and a half years, and I have witnessed the most high opportunity neighborhoods um, that have a lot of great drag shows and a lot of people who say yes, queen, but at the end of the day, they don't say yes, housing. They don't. And I just wonder, it's a two-part question. How can there be more codified language within our ONA or any aspect of our legislative practice that does include queer, gender diverse, and trans people? Because when I saw on the PowerPoint, P um, POC, um, uh, people with disabilities, there's all different metrics that I see categorized and recorded, but I have never seen an agency ask, are you a part of the LGBTQI community? And do you feel safe with your housing? And do you also feel economic opportunity? Because I'm related to that. We trend a lot for poverty. Trans feminine women on average experience poverty at a rate three to four times higher than our cis counterparts. And so in terms of working my anger and resentment and turning into action, turning into good stability for me, a good paying job for me in this industry. I just, I know that's a lot of talk and I apologize for that. It's just, I feel such a severe sense of urgency of housing the rainbow because over the next five to 10 years, we should be expecting more, especially 60% of homeless youth are queer. When 
Queer people are one out of 10 in the population, yet we trend 60% for youth homelessness. That horrifies me and it makes me deeply sad. And I just want to impress the urgency and ask, is there any way that we can codify this language and be more mindful about collecting this kind of data? Because I really think Oregon has been pushing the envelope in terms of transgender health care and everything else. But if we don't codify and share the language and include community members who are in the working class queer communities, I just don't think we're going to make progress on that. And we wouldn't be fully meeting goal 10. So I, I thank you for your time. Yeah. And, but, and in this response, like, I don't want to in any way, shape or form, like downplay the urgency that you raise too. I do want to, you know, maybe, maybe speak to the fact that I, I think it is, it is codified in statute because affirmatively furthering fair housing, it includes state and federal protected classes, a state protected classes, gender identity, and, and specifically bringing, you know, housing the rainbow. I don't want to say that there aren't going to be challenges to that, especially in things like data collection and how you actually address that through policy. Um, but it is, it is a part of the, the, you know, it is part of the codification. Um, but no, just definitely want to emphasize like that. That's a, it's going to be a huge challenge, yeah. right? I mean, I think a lot of this, uh, we've we've definitely heard a lot, even on the accessibility front too, with, you know, people with disabilities having a need for a much greater diversity of housing options for them that don't currently exist. And it's never really been a part of the the framework or, or statute to start to, to address that. I don't want to frame this as like the perfect policy, but it is definitely a step in the right direction for actually articulating that this is a value that we, that we have a responsibility for. So... Okay. And Alan, if you want to add to that, please. Yeah, I think the one thing I'd add, thank you, Sean and Shay, is, is exactly that. It, I, I do agree that I think it is codified there. What what the piece that's missing is is exactly how do we identify uh, what the issues are and how do we get to the data that that um, that allows us to to bring forward policy solutions. And I think that's actually true across many of the protected classes, um, and partly because the Fair Housing Act protects some identity around having to, to reveal those identities, right? So we all sometimes can't gather that data that we need. And so we need to understand how to balance policy with um, with those decisions with that, with that um, what's in the law. And, and so I think that's true for all protected classes. Um, so that I think is the work for advocates is to really bring forward um, what works for communities as far as methodology and and getting to policymakers to understand um, that this is the data that that you just pointed out. I may I also add just um, something quickly to one, just offer words of um, celebration and appreciation for your bravery and just you know. Um, letting us in to to. Um, to kind of a, a your life your lived experience that is um humbling and i i think that's the 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 type of energy that we embody to continue to do this work i think you're right i think we're on the trajectory of uh advancing goal 10 and we've got a lot of work to do we're not meeting the needs of all folks and all of their identities that they carry. Um, I will say on the federal side, on the AFFH, just because I do have experience through the analysis of impediments, the, the body of work that happened prior to um, 2015, which would have been the assessment of fair housing, and then potentially at the end of the year could be the equity plan that Alan referred to. There is a significant, at that time, the, there was a significant requirement for engagement. And that is really the only place where I've seen folks actually, or at least at Washington County, we went out and asked all folks and had a conversation about what do queer people need as it relates to their housing? How can we meet? So there's learnings from the federal side that will definitely be bring it, bringing into the land use side. And I think that's the that's the thing that we've been talking about, merging these two disciplines to continue to do better work for all people. So I appreciate that comment and, and, and thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks. Uh, you can go ahead and come up to the mic. I want to go to the uh, question from the Q&A real quick from Ellen. Uh, putting forward financial incentives, reducing regulatory barriers, having a robust data collection, supporting housing production strategies. One thing I think our city struggles with is the market factors at play right now, causing development to be incredibly difficult, especially housing for lower income residents. The amount of subsidy needed to get affordable housing development off the ground has increased substantially in the last few years. The amount needed for permanent supportive housing to transition people from homelessness is staggering. Land is so expensive within the UGB. How do we bridge the gap with implementation? Yeah. Um, so remind me who asked this question. Was this from the, the this chat? Is, this is from the chat. Yeah. This is uh, from this is Ellen. I'm sorry. I, I think City of Eugene. Oh, um, City of Eugene. Okay, great. Yeah. No, I think um, so. I think what they're pointing at is the idea of like, you know, we've been having these conversations for a very long time about like, what is the extent to which we need public support for housing versus, you know, what is going to be really related to the market. And I think what the the intent of this approach in that's articulated in policy just as, at a really high level is to say yes, and you're not going to meet this through uh, just emphasizing publicly supported housing, you're also not going to meet this by ignoring market factors, right? And uh, really, the intent of this is to say, not only is there, you know, an obligation to really think about this holistically, enabling the existence of publicly supported housing in communities, um, but also thinking through critically, what are the different market factors that can inhibit the production of housing, be it uh, lengthy entitlement and review processes, be it infrastructure financing and support uh, and public facility standards, be it housing diversity and what we allow in areas, right, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, diversity. And also articulating, too, that there's a role that the state government and honestly the federal government, but we can't control what the feds do, um, that's, that states like we, we need to step up in partnership with our with local governments to really ad address holistically all of these barriers that happen. Yes, some of them are local, some of them are state, right? Um, and, and really articulating like we need to, to, to align those resources and policy initiatives in a way that supports production affordability and choice. It, it really has to be an all in approach. And again, I don't want to say that this policy is perfect, but it is a step in the right towards that, if that makes sense. Thanks. Uh, go ahead. Great, thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists, uh, Mari, Sean, Allen. Uh, I first wanna start by acknowledging where we're at today in the Native American Student Center um, of PSU. Uh, there are some really beautiful flags around us and some really beautiful art, and I'm really honored to be in this space today. Um, Celestina Teva, she pronouns. Um, and I'm a little bit uh, worried about uh, diluting the word equity in this work. Um, and I wanna ask you all what you think about the phrase fair and equitable outcomes and what those outcomes actually are. And if we are actually prepared to shoot for equitable outcomes, um, because in my uh, experience and my understanding, so most of what we have uh, to shoot for right now in terms of the policy frameworks that we're working with is equality and equity isn't equality. Um, and so I want to ask us what we mean when we say fair and equitable housing. I am so grateful for the Fair Housing Council of Oregon for you being here. Uh, I've seen so many of Shayla's presentations and she's fantastic. So thank you for doing this work. Um, and my understanding of that framework is an equality based framework. And um, I, I really want to push us if we're going to be using the word equity in our outcomes and in our goals and in our policy, if we actually are going to have the teeth to say, what does it mean to give more where there has been less um, and not just to shoot for equality? I Thank you for that question. And, and, and it's a loaded question because the answer is no, quite frankly, right? Um, and and it's because this is a, is a, this isn't a matter of whether or not that's the right thing to do, uh, it's a matter of will, right? I, I, there's no doubt that we shouldn't be aiming for equitable outcomes, that we should be aiming for just outcomes. We simply don't have the will to do that. And, we, and, we, and can a room like this build that will? Um, maybe, maybe in the next 50 years. 
Um, but where we are today is exactly right. 50 years ago, when we implemented the Fair Housing Act, it was also about equality and not necessarily justice. Right? All the Fair Housing Act did was stop discrimination at that point in 1968. It didn't redress everything that had led up to needing the Fair Housing Act and the inequities that were created that persist today. And it took us 50 years to marry these two things to actually address that in land use planning, right? When you talk about, uh, three years ago when we talked about this, uh, land use planning was created initially uh, around race. It was created, created to exclude um, by race. So it shouldn't surprise us that um, 100 years after that was created, it continues to perpetuate that same thing as Sean showed us in his graphic. So there, we could um, go that way policy-wise, um, but we simply don't have the will to do it, and this is as far as we could get. That's that's what I'll say about it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, I'll, I'll add to, you know, I definitely take um, in, in, in this work kind of an implementation philosophy, the idea that as a practitioner, there's a lot that we can do to improve where we are today and, and, and build a better tomorrow. Um, it, it depends on the details. It depends on a lot of the things that we do. I don't want to frame this as being a perfect policy, and I don't want to frame this as being the the answer for forever. I, I think there's also some broader kind of critiques of how we organize our society, and that that <laughs> that that aren't aren't really a part of this policy, right? Like, I think there it raises a lot of questions about about the way that we organize American society that I I don't know that we're ready to grapple with. But that's a policy position, and I'm an, I'm a state agency in place, so. <laughs> so. I think right. there's also a lot of work to say, you know, Sean has framed this as production, affordability, and choice. Uh, those are three very difficult things to balance. I'd also suggest that they're not mutually exclusive, but that is a big conversation. That, um, the charge, really, that I'm asking is to use that word when we mean it and maybe to be a little bit more discerning about when we're using it. Thank you. All right. We're already well over time. Uh, but I'm going to use moderator's prerogative and we'll do one more question. Sorry. Um, Mark Gamba, uh, he, him, uh, former mayor of Milwaukee, current house district 41 representative on housing and homelessness. Great presentation. Thanks. Um, Sean, Dr. Bateman earlier spoke, uh, and, and by the way, you guys should know how hard Sean has worked on this for the last six months. It, <laughs> yeah. um, Dr. Bateman earlier spoke about sort of the holistic uh, climate thoughts around how we, where we put housing. So kind of the 20 minute neighborhood concept, although she didn't use that term. Do you feel like in the legislation that we've just passed that is called out clearly enough or is that something we're going to have to do in rulemaking or in a follow up bill? Yeah, if I can add, there's I think there's a complicated answer to this, but I won't I won't do that. I'll I'll just say pretty simply, like climate policy is housing policy. The prescription that we need to do for both, and and that's expressed in this policy. It's also expressed in CFEC is that we need to build a lot more housing in places where people can walk and don't don't or walk, bike, or take transit and not have to rely on a car, and just enabling that that existence. The the CFEC rules do that by essentially enabling the existence of walkable mixed use neighborhoods, um, and you know, I think what we try to articulate in the policy is like that is an example of of a policy, and it's it's a lot of work to do, but that increases production affordability and choice. And really, I think the the framing behind the ONA policy too is to say, we you know that's part of the the prescription there. We need to build a lot of housing in in places where people you know don't have to rely on a car. How they have meaningful choices and how they get around, and that's tied to a lot of things that's tied to accessibility because you know well, oftentimes people with disabilities can't drive that's tied to uh i mean i think there was even pieces on like uh uh you know nature within cities that's you know connected to the fact that we use our right-of-ways and pave a lot of them for car infrastructure and also adds cost to housing because we have to build these very expensive road networks that cost millions of dollars to maintain in the long term but you know that's neither here nor there um but all of these different policies that we have in place that 
not only make it more difficult to address the climate crisis, but also make housing more unaffordable and provide and limit people's choices. So I, I think they are very much intertwined and connected. I don't I don't actually think they're at odds with each other. Uh, but I, you know, I think to the extent that we can articulate that those two are mutually compatible and, and even in some ways they need to be, you know, uh, concepts that are, are, are pitched together is important. All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to wrap this up and uh, jump over to the next panel. Uh, so stick around for that. Uh, before I go, we another bill called House Bill 2001. What is going on? Come on, who do I complain to about that? All right, thank you.
All right, we're going to get going. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Um, and thank you to the PSU Native American Student Center for hosting us today. Um, I'm really appreciative, as I know that all of the rest of us are as well. Um, goal 10 guidelines direct that housing elements of a comprehensive plan should, at a minimum, include an inventory of sound housing in urban areas, including units capable of being rehabilitated. Likewise, the ONA, the ONA legislative recommendations report includes among the recommended strategies to support affordability and promote housing, the preservation of existing housing supply, especially naturally occurring affordable housing, meaning housing that is not subsidized, but is affordable to lower income households, often because of its location and condition. The report further directs that the framework should facilitate the preservation of naturally occurring and subsidized affordable housing that would otherwise be lost to age or demolition. To do this, state and local policies should incentivize and encourage the rehabilitation or adaptive reuse of aging properties while focusing redevelopment on areas with lower risk of displacement, such as underutilized parking lots or vacant large-scale retail office sites. Keeping these directives in mind and understanding that efforts to address Oregon's housing crisis can be benefited by the exploration of a multiplicity of solutions, this panel will consider the potential of rehabilitation and conversion of existing structures and the preservation and generation of housing stock, engaging the work and expertise of industry professionals. My name is June Bradley and I am HLA's student board member and a student at Willamette University of Law. I hold a bachelor from University of Oregon where I minored in historic preservation and architectural history. Preservation, and I use the word loosely to include preservation of any existing structure, regardless of designation, is an area of particular interest to me, especially when it is carried out in direct service of community and sustainability. I'll introduce our panelists. Uh, Julie Garver is senior housing developer at Innovative Housing. Julie has been developing affordable apartment projects at Innovative Housing for over 17 years including adaptive reuse projects and new construction projects. Her focus areas include potential site identification, determining project feasibility, identifying potential funding sources, and negotiating site control. This process includes working with the architects to develop and refine the design, working with consultants on environmental, geotechnical, and structural issues, and working with a general contractor on cost es estimating. Julie continues managing projects from this from the initial feasibility stage through pre-development, construction, and lease up. Julie has a degree from Portland State University in community development with a minor in architecture. She joined IHI in 2005. She is LEED certified and has more than 25 years of project management experience with focus areas and rehabilitation of historic buildings, green building, mitigation of contaminated sites, and community development. She has managed projects ranging in cost from 50 to 58 million. And then we've got Corey Morris, who is senior associate at Carlson Hart Architecture. Corey leads their project studio, their shelter project studio, including current projects with Multnomah County and the city of Hillsborough. As a Portland native, Corey is passionate about community-based projects that have a lasting impact on Portland. And then we have Ernestina Fuenmayor, who is project manager at Salazar Architect. Ernestina has nearly two decades of experience from Venezuela to Boston to Portland. She began her architectural career working in, with communities in the barrios of Venezuela and has spent the last 17 years working with communities or working in the U.S. on multifamily housing, adaptive reuse, and institutional projects. Ernestina joined Salazar with a desire to be part of a culturally diverse team and to reconnect to community-based projects that started her career. Her deep commitment to giving back to the community can be seen through her civic involvement in the Portland Historic Landmarks Commission, various city of Milwaukee committees, and her continued work towards historic preservation in her Venezuelan hometown of Chironi. 
And then finally, we have Brandon Spencer Hartle, um, who is the Historic Resources Program Manager for the City of Portland. In that role, Brandon manages the long-range policy framework for the historic resource in identification, designation, protection, and reuse. Brandon has degrees from Portland State University and University of Oregon, and has been a longtime tenant and one half of a 1926 duplex. We'll begin by hearing with the panelists speak individually, and then we'll move on to discuss as a group and take any audience questions. Julie, if you'll start. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you this morning. A little audience participation thing to start out with. So for everyone who has ever lived in a historic or old building, please raise your hand. That's a pretty good percentage and keep it raised if you really enjoyed living in that historic building. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, everyone. And please keep that in mind as we progress through this presentation. Uh, thank you for the introduction, June, and for helping us put this together. We really appreciate your efforts. Uh, I think that probably all of us here on the panel would agree that old buildings and historic buildings are a little bit of an addiction, right? <laughs> we, uh, we love them for several different reasons, but uh, at Innovative Housing, we have had a long history of utilizing historic buildings for affordable housing. Um, we uh, have been in business for quite a while and, and have a lot of units around Portland, but also uh, in Albany, Oregon, Astoria, and uh, coming up in Lincoln City. And uh, we specialize in providing on-site resident services as well. Where am I pointing this? Maybe technical. So while he, well, okay, great. Uh, Just need to kick started. Okay, super. <laughs> so Innovative Housing has several historic properties that we've renovated. Uh, some of them were in use as some sort of housing in the past. A lot of them were sort of de facto housing, right? They started out their lives as hotels or motels, sort of uh, uh, with the bathroom down the hall sort of affair. And we changed them into uh, regular apartments. The Clifford um, is the third third picture over. That, that building actually has some SRO units in it, single room occupancy. And I think we're gonna chat about that a little bit later in the program, but certainly they have their own benefits and challenges. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. A lot of these are in the, the, the central city area, either Old Town or Central City or close in Southeast. We were mentioning transportation before. One of the big benefits of historic buildings is they're usually in areas that have a lot of services around. And that's one of the reasons why innovative housing has focused on that because people can walk to the things that they need a lot of times with historic buildings. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a couple of projects in particular that we are engaged in uh, now or very recent past. One is the Anna Mann House. It's in Laurelhurst neighborhood. This was uh, originally an old folks home built in 1910. It is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And uh, it's, in a, it's in a great location, right? It's close to Sandy Boulevard, close to Hollywood, right in the middle of these very grand homes. And I'm happy to say that the neighborhood has really welcomed us with open arms because they want more diversity in their neighborhood, which was like, yes, <laughs> because sometimes we don't always get that reception, right? And so when you do, you gotta run with it. <laughs> 
you can see that the site is pretty big. It's over three acres, which is unusual uh, for both inside the city limits and also for affordable housing. I think a lot of the panel can relate to the fact that often we're building right out to the property lines, right? We're building lots of building, we're building whatever parking we need, and we are always lacking elbow room. <laughs> and I think that that's one of the equity challenges with affordable housing is that you don't have a lot of space. And often we're designing to, oh my God, what do we have to get in this building, in this property? And it's a constant frustration for folks because it's nice to have that elbow room, right? It's nice to have the green. It's great to have places where our kids can run and play. And, and so we were thrilled to be able to get a hold of this property because we are able to provide some things like that. In this um, in this site plan, you can see that this is the National Register building. So this is the old building. It had a couple of additions uh, uh, over the years, 1953 and 1993. And then uh, we are adding two new buildings to the site, a south building with some tuck under parking and east building over here. So we are we have 129 units that we are building right now. We are mid-construction. One of the things that we had a challenge getting through the city of Portland was the parking. And so parking is a, is a really hot topic, right? For a variety of reasons. And everybody's like, no, you shouldn't build parking. You should build more units because we want to house people, right? And then on the other hand, for those of us who manage uh, affordable housing long-term, what's the one asset that often people bring to their property with them? when they come, if they're low income, is their car. And so accommodating that push-pull relationship is always really challenging. And so we have about 66 parking spaces on this property for 129 units. That's as much as we could arm wrestle the city into. And, uh, and so we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to strike that balance, right? We have the privilege of having a lot of land. So you can see that, you know, you have a lot of uh, recreation area here. We have some area in the back of the property all the way around. Uh, there's a lot of green space on this property and places for people to be outside and be shaded by big trees and, and um, enjoy. So this is uh, some of our construction photos. This is inside the historic building in the basement. We had to replace all the plumbing uh, because it was made in uh, 1910. So you can see an excavator inside the building uh, excavating the in the corridors. Some framing going on in the historic building. Uh, this is a foundation for one of the new buildings. One of the really creative outside the box areas that we were thinking of that big room was a meditation room. This property was owned by a meditation center and ashram most recently. And we took a look at that space and said, hmm, <laughs> what do we do with that space? Because we are about what? Building units for people, not necessarily having big, nice open spaces for other things. And so that big space is now going to be six townhouse units, six two-bedroom townhouse units. And so we actually created a second floor up within that truss system. And some of the doors are going to have a little bit of clip <laughs> at the corner. And the architects are like, oh my God, that's terrible. I'm like, that's character. We're, we have an existing building. We're going to make it work. Whoops. So this is uh, some other pictures of the buildings as we're as we're moving through construction. You see, this is the historic building. This is the National Register property. We're looking at it from the south building. This is the east, the new east building, which you can see here a little bit further along. This is the south build, the new south building. This is inside, looking at some of that interesting framing that happens because of these roof lines. Our architects are Emmerich Architecture, and they did a nice job with sort of making these new buildings be in the spirit of the design of the old building without making them exact carbon copies, right? So you can definitely tell which is the new building and which is the old building. But the new buildings still have some of this cool character, right? What are some of those things that those of you who love old buildings, who've lived in them, like about them, right? The spaces are different. 
they're gracious. They have different things in them than new buildings do. They, they give you a different feeling. And so having that choice, having people being able to have the choice of living in those kind of places is really nice. Uh, we are slated to be finished with this first building at the end of April. Whew, <laughs> that's coming right up. And uh, the other buildings will follow in uh, June and July. So that project is, is moving forward quickly. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a project that we finished recently. We did it almost 100% during the pandemic. So that was an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> took a little bit longer than we had ever dreamed, but um, but we got it done, and that's exciting. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this project because it's in a rural area of Astoria, Oregon, and the city of Portland, as you'll see, you know, brands and talks, they are really they really embrace uh, doing this, converting historic properties into affordable housing and generally housing, and uh, preserving them. And they do a lot of things to make that possible, right? They work with you pretty well on code issues related to historic buildings. They have waivers for, you can do different things with historic properties than you can with regular properties in order to you know, increase the chances that those properties are preserved and provide opportunities for projects like affordable housing. So Portland is pretty far along the path, in my opinion, good job, Brandon and City Portland, on doing this. But other jurisdictions, they're not that far along because they're rural and they have other things to think about, like fixing roads and doing stuff. So you have to do more work to make it work in a rural atmosphere. So this was a key building in Astoria's downtown. It's actually next door to City Hall and People had talked about the possibility of demolishing it because there's a library next door and it's like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to expand the library and demolish this building? And finally, people like, were like, no, <laughs> Astoria is about preserving its history. We want it preserved. It would be like a missing tooth if we tore down this building right next door to City Hall. So we got connected to Astoria. We, Innovative Housing, got connected to Astoria by uh, Restore Oregon. Uh, a statewide historic preservation organization that said, hey, you know, IHI has preserved a lot of these historic buildings in Portland. And so we want to see if you guys might want to talk with them about this Astoria project. And so we started the conversation. Obviously, the building was in a little bit of rough shape. <laughs> and this is sort of good news, bad news. When I was talking with June about what to talk about today, she said, how can historic buildings help affordable housing? How can we accommodate that? And it's it's two, it's a it's a mutually beneficial situation, right? One helps the other and the other one helps uh, the first. But uh, for this building, how many how many people do you think were interested in doing this project? Zero? Yeah, less than zero. We gave some before tours of the uh, of the property and People just walked through, prominent people in the community said, you're never gonna make it. You're never gonna do this. It's impossible, you can't do it. And we're like, okay, well, we'll see you in a couple of years. <laughs> so, um, so that's what we kind of came into it with. And this gives you a little idea of the development process. It's not quick, but I think the panelists can tell you it's not quick in any case, right? It's not quick if you do um, affordable housing with new construction. It's not quick if you do it with a historic building. You have a few more steps to do with a historic building, right? And a lot of it has to do with um, this stuff. It's like, can we make this work? And uh, we worked with a couple of different architects and I gotta give Paul Falsetto who was formerly with Carlton Hart props because he figured out our egress plan, which I'll show you, which is a big challenge with some historic buildings. But if you use some creativity and persistence and you grab hold lovingly to your love of historic buildings and you do not forget that, <laughs> then you can really make this uh, this process work. Um, I'll, I'll highlight one other thing, a couple other things. We had an early Main Street grant that we worked with the downtown association in Astoria, that early end money was really important because we leveraged a lot of other funding because of that. And then this conditional use process, how many people love that process? <laughs> Looking for you, 
Yeah. Oh, one in the back. One. Okay. Godspeed. <laughs> uh, yeah, we do not love that process. We had to finish that process before we applied for low income housing tax credits. Because when you apply with the state of Oregon for low income housing tax credits, you got to have your blank together, right? You cannot say, oh, yeah, we'll do that conditional use process later sometime. No, they want to say, if we're going to award you this very scarce money, we want you to have it together. And so we had to go in for that conditional use process. Guess what it was about? Anyone? P word? Oh. Parking. Okay, so this zone required all residential projects to have parking, even if it was a historic building. Is that smart? No, not smart. So they realized it, it was a little outdated, but political pressure, hard to deal with. And so we, Innovative Housing, went around to the local parking lots and said, hi, can we buy your parking space? And so through a negotiated process, we said, uh, Innovative Housing will buy, you know, will lease six to 10 parking spaces for residents who would like parking. And then we're going to do all these other things with bikes and transit passes and stuff. So we negotiated with them. They approved it. Yay, City of Astoria, uh, our conditional use permit. That took a lot of time <laughs> and a lot of brain damage. And um, historic buildings can't make parking. So encourage your jurisdictions to waive parking for historic buildings, please. So this gives you an idea of the big picture budget. Um, as you can see, historic tax credits, $1.5 million. That was an important part of this project. Low-income housing tax credits, $2 million. State lift funds, $2 million. Those are the biggies, right? And so it, it takes a village to, to build affordable housing. But the one thing that I will say about it is that uh, affordable housing has a benefit, with historic buildings. And that is that when private market developers are trying to do affordable housing, I mean, sorry, trying to rehab historic buildings, guess what their biggest thing has to be, right? Their biggest thing has to be the mortgage and they have to get an appraisal on the building. Look at my mortgage, how big the mortgage was and look at the total project cost. It's tiny, tiny mortgage, right? Uh, when a private developer has to get a mortgage, it has to, the building has to appraise. This building, guess what it would appraise for? Cost seven million. How much would it appraise for? Five. Maybe five million, right? Is a is a private market developer gonna get a big mortgage on that? No, because they have a 80% maybe uh, loan to value ratio. And so what that does for me is again, private developers aren't going to want to touch this project because they can't make a pencil. It's really hard to get a building to appraise. I can get it to appraise because I have all this beneficial financing, right? The appraiser takes one look at it and say, gold mine, you don't have any problems. We'll value that at $7 million because of the beneficial financing. And so it's a lot easier for me to, I mean, it's not easy, but it's a lot easier for me to put a project together like this a lot of times than a private market developer who's trying to do market rate housing. And so that's a one of the key benefits for historic buildings and affordable housing. So these are uh, some pictures of some of our historic elements. This is uh, another one of those, hey, how do you make a historic building project work? This was a light well. So it used to be this project, this part of the project used to be uh, all dark, right? It was part of the first floor and the basement. And then there was a light well above it. You know how they did that, stepped back the light wells. What we did is we made the light well go all the way down to the basement floor. So now we can have windows in the basement level and on the first floor level, and we can activate those levels for housing. Cause we didn't want big giant, you know, main floors with storage or whatever. We wanted to put units in there cause we're greedy developers and we want more housing for people, right? And so that's, you just have to think outside the box with historic buildings a little bit. Um, this is some of the windows. We had some old windows, they sucked. <laughs> and so we were, and the National Park Service said, hey, you have to use them. 
And so what we did is we created frames. We took the glass out. We put real windows behind them. And then we put the frames over them. So you can see on the exterior, it looks like the historic windows, but we actually have a waterproofed wall now. Yay, didn't before. So this is some of the neat historic character. This was an old hotel. So the lobby desk and lobby office. And uh, we were able to, you know, put that back. This is what it used to look like when we found the building. And then this is how it looked when we got done. Again, historic elements, uh, historic photograph. We saw that there was some interesting storefront stuff going on here. Not so interesting when we found the building. We took some paint off. We found the Carrera marble and we restored it. So things like that in modern apartment buildings usually can't get. So people who are living in the building, they walk up there, they're like, yeah, this is cool. I like this place, this is my home. So we had a lot of cool fixtures that were left. We re revamped them and put them in the apartments. This was lobby before, this was how the lobby turned out after. So one of the cool things, we had historic old wood windows. We worked with Clatsop Community College. They have a preservation program. And so students actually restored our window. So nice community participation step there. So this is what I was talking about with the egress. Um, this is a tough building for egress because you had one stairwell in the front and that was it and a, and a fire escape. And so what we did is we put a stairwell, another stairwell right here in the back of the building. So here's the, the street levels up here. This is the back of the building. And this was our original stairwell. And then uh, that's the first floor. Here's the basement level. There's that stairwell. This is a rated egress corridor and then a stairwell right up to the street. So we had to work with the National Park Service on how to do this little stairwell a little bit, but the city of, uh, okay, I've got to wrap it up here. And um, so, uh, City of Astoria really worked with us on that, but egress can be a, a hard point. Paul, Paul, Paul Falsetto helped us with that plan. And then here is the, the Merwin Complete, and that's, uh, that's what we ended up with as our final product. So would you like to live in that? Yes? All right, thank you. See if I have better success with the clicker. There we go. I'll start there. Um, I'm going to speak about a, a little shift difference from affordable housing. Um, Carlton Hart has been doing affordable housing for 30 years. Several years ago, we had the opportunity to uh, work with some of our, particularly our local jurisdictions on shelters. So I think the things I'm going to talk about in the context of converting buildings for housing use, a um, little bit different, but I think they apply to a lot of the things that you all are dealing with and the things that say Julie and her organization work with. Um, to start with, you know, generally uh, like planners in the room, Julie mentioned, um, we start with thinking about things like location. So if we're talking to uh, an agency, again, we've done a lot of work with Multnomah County, the three projects I'm going to show you are uh, with Multnomah County in the joint office. Um, they're out looking for properties and that balance of where can I find something or on the other side going, is this really appropriate? And when we talk about location, um, we're thinking about things, uh, again, as Julie mentioned, how's the neighborhood going to react? Or is this going to be an uphill battle or is this going to be an easy fit? One of the things that we found with a lot of the, the building conversion projects, motels, uh, retail spaces, is that uh, they tend to be kind of on the edge of a, or, or um, not in a residential area. And that's worked to our advantage. Um, the flip side is kind of creating a home out of something that wasn't ever built or meant to be a home. And um, so I'll kind of talk about those with our examples. Um, uh, just generally overall, one of the things that we hear from operators of our temporary shelters is that the ability to build community is super important in the success of these um, programs. So folks that have been living on the street, 
moving into something, there's, you know, a gazillion reasons why folks are experiencing homelessness. And the success of that program uh, has a lot to do with the environment and the ability to kind of create and support folks in there and, and building that community is a big piece of that. So the first step that I want to talk about is uh, um, a motel conversion. This is the Lilac Meadow Shelter. It's out on Powell. <clears throat> Motel conversions, uh, in our perspective, are particularly well suited for family sheltering because we have the ability kind of built into the structure already to accommodate separate spaces for families. Um, because of the buildings were built for people to sleep in, we kind of have a jump on the advantage of some kind of code things, uh, building code primarily. Uh, so what we've kind of worked with, um, Brandon will speak a little bit more to zoning code things and uh, between these later. Um, they're um, wood framed buildings, so the flexibility of making changes to them, as well as like, seismic issues, is kind of it is just easier. They're more simple buildings, right? There's like a big house. Um, a few specific challenges, specific to motel conversions that we've encountered. Um, a lot of these that we've done for the county have been um, motels that were built in kind of late '80s before accessibility codes. And with homeless and um, folks experiencing in that community tend to have a little bit more need for accessible spaces. So we're doing, you know, maybe the hotel, I think uh, Lilac Meadows had 60 rooms and there were maybe two that were accessible. So we spent a lot of effort just upgrading to make things accessible in um, uh, kind of more than you might do in, a, in, in another environment. Um, the kitchenettes in the motel room are not really conducive to families that want to make some food, um, both from like the plumbing standpoint, if families making box macaroni and cheese, you think about doing that in the hotel room, um, plumbing issues, you know, the little tiny sink, um, electrical issues. So we've done a lot of electrical upgrading when we've done these kinds of projects. Uh, the, the hotel room wasn't built to have a microwave and a mini fridge and a hot plate and a whole family's worth of devices and stuff plugged in. So electrical upgrades have been something that have been a part of these. Um, uh, expanding on-site laundry. So there's probably one big laundry room for housekeeping to do laundry. Families need that support of being able to do, you know, their own laundry someplace and not go find a laundromat someplace. Most programs want to offer that on-site. So we've done uh, laundry room upgrades and expanded those as well. Downside for the show, for motels in particular, um, again, families kind of works well. We've done some that have been for singles um, and couples. Uh, a little bit harder for a program staff to oversee folks. It's They have to work harder from a program standpoint to draw people out of their rooms. Easy for families, to, or not families, but for um, individuals to kind of hunker down inside their room. But overall, the motel conversion, you know, the buildings were built to house people. And so that step to kind of do this on a more long-term um, uh, standpoint for, for housing has been kind of straightforward. <clears throat> I'll talk about uh, commercial conversion. So um, here's a building that was not meant for people to live in, right? This was, uh, and this in particular is our uh, Arbor Lodge shelter. It's up in the Kenton neighborhood. And uh, it started out its life as a Rite Aid pharmacy building. Um, you kind of recognize the little archway shapes and you know, spent a lot of time with the neighborhood uh, talking about, is that okay? What kinds of things, um, uh, the neighborhood was supportive of having the facility here, but we spent a lot of time talking about how do they integrate into the neighborhood and how do we make this sort of prominent corner that's now going to have a you know, people living in it fit into uh, a more historic neighborhood. Um, these kinds of larger buildings tend to be really well suited for congregate sheltering. So, you know, we can put families in here, but um, we'll do tend to, uh, we have done more of a dormitory style uh, housing for these, um, or in these buildings, I should say. Um, the occupancy change from an office or a retail space from a building code standpoint is a significant issue. Um, City of Portland has some standards. We're working on one out in uh, Hillsboro that has not, that jurisdiction has not worked through like seismic upgrade um, uh, you know, position on how do we, how do they handle that and how, what do they want to see with that? The mechanical, plumbing, and electrical systems 
you know, we, we look at the building and think, well, here's a building that has a roof. We ought to put people in here. Um, but again, like the electrical system wasn't set up to have a commercial kitchen in it. Um, it wasn't set up to have the airflow that eight, you know, this uh, Arbor Lodge is going to have eight bathrooms and showers. So it takes some mechanical and plumbing systems to like move the, the humidity out of there and to serve those bathrooms in the first place. Um, and the commercial kitchen is a, a big uh, issue and a big expense. So how do we feed the 120 people that are going to call this home? Um, and it's, um, you know, the, the cost of building the kitchen and the equipment and running that. Um, the, the kind of biggest question that we step back and ask as um, jurisdictions have looked at, you know, hey, we found this building and we want to convert it into a shelter is, does that building really make sense? Um, and and keep in mind that that although it's got a nice roof and it's got four walls, there's going to be a lot more expense than you might think to bring these other systems up to speed uh, to make them work. And so um, one other issue with this, and it's related to the third and last project I'll talk about on the next slide, is the outdoor space. So I mentioned making these suitable for people to live in. Um, a lot of people are happy in a condominium downtown or in the Pearl District. Folks that have been living on the street are often not as comfortable being cooped up inside of a building. So we're looking at how can we provide outdoor space? And those have become a really important component of the congregate shelter projects that we've done. Um, fortunately, at the um, Arbor Lodge, we were able to take over the parking lot and turn it into outdoor plaza. Um, and we're also, uh, the plan at this point is to provide some pods, which gets back to the issue of options for people. So if congregate inside dorm living doesn't work, we've got some outside pods, um, pod sheltering that will uh, provide a different option for, for housing. Lastly, our um, Behavioral Health Resource Center may have seen this project opened in November, and we were super excited to be a part of this. It's a different um, uh, undertaking by Multnomah County to bring not just housing, but bring um, supportive services for folks experiencing behavioral and mental health together uh, in one space. Again, the challenge with this in an urban environment was how do we provide some outdoor space? And uh, fortunately, the county was able to purchase the parking lot next to it. And we've converted that into uh, an outdoor plaza. So there is, again, outdoor, private, secured space. Um, you know, one of the challenges with this and talking about urban design for all of the planners in the room, uh, on this particular project, we... Um, had the opportunity to work with uh, um, uh, uh, Portland Design Commission. So we had to go through design review for the project. Um, and it, it was a great experience, but you know, there was an awful lot of educating them, uh, us recognizing that you know, it is an urban environment. So we started out with something that was like a park and they wanted something that was more open. And we said, this isn't gonna work. So you know, our folks aren't gonna feel comfortable out here. Um, <clears throat> seismic upgrade, that was the other kind of big challenge. So again, from a cost standpoint, building, converting this building from an office use, which was its uh, building code designation into uh, an R occupancy, we spent an amazing amount of money making it seismically appropriate for um, people to live in. And I already mentioned the design review. So with that, those are my projects and my insight on converting buildings. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, June, for the introduction. I wanted to expand a little bit more about me. Um, so I'm um, Ernestina Foy Mayor. I, um, as you mentioned, I'm from Venezuela and I've been here for way too many years in this country. <laughs> um, I, um, I have an architectural degree and I, I um, been here in the Pacific Northwest for about 15 years now, um, working in um, many different fields. By now I have a master's in historic preservation from the University of Oregon. Um, and I been I worked uh, also on uh, the cultural resources management management um, side of uh, preservation as well as in the architectural part of it. Um, I have also um, written uh, 
national register nominations for historic districts and for individual buildings. Um, uh, I have also worked on surveys and historic surveys, currently working with the city of Portland in the um, historic resources project for the LGBTQ community here in the city of Portland. Um, and um, besides that, I wanted to expand about what we do in Salazar. Salazar, it is a little bit of a different architecture um, firm than um, probably regular firms. We are um, focus on our focus is that we believe the housing is a is a human right, as probably many of everybody here in this place believe. Um, we um, work a lot in housing. Um, we work on a lot of multifamily housing, but as well and and try to make it um, is our primary focus. Uh, we try to make it affordable as we can. We do work in both new and existing buildings um, for um, in within all the the city of the area of Portland the, and also around the region. We have some other projects that also work in post disaster recovery uh, for the wildfires that we have. We have we working currently with the city of Talent um, and and different projects down in the Rogue uh, Valley. Um, and we, uh, one of other projects that we work in currently is this um, um, modular prototype. It's a pilot project that we're taking to display the deployed and when housing is needed, especially in moments of uh, wildfires or floodings or any other disasters that are occurring. So, um, but uh, in the core of all this is what we actually believe is the most important part of our work is doing community, community engagements that are culturally specific. Um, that is one of my, my main focuses on my job. I um, being able to communicate with people that speak the same language that I speak has been very gratifying in my work. I really happy that I actually get to understand and they also have found a great uh, supporting being in a community engagement with someone that actually understands them and actually not only understanding only the language, but also the culture because it's not the same as just speaking the language, but understanding what it means to live, what, how your mom or your dad and how you were raised, what kind of food you cook, how do you actually raise your kids, what the traditions are. They are very different in many times, very similar, but also feels like sometimes as an outsider all the time when you're saying something to your kids, and my main kids probably will make jokes about that all the time, and how, um, we had different traditions in, you know, uh, celebrations for Christmas or New Year's. And when my kids ask me, can I just go with my friends? No, sorry, New Year's is a, it's a family time. We'd really appreciate you to be with me and be with my, as a family. So I also feel that isolation when you moved as an immigrant here, and you probably, all the people are here that have been, and have been moved to a different place by will or by not will, uh, being in a place by yourself with no family around, no support when you need it, having kids and you don't be just counting on your neighbors and your uh, next door person is one of the main things that we actually, when we do our engagements, we actually listen to them. We listen to understand what the needs are and we really focus on that and put adding an effort in all of the projects that we do. And that's our first step on everything that we do. And, and that is how we um, we believe that <clears throat> all this, what I hear, all the policies, it also should be also starting by here and how we're committing, how they actually, what are they actually needing. And uh, with that, I'm just going to pass it quickly to Brandon because we're running out of time. Well, I will try to do this quick. We'll see how quick I can be. Um, thank you, June, for organizing the panel today. I think it's an honor for all of us to be with HLA. And 
Um, I, I don't think any of us up here would argue that the housing crisis will be solved just by existing and historic buildings. But I think all of us up here, and I don't know Corey well, but I think we will know each other well after today, um, you know, believe that there is a strong place for historic resources and existing buildings to play an adaptive role in the needs of today's generation, future generation, culturally specific communities. Um, and I think there's a broad recognition at the city of Portland and in our comprehensive plan and in some of the communities statewide who have been thinking more creatively about historic preservation that if not for adaptive reuse and if not for the evolution of historic places, we will lose those historic places. And so I want to spend a few minutes just talking about the policy background um, here in the city of Portland that we're operating under as it relates to adaptive reuse, sort of queue up the discussion. Um, I'm looking at June, I'm going to move quickly. So we have time for that discussion that we're looking forward to. Um, and so I will go ahead and get started. Um, so really quickly, I have some photos in here of, of buildings primarily to, that have been adaptively reused. They're not all housing. So I just drew from our library. Uh, but I just want to get started with, with one property in National Register listed landmark. Um, now uses housing in, in East Portland uh, on uh, Northeast 82nd. Uh, but does that sort of set the, the framework? So we heard a lot about interesting existing building projects. We heard about uh, the approach at Salazar. I'm going to primarily focus on historic resources. And so just, just quickly, for those of you who uh, don't get to work with old buildings every day, a historic resource can be a universe of places that are important to, to somebody or to different communities. So just about everything could be a historic resource. What I want to talk about today is those resources that have gone through a goal five process for inventory or designation, primarily focusing on National Register conservation and historic landmarks and districts. Not going to talk a lot about what that means, but today I'm going to just keep the presentation focused on that sort of uh, goal five historic preservation framework. So starting out at the big picture, I know we, we heard a little bit about goal 10 earlier. I know this room is steeped in goal 10, but just as a quick refresher for those of you who haven't worked with goal five in a while or are unfamiliar with goal five, goal five addresses open spaces, natural, scenic, and historic resources. I won't read the language on the screen, but generally speaking, goal five expects local governments um, to protect historic resources and when resources allow to inventory resources. Here in the city of Portland, we've had a historic preservation program since 1968. Currently, our historic resource inventory contains about 16,000 properties, so a significant number of Portland's places are considered historic at one level or another. Many of those are merely inventory, uh, but we do have about 725 historic conservation or National Register landmarks in the city. There are none that we can see today, so I can like point out the window. Um, there's 725 landmarks, and then we have just over two dozen different types of, of districts. Some of those are large residential areas that I'm sure many in the room are familiar with. East Moreland National Register District is one, but we also have diverse historic districts ranging from um, the small Kenton Commercial District to the Skidmore Old Town District, um, and then some sort of creative open space districts like the uh, Twilker Parkway District. So not all those districts are um, areas that contain housing or may ever contain housing, uh, but many of them are. So that's what Goal 5 tells us. Um, back in 2016-2017, DLCD initiated rulemaking for a new Goal 5 historic rule. Um, that rule was adopted by LCDC in early 2017. Um, and I'm not, again, going to read every word on the screen, but the new rule provides uh, clearer guidance, and more flexibility to local governments for how local governments elect to protect historic places once they've gone through a designation exercise. It's something that we at City of Portland, other local jurisdictions at Cottage Grove um, and others around the state advocated for to, to, to decouple a previous rigor around historic preservation that was getting in the way of sort of energy efficient, um, deep energy retrofit, seismic upgrades, ADA accessibility, adaptive reuse, and also recognizing that, um, and I think many of them are familiar with it, that large residential areas had been using historic designation at cross purposes to other planning goals. And in often case, in many cases, using historic designation at cross purposes uh, for the protection of historic resources generally. I'm using the National Register of Historic Places as a tool to prevent housing or to um, limit the likelihood of change. And so the new rule in 2017 sort of ushered in a, a new take on Goal 5, giving local governments the opportunities to think more creatively about protection, more creatively about incentives, and then specifically to what Ernestina was talking about, more creatively about what, what are historic resources, whose histories, are protected under Goal 5. Um, I know there's a good question earlier about equity and what do we mean by equity? And I think that, that's a, a great question. We have a long ways to go in historic resources work. But since the adoption of that new rule in 2017, the city of Portland has worked to redeploy our resources away from architectural history or sort of the, the dominant resources um, towards African-American historic sites. We have about a dozen African-American historic sites. We work closely with um, those communities on designation. 
uh, or Ernestina's team um, and their expertise with a variety of um, subject matter experts and lived experience experts on LGBTQ historic sites, places that aren't about the building, that aren't about um, architecture, but are about a, a community, about an event. Um, and so really trying to pivot our work um, to be more responsive to those communities that have been historically excluded from goal five. But where I really wanna dig in um, is sort of the thinking around a, a 2015 Ladies Board of Appeals opinion, the, the King v. Clackamas County case. Um, and I won't recite the, 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 the merits of the, the, the question that was asked, but um, this uh, paragraph from the Luba opinion has stuck with me and others for the last seven or eight years about the importance in goal five, not only of regulating demolition or design changes or use, but thinking creatively that historic preservation has to be paired with the economic realities of the moment and the future. And that in order for us to have a successful goal five historic preservation program and a program that's responsive to the other land use goals, we need to be thinking creatively about adaptive reuse, economic flexibility, um, and about the, the future of resources and how they evolve. Many of our African-American historic sites in the city that are so important to those communities or LGBTQ historic sites are in buildings and places that may have architectural significance, but it's the evolution of the story. It's the, the change of demographics. It's the resilience and oppor economic opportunity that those communities found that makes those places special, not just the you know, initial architectural vision. And I think the idea with the, the Luba opinion 2015, the new goal five rule and the code provisions I'll talk about in a minute is with a with a um, caution around displacement and a caution around you know the loss of significant um, businesses or longstanding tenants, historic places must evolve to be relevant. And I think that's what all of us are talking about today: is how do we allow existing buildings to adapt? So taking the the goal, the new rule, and um, to a degree that Luba opinion in 2015. Uh, over the course of the last several years, um, in my capacity at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, uh, with support from my colleagues across bureaus. Uh, the city advanced a holistic rewrite to the city of Portland's historic preservation regulations. Those uh, new uh, regulations went into effect just a year ago uh, this month. And so for the last year, we've had a, uh, a, a new take on an old classic about how we do historic preservation here in the city of Portland. In that project, we didn't designate new landmarks or reevaluate landmarks and districts that we have. But what we did is made an intentional decision to provide new flexibility, um, to recognize the need for adaptive reuse, and to think creatively in some very specific instances about how we not only allow, but foster, encourage, and facilitate the types of projects that Julie uh, and Corey just described to us. I want to talk about four, just briefly, four or five specific areas of those code changes that, um, if we were here a little over a year ago, would not have been on the books and now are. Um, the first one is streamlined design regulations. And so I know there was a good chuckle here, and design review came up a minute ago. We do have a type of review similar to design review for some historic places called historic resource review. Uh, the new code regulations uh, sort of change our framework about when and to what degree we apply design regulations to historic resources. So uh, uh, rethinking about um, which historic resources are appropriate for design uh, regulations and which ones are not. So going forward, a significant number, if not the majority of our designated historic resources will not be subject to design regulations unless or until the owner voluntarily um, pursues a local designation that comes with those design regulations. Said another way, when Julie and her team look for projects in the future and they find historic preservation to be a, a potential asset to the project or maybe the linchpin to make the project work, there are paths now for historic designation that do not come with lengthy design review. Um, the other thing I'll say is for those properties that do still have a design review or historic review expectation, uh, we recognize the need for balancing the, the regulations to protect the historic resource, the very qualities that make a place special uh, with the, the need for change. And so the, the new regulations contain a lengthy list. I think it's something like A through B, C, you know, 75 or something, types of work that no longer go through review. And these are things like um, rooftop solar panels, certain window and door replacements, seismic upgrades, um, heat pumps, um, EV charging stations. There's a long list of items that previously had been a challenge for um, sort of the smaller adaptive repro reuse projects that we hope are resolved to a degree in the new code. Um, where it gets more interesting for housing, um, as someone who is on the residential infill project team here in the city of Portland, uh, we went a long way with that in our residential zones, but in our historic and conservation districts now, we've gone significantly further. And so the new code in historic and conservation districts and for historic and conservation landmarks 
which is not an insignificant number of properties citywide, somewhere floating around eight to 10,000 that fall into that category. Um, the historic resource code allows um, any housing type and no limit on the number of dwelling units. And so what we're really getting at that's for new construction and existing buildings. And so what we're really getting at is looking for opportunities to convert a large house to a sixplex, um, take that second garage in the backyard and turn it into your second ADU, build a new building that's an eight or 10 plex, really thinking that if uh, we're applying goal five protections to a place because it's significant historically, we need to be realistic and pragmatic about the need for adaptive reuse and the opportunities that exist there. Um, and so the new code no longer provides that cap on the, the number of dwelling units um, in historic areas or um, the types of housing. This is a little adjunct to what this conference is about, but I do think it's related and important. In addition to those housing provisions, the new code allow for accessory commercial uses, and in some cases, major adaptive reuse into um, retail sales and service, office, major event uses. We were mindful in these new provisions not to encourage or allow the loss of existing housing units. And so the way they're, they're uh, structured in the code is really intended to protect existing housing. Um, but something we uh, explored in our recent multi-dwelling housing project here in the city of Portland, the Better Housing by Design project, was allowing those accessory commercial uses, uh, one, because there's, there's in, case, in some cases, demand, but two, in some cases, allowing that accessory commercial unit could be the piece of the puzzle for economic viability to make a project happen. Um, and so in the case of the new code, we do allow in most of our residential areas, there's some, there's some geographic areas that don't fall into this, accessory commercial and office uses as a way to encourage adaptive reuse, to encourage investment in buildings. Again, a little outside of this conference, but thinking about if we have these historic places, we're applying goal five protections to them. Let's make sure as a city, we can do everything uh, possible to get out of Julie and Corey and Ernestina's way to get all of us inside those buildings, to, to move away from them just being perceived as a single family house into something that has economic opportunity for owners and tenants, and the opportunity for all of us to engage with, explore, learn from, heal from our past. This one's fast. Um, if you're a historic resource in the city of Portland, parking is not required. So that goes from East Moreland to the Baghdad Theater, any of our buildings downtown. So we recognize Julie's challenges um, and we um, exempt all historic resources from parking. Um, and then affordable housing. I'll talk about this just a little bit because I, I think um, it's something I'm, I'm looking to Julie to, to come back in with a review sometime soon or someone else. Uh, we heard from a variety of interest uh, groups at the final adoption of the code that we needed to do more for uh, regulated affordable housing. Um, what we heard was interest in the 60% MFI level as being the threshold. And so what the new code allows is in those situations where a design, a historic design review is required, uh, projects that are 60% uh, MFI, affordable housing, and 90% of the units fall into that category um, can be reviewed by a type 1x staff level procedure. So that's a staff level review, not appealable to the Landmarks Commission, not appealable to City Council, appealable directly to LUBA. It's more aggressive than we've gone in our design overlay zones, thinking about a way to uh, provide greater predictability and certainty for development teams to expedite the process, to lower the review fee, and to still uphold when they're applied the um, the sort of design expectations for compatibility or preservation. And this is something I think a number of project teams um, would have loved in recent years. It's something we um, were in agreement with from Catholic Charities and others who asked for it. We haven't seen one of these projects come in yet. Um, we haven't seen, to my knowledge, an affordable housing application at all in a historic district in the last year. Not surprising, but when they do come in, I think we're really excited about this as a um, opportunity to build confidence for our affordable housing developers that adaptively reusing a historic building or building a new building in a historic district is less vulnerable to appeal, um, that has the benefit of working with a specific staff member um, and the safeguards of um, the safeguards that come with a appeal to LUBA that don't necessarily come with an appeal to our city council. So that's something we're really excited about. We hope we see more affordable housing in historic districts. We do have a significant amount of affordable housing in our landmarks and districts, uh, but this is one path we saw as a potential. So like I said, I'm gonna wrap it up because we're out of time. Um, happy to answer questions now or stick around afterwards. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, so we are um, over time. That being said, um, I'd like to open it up really quickly to audience questions. Um, I think we'll skip the, the plan discussion. Um, I'm so glad that you guys shared what you did. And I think this is more interesting than you know maybe what I had planned anyway. So um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please step up to the mic so that those online can see you as well. Um, 
Okay, well, I guess if we we don't have any audience questions. Oh, you, oh yes, Shane. Sorry to make you go all the way over there. <laughs> no, it's okay. And sorry, I'm so verbose. I think about lots of things and happy to be here. My main question is, for, I don't know how to do this. My main question is, is there um, a follow-up process for designers and developers of social force housing? And I ask because I really wish for Cedar Commons man managed by Central City Concern in East Portland, that people may have lived in an SRO because on one floor, there were 40 SRO units. It was one shower for every 10 units and one kitchen for 40 people. It was honestly, for a year and a half, the most traumatizing, triggering, and har harrowing experience I ever had, just because of the amount of violence that was threatened to me, and I ended up having to leave that social services housing because the safety factor was just obliterated. And it was also, to be in a 10 by 10 foot room where you only have a sliver of a window in a part of the city that has no amenities and no social cohesion, it just felt like there's a lot of ideas and we want to warehouse people as much as possible, but housing can turn into warehousing. And if it's not managed by um, a contingency plan for social services and comfort level or safety, we may, and when I saw the Anna Man project, I'm jealous. Not all projects are created equal. And when we put people in marginalized communities into housing where they don't have access to beauty or safety, then it just feels like we're maybe living with stability, but not dignity. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that comment. Do you want to come up to? Oh. Thanks so much for that comment. I think it's it's an important aspect of what we're struggling with right now, and that is how to create uh, more units for people to live in. And, and I think that the quality of life and safety and uh, trauma-informed care is, uh, is something that we really have to think about seriously. And we have some SRO units, as I mentioned, in, in innovative, how to, innovative housings portfolio, and we're actually thinking about ways to make those into studio apartments uh, because they do have a number of challenges associated with them, some of which were uh, enumerated. Um, another thing to think about is that there's a long-term cost not only a human cost that was um, identified, but also an operating cost. Because when you have shared spaces, they have they require a lot more janitorial. They require a lot more staffing because of security issues. And so year after year after year, you're looking at a high cost of operating those units with shared spaces. It sounds like a really attractive idea. And in some cases it, it can definitely work, but it has to, they have to be staffed appropriately. They have to be designed really carefully in order to give people the amenities that maybe the room doesn't have, but yet providing those amenities in a way that is safe. Uh, the one thing that I will say is as we, as we continue to stretch and find ways to increase density while providing safety, uh, I know that there's a, a few electeds in the room and please think about eliminating the bully wage rate requirement for affordable housing. This has been a struggle that we have, have really battled over the last 17 years that I've been in the business. And there are a lot of appropriate places for bully commercial wage rates. Trying to build affordable housing in a housing crisis is not one of them. And the other thing that that would allow us to do is have more support services and more different kinds of adaptive reuse and mixed use functions in buildings. You know, we can't even put a, a coffee shop in a building right now if we don't want to pay bully commercial wage rates or a little grocery store or other services that people could really use. So, 
you know, for, for anyone that has influence in the room, that would be my, my pitch for today. And then, you know, going back to the SRO units, we just have to be really careful about how those are designed and implemented. And, and if we can give people private spaces, uh, that is going to be permanent for permanent supportive housing and permanent housing solutions, really the best. Thank you. Do you, can I, can I know we're super, super over time here. Oh, yeah. I, I just wanted to add something since we didn't get to really discuss any of this, but um, about um, our housing stock and how historic preservation plays a role within that and what historic preservation many times for people will think about historic buildings or older buildings and only think historic preservation as expensive old houses. However, there are many houses that anything that is built 40 years ago, it turns almost historic. So uh, you don't think about it uh, when I am already over 40. So the places where you were born or where you were raised, they are already entering that threshold historic places. Um, there are many areas that had not been surveyed in the other side of, especially in you know, Portland, in the east side of Portland, that we don't know that are also part of our cultural groups that are historic preservation keeps people together many times is, is, a, is a tool for rooting people in place. Culturally, you feel connected with the site where you are. And if we see historic preservation only as a brand of one say, not only it focuses on building, but focuses on people and what they identified as a historic place and where they're connected with, those are the places that we really should be focusing on. And we can use it as a tool to maintain that housing stock that is low price, that is where people go there and leave and can actually stay there for years and years and years. And then you have to just listen to why they stay in there and what are the places that they're actually living on. So I just wanted to add that since we didn't get to really talk about it and I thought about it a lot during all this, these days. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. That's a wonderful note to end on. Um, and thank you everyone for having us here. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. This has been a real joy for me. Um, thank you.
your name tag behind. We'll use them again next year. Um, I want to thank our student volunteers who are here today. Um, if you are volunteering, do you want to just stand up really quickly and be recognized? Thank you. And now I am going to uh, do my favorite part of the day, which is to give the Ed Sullivan Affordable Housing Advocate Award. Ed Sullivan is one of the co-founders of Housing Land Advocates, and seven years ago, the board developed an award in his name to recognize heroes in our affordable housing advocacy work. Before I discuss this year's awardee, I just want to make take a moment to recognize Ed for his continued service, mentorship, and friendship. With his commitment to housing advocacy, especially since his retirement from private practice of law, he has inspired others like Andre and Kathy to service after their retirement from their careers in public service, and he inspires the next generation of lawyers and planning students like June Bradley to carry on his legacy. I don't want to gloss over the fact that the award is named in his honor because it is such an honor to give him uh, to have his him work so hard, especially when we are on the brink of so much important policy development work in affordable housing. <clears throat> So this year's awardee is the city of Gold Beach and Mayor Tammy Kaufman is here today to accept the award. Over the past several years, many of our awardees have been identified through the PAPA project and this year is no exception. The current population of Gold Beach is about 2,368 people. Mayor Kaufman's leadership is informed by her career as a property manager to the Oregon Manufactured Housing Cooperatives, the most successful low-income housing ownership preservation model statewide. She also told us last night during dinner that she got her training as a planning commissioner. And, and by training, uh, she was referring to how to make people feel heard. And she determined that the best way to make people feel heard is to say, and, and repeat their arguments and say, I, I acknowledge and I hear you and um, I'm going to ignore you because you're not talking about the criteria. But, <laughs> um, but no, not not quite. That's my, my uh, side note. Um, so the city of Gold Beach brought forward a local ordinance to reduce barriers to housing in single family residential zones. Not only did the city adopt a model code for fair and equitable housing from DLCD, but it also went the extra mile by eliminating barriers to housing by using its 2019 housing needs analysis to inform its policy making under the umbrella of its housing advancement project. The housing needs analysis identified the need for 596 new units by 2039 with the greatest need for rental units found at the lowest and middle price points, especially for units priced at 400 to $900 a month. While the HNA and Associated Buildable Lands Inventory indicated an adequate supply of land overall to accommodate future housing needs, it also found a, an imbalance in the amount of land in different residential zones. Based on this result, the city knew it needed to take bold steps to encourage the mix of housing needed for all its citizens, most importantly for this award, its lowest income citizens. The code amendments allow a full range of housing types in all areas zoned for residential use. All types of housing currently allowed collectively in the city's existing zones will be allowed in the new R zone. And this includes single family, detached homes, accessory dwelling units, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, townhouses, manufactured home parks, and multifamily housing, which are five or more attached units on a single lot. In addition, they added a new form of housing called cottage cluster housing, and in, um, includes small detached homes clustered around a shared open space on a single property. Further, the city sought to reduce barriers to development of smaller housing units, including middle housing types. The standards are generally geared toward lower barrier, lowering barriers to housing development, ensuring that land in the city is used efficiently and encouraging smaller dwellings. Even more, the code amendments expand opportunities for development of accessory dwelling units. The updates increase the allowable size of an ADU to 1,000 square feet and increase in 400 square feet, which will make them more attractive to future residents. 
In March 2022, the Oregon State Legislature passed House Bill 4064, which prohibits a local government from subjecting manufactured homes to siting or design standards that do not apply to site uh, built single family dwellings. And there are a few exceptions. The city has now updated its outdated standards to comply with House Bill 4064 for manufactured homes. <clears throat> And Gold Beach, since it has a population of less than 10,000, was not required to meet the requirements of House Bill 2001, the Middle Housing Bill, and OAR Chapter 660, Division 46. However, the amendments that the city adopted allow it to meet many of those specific requirements, including that full range of middle housing types in the R zone, applying allowed lot sizes and densities for middle housing types that are similar to those established in the state regulations, not applying standards for most middle housing types that are not also applied to single family houses, applying uh, development standards to cottage cluster housing that are consistent with the standards in state regulation and the Oregon Middle Housing Model Code. Now, if a city with a population of less than 3,000 can move its needle this far, there is no reason for any other city in Oregon not to match this magnificent effort. The HLA board unanimously agreed that the city of Gold Beach deserved this rec recognition. And Ed Sullivan adds that when we wrote to the city of Gold Beach as part of the PAPA project to ask for Gold 10 findings, we did not expect this thoughtful response. We were encouraged in our work by finding a sterling example of local government committing to the Gold 10 process envisioned by its authors to adopt and then actually, actually utilize its housing needs analysis to craft meaningful policy. So on behalf of the Board of Housing Land Advocates and in keeping with our tradition, we are going to present the city of Gold Beach with this birdhouse as a symbol of multifamily housing and I invite Mayor Tammy Kaufman up to say a few words. We are really lucky that we got uh, two grants uh, a couple of years ago. We got one to do the housing needs assessment and to do the uh, bottled land survey from the LCD. Without that, we wouldn't have had the basis to get the second grant, which uh, Carolyn Johnson, who was the planner in Coos Bay, volunteered in her free time to do. She says, Tammy, here's a, an application, sign it. <laughs> Okay, and so we got the grant um, from DLCD, and so without that, we wouldn't have been able to do the work we did last year, which um, Matt Heisty and his team were hired to do the heavy lifting, and then our staff, and then we had so many meetings with the joint meetings with the Planning Commission and the City Council, and, and Matt just told me we got it done faster than anybody, so I guess we're good. Um, <laughs> but thank you, thank you, everybody. It's It's been fun, and I love planning the, on my side of it, not your side. <laughs> Thank, and I appreciate um, being recognized, the hard work that we did. Thank you. And now, um, we are pleased to have our afternoon keynote speaker. As I talked about earlier this morning, uh, HLA has really worked hard to bridge the gap between DLCD as the planning agency and Oregon Housing and Community Services as the uh, funder and, and affordable housing provider for the state. And we are excited for where we are today. And you heard about that from the panels this morning um, in terms of how you know historic reuse is funded by OHCS and how uh, we're getting into that 
love affair that Alan talked about. That's going to be a long marriage now that we've got affirmatively further in fair housing and goal 10 um, coming together. So uh, I was uh, excited to see Andrea Bell speak last week in the city of Salem for a, a sort of ribbon cutting for Deb Northwest and their uh, adaptive reuse of the Evergreen Church, not a historic structure, but still a, an older one that's going to be permanent supportive housing for Veterans Affairs. And we are excited to have her here and bring her wealth of knowledge and uh, lifelong career in affordable housing to, to the fore during our conference here. So Andrea, thank you so much for being here. Well, good afternoon, everybody. How are folks doing? Everybody uh, been chowing down over the last 30 minutes or so? I know there's been a lot of great uh, dialogue. How are folks feeling? Good, good. I was in this very space, I think, for the first time, actually, last Saturday. And it was interesting as I was driving here, I was thinking to myself, boy, does, does this feel like deja vu or am I actually back at the same space? So I just want to acknowledge and appreciate the importance uh, as a guest uh, here that we are also guests in this space too. And so just uh, because we are talking about uh, land, it is also important to also recognize that uh, we are here as guests uh, in this land. And so I want to just really appreciate um, the reality that Portland has so many uh, diverse native uh, populations and also recognizing that in that acknowledgement that is not just an acknowledgement of the past, uh, it is very much uh, the present and the future. And so I want to make sure that we can lift that up in the center in the space. Um, to Ed and to the mayor, thank you wherever you are, both for just being uh, a model for what's possible. Uh, to all of you that have a uh, shared commitment to the work that's in front of us, thank you for being here uh, really today. So let me just start by saying that um, I am so thankful to be here and I am quite frankly so grateful to be in your presence today because what I believe is that uh, all of us here individually and collectively organized in this space uh, today, as you look around to your colleagues, as you look around to folks that you may not know, represent our shared values. Uh, I believe those shared values are one, a shared value to our beloved communities, to those that we serve, uh, a shared value for a vision for what could be and for what is possible. And I think in that work, also recognizing that there is a shared value to not only to equity, I think that we have to center in the conversations, but also to justice, restorative justice. I think it's important to be very clear about our words and to be very clear about our intentions. And in that uh, collective pursuit, it is yes, both to equity, but also to restorative justice. And so I would just uh, implore us all to be able to really think about our collective responsibility in that. Um, we're at a really unique time for the state of Oregon. I don't know if all folks know that. Do folks feel like they realize that we're at a unique really point as a state? Um, I think as we look back over the last couple of years, I think the moment uh, really emboldened us to recognize that so much of the last few years was unprecedented. How many times did we use that word or say that word? Everything was unprecedented over the last few years. Um, and I think in many ways it was unprecedented, obviously, for reasons uh, that didn't always move us forward or didn't always feel like it moved us forward. Um, I also think in this moment uh, of criticality for our state, it's also an important moment to realize what's possible and to ask ourselves what I believe is a really important question about who are we to one another? Who are we to one another? And as I think about us in that space, as I think about the collective pursuit that we all have here today, I think about all of the other social movements, all of the movements towards progress for people that are centered on people, that are centered on restorative, that are centered on helping to make, make sure people have access to their basic needs. That's what we're talking about, access to people's basic and fundamental needs. I think about whether it's a civil rights movement, whether it was a movement towards decolonization, they are often started and sustained by people that saw themselves in each other, 
that's all a vision for what could be. Um, for anybody that is familiar with uh, some of Martin Luther King's words, all of his words, I think, uh, bestow upon us, I think, a lot of really important reckoning. Uh, for me, one of them was around the fierce urgency of now. Around the fierce urgency of now. And in that, um, it is what gives me as Yes, a state agency director, as somebody that cares a lot about the communities across the state of Oregon, as somebody that grew up very, very poor, somebody that grew up in a very working class immigrant family, um, it is what gives me hope. It is what sustains my hope. It is what gives me uh, optimism in the work that we do, even to some of the most challenging obstacles that we have in front of us. Now, in that, I also want to be really clear, uh, you know, when we're talking about tackling really large issues, I recognize that uh, talking about hope or talking about optimism can feel maybe a little bit lofty or a little bit removed. Um, but I would also say in that uh, it is not blind optimism. I think we're all here today because we see the challenges. We feel the challenges, we see them around them, around us, we see them in our communities. I think for many of us, uh, whether you're an elected official, whether you work for a state agency, whether you've been on the receiving end of harm, whether you're a student or a lawyer working to correct injustices or wrongs, it doesn't mean that we don't see the challenges. For me, what it means is that in spite of seeing those challenges, in spite of seeing those challenges, we still feel optimism because what is the alternative? Cynicism, despair, apathy. How many of us have felt that over the last few years? I didn't actually expect to get hand raises, but yes. <laughs> um, absolutely, all of those things. And I think the easy way out, and if I may be really blunt about it, I think even the cowardice way out is to just give up and say, somebody else will fix it. The next generation fix it. Another group will fix it. But all of us are here today, uh, whether you're here in the physical space today, whether you're somebody that will read the transcript of this at some point, or whether you're listening in and you find this recording years down the road, it will be that because of, in, even in spite of all of those challenges, we feel optimism. We see a hope for something much better. And we see ourselves in that responsibility. I think as a government agency, uh, for all of my colleagues that are here uh, for Team OHCS, we have a lot of tough internal conversations around personal responsibility as a government agency requires us to tackle some things that we have uh, maybe neatly found a closet for, for, for many, many years. And so many ways those closets are overflowing uh, upon us right now. But it's been 50 years since the inception of the statewide land use system. And coming out of the last couple of years, uh, this is, I think, and I think for many of us believe this is a really good time to take stock of, of where we are at. And in that, to also lay out some steps for what's next. So that as we leave our respective spaces and places, we have a shared vision, a shared course of action on what's ahead of us. Now, it was mentioned, and I know for many folks in the room, there's a lot of contributors, uh, direct and indirect, of the Oregon Housing Needs Analysis. I see you, Director Bates, back there. Good to see you. And for all of the contributors of that. Now, we know that there are a lot of contributing factors that have helped bring us to this moment uh, in time, either around land use, around the financing tools, around the, the inequities that come with the combination of those things. Um, and within that Oregon Housing Needs Analysis, I'm sure it was mentioned uh, earlier, and if it, if it hasn't been yet, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about it. 
It says that we need more than 580,000. 580,000 new homes over the next 20 years. Um, that's a large number. Can we just stop for a moment to say that's a really large number, 580,000. Now, I think as we think about that number, um, which is an important one, it's also equally important for us to recognize that in the minutia of our work, in the details of our work, uh, it can feel like numbers and abstracts. And what I want to lift up in that and continue to ground us in is that it also creates uh, a painfully real condition of what that means that uh, people are facing in their homes every single day. For anybody who has ever struggled to get by, anybody who's ever struggled to pay a bill and knows what that feeling is like. So when we say 580,000 new homes, what you can probably guess from just sheer math is that either some of us uh, directly, or more than likely, we know someone who knows someone who is on the receiving end of that impact. That's what that means. So no matter your proximity to the issue, no matter your proximity to the space and where you are of service in solving it, what you can be sure of, what we can be sure of, is that the contributions of today will have a ripple effect, a positive ripple effect, not only for us now. And I think as a millennial, I often think about um, issues that I feel like should have been solved in prior generations. And so now I think uh, as somebody that now has kids, I'm like, well, I have responsibility in this. We all have responsibility in this. And so as we think about the movement that I think we're all engaged in to make this meaningful progress, what it also means is that despite all of the progress that we have made over the last five years or so, which we have made progress, sometimes doesn't feel like we have made progress, but we have made progress. We have made uh, progress in terms of production of affordable housing across the state. We have made progress in uh, increasing production, particularly in our rural communities. We've been able to see early indicators. I wanna be very clear about that. Early indicators of where we can see progress and the nuts and bolts in our system in advancing racial justice. We've seen early indicators of progress of what can happen at a state level, at a, go a government level when you can make your processes and your programs just quite frankly, e more easier for people to access. I spoke to someone recently and I was asking her a question about our programs. And I said, hey, I want your feedback on a couple of things. You'll keep me honest. And um, she said, well, this will be a really short conversation. And I said, oh, that can't, that can't be good if this is gonna be a short conversation. She said, there's so many paperwork, there's so much paperwork and there's so many documents. And when I pull all the documents up, I just X everything out and say, oh, forget it. That's what we do. And so for us as a government agency, that means that our aspirations and our operations of how we function, how we design the work that we do to be accessible is going to have to change because despite all of the progress that I mentioned, it's not enough. We have a lot of work to do ahead of us, all of us, including my agency, including myself, including all of us as an enterprise. So it's important to acknowledge that we have made progress. We have made meaningful progress, objective progress. It's not enough. And so in this moment, what that means is that we have to set our heights so much higher, so much higher. And as we think about us all collectively, what that also means is that in that marathon, in the marathon of that work, 
we are also going to have to find solace in each other because across that marathon at some point we will need to be uplifted and remind ourselves to get back to and center ourselves to the vision to get ourselves going now on the point of the organ housing needs analysis and the the moment that we are in in this moment the governor of our state has made her priorities abundantly clear to which uh, amongst those priority those priorities include housing increasing access to and production of housing making meaningful progress towards our shared goals of addressing homelessness, behavioral health, and education. Now, we are in a moment where our, the, state, uh, the state of Oregon, uh, we have three executive orders right now. Um, that first executive order uh, focuses on the crisis of homelessness. The other executive order that we have across the enterprise, and just as this is, might be helpful for just the collective awareness, requires that all state agencies, all state agencies across the enterprise prioritize addressing homelessness, not on a surface level, but in the underpinning of the work that we do. And more alignment and more alignment with the work that we are doing here today and the conversations that we're having here today there is a third one, and that third one sets out a very clear goal to produce 36,000 36, units of affordable housing. That's both market rate and affordable. And in this moment, we also know that we can't have anyone on the sidelines. There is a role for everyone in that. And as uh, our agency, as DLCD, as DCBS, as we all engage in this, our intention, our hope is that we can be a model with our partners that even some of the most uh, bureaucratic institutions, some of the most institute, some of the institutions that have been around the longest, you don't necessarily think government and think quick and expedient, do you? Is that a no? That means that we have to set our sights much higher. This is about government having to transform beyond the limitations of beyond of what we even think is possible for this new day and in this moment. And so what that means for each of you, for all of us, for all of our partners across the state is that our hope is that you will see your government changing and shifting in order to meet those goals to set the tone of what's possible, not just in an aspirational way, but in a way that is enduring. So when we talk about progress, progress obviously can be measured and that's an important piece of the progress, but we want our progress here for the state of Oregon to be an enduring framework for our collective future together. For that is what hope is. That is also what our shared responsibility in that as a government agency who helped get us into some of these very real issues that we're trying to untangle ourselves out of today. And in that, we also have to acknowledge that there has been lack of opportunities to affirmatively fair, uh, further fair housing, uh, creating a situation that can be felt and seen in so many places across the state. And so in that stretch and in that pursuit of growth across the state, that also means that we are going to have to lean into power sharing at a state level. Meaning that we don't find ourselves repeating patterns where we have made decisions, we're then protected those decisions, and then telling our partners in communities closest to the pain what the decision is. It's also what partnership should have always been, but that is what power sharing is for us. Now I recognize for some of you that maybe either are not so familiar with our organization or maybe haven't worked directly with us before, 
I want to just acknowledge that is a very new way of being. It is a very new way of being. And from my seat, uh, and based on so many of the conversations that we have had with folks across the state, it's also exactly where we need to be. When we think about the needs of our rural communities, when we think about the capacity needs of our rural communities, when we think about accessibility of the work that we do, the resources that we put out, it's important that we as a state and as a collective don't define flexibility or partnership or power sharing or partner solely at a state level. It also means that in this collective work, we're also gonna have to ask our federal government to continue to step up with us in a lot of ways as well. There is agency and opportunity. And as I mentioned before, in this moment, nobody can be on the sideline, including our federal partners in this. I'm sure that we also know that as part of this work and what's at stake as well, is also the health of our communities and the health of our generations to come. If we were to, if I were to Google all the different zip codes uh, of where folks live or folk, where folks have been, I'm sure what most of us would see are health varieties and health impacts from community to community. So when we talk about that very clear quantitative goal of 580,000, when we talk about increasing production of affordable housing in a way that is representative of each of the communities, what that also means is that we have an opportunity to also close health disparities across our communities. So when we think about our land use planning system, as we think about our financing tools, as we think about what it means to engage in shared power um, in the work that we do, it also means that we have an opportunity to change the health trajectory of the communities that we serve. Now, in this, one of the areas of growth that we will be leaning into across the uh, for across the points of our agency is really how we fund. The state OHCS has a lot of find, have, has a lot of programs that we push out to help uh, fund and preserve affordable housing. We are going to have to substantively change the way that we finance and fund in order to help meet that collective goal of production of affordable housing. The last thing that we want to do is to hold precious to something that is not helping us to move, move us forward to where we need to be today. And in that, as we think about the various models of affordable housing that are needed, and as we think about conversion of other building types uh, to residential use, we know many of our communities have uh, opportunities through either empty building spaces or old churches, um, schools, motels uh, that could be converted to affordable housing. And the process probably feels complicated and really expensive. Uh, as we think about the opportunities that we have ahead in front of us for modular housing, pre-development strategies, um, this also means looking at uh, policies through the legislature around where we need policies to shift to help get us into the next phase of what's possible. Um, in this work, there's an opportunity to continue leveraging all of the different funding sources that we have in front of us to have a different set of conversations about what's possible. And as part of that conversation is also how we work together um, to balance climate planning and housing planning together. Um, as many of us know and are well aware, some of you have been tracking this and have been deeply engaged in this for uh, perhaps even longer than we have, is that climate change is a significant issue facing uh, our communities, both here in Oregon and across the nation, and we will need to continue to find ways to mitigate those impacts. Uh, many affordable housing developments are uh, being designed now in this moment to meet uh, energy efficient standards. That is part of the trajectory of where we will have to collectively be and work towards. 
And I mentioned it earlier, but I think it's worth uh, repeating at this uh, at the top as well. And I'm uh, we'll yield back to see if there's any topics or questions in this. Is those shifts and those aspirational uh, collective goals that we're working towards that is not just through OHCS as one standalone agency. Our agency alone uh, cannot make the progress that is needed um, from a sustainability perspective that is happening across the enterprise. And so what you can expect from us, not only the folks in the room, but also folks across the communities, is that through the lens of humanity, we will continue to be relentless at all points to make progress. We will continue to be relentless in a way that we haven't before. And so my call to action here for all of you, myself included, is to continue stepping up, continue to bring your highest and best honesty to your partners and to us as government agencies around what we need to do differently to help accelerate goals. Make us conscious of the things that we may not uh, be conscious for. And because we spent a little bit of time talking about how some of us, maybe not all of us, but maybe how some of us have felt over the last couple of years in terms of will we make progress and that feeling of despair. It's also a reminder that in that progress and in our commitment, we as a collective humanity have done hard things. We have done hard things. We can do hard things. And in this collective stepping up, it will be on those hard days that your own passion and your own commitment to whatever your own contribution and service is will help sustain us in that. So to all of you, to, from your seat, from your own places of service, uh, we see you. We see you showing up for your communities. We see you coming and grinding and bringing all of the efforts that you have to make progress in the way that you want to see it that is reflective of the needs of, of all of the folks that we, that we serve. And in that effort, we will not leave any partner or any community behind uh, in that effort. And so from each of those seats, I just want to acknowledge my appreciation for all of you, your appreciation for being in this space, your appreciate my appreciation for the willingness to exchange ideas and maybe hear things either that you agree with or maybe you don't disagree with as well, including anything that I have mentioned as well. But what I will leave you with is something that I'm sure all of you already know, which is that time is of the essence, my friends. It is up to us. It is up to us collectively to hold a vision for what is possible. And so with that, I will just leave you with my appreciation. If there are questions, I'm happy to take them and um, can move on to the next point or take questions. Which one would you prefer? Sure. Executive Director Bell, thank you very much. Yeah, of course. That was truly inspirational. Um, my question is, you mentioned looking at new ways of funding affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Just, is there any, can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the question and please call me Andrea too. Um, so I'll mention a couple things at the top and I think there's a lot more to come from that. So I mentioned um, earlier that there are three executive orders that Governor Cot Kotek has established. Within one of those executive orders that focuses on production of affordable housing, uh, there is also a new body that's being stood up, so which is the Housing Production Advisory Council. Um, within the role of that council, which is still being developed in uh, the initial meeting uh, of uh, state and non-state partners coming together, we'll be coming here together very soon. Part of that work is to lay on the table, uh, quite frankly, um, the areas where folks from their own vantage points 
think that either our processes, uh, not only on OATS, but across the enterprise, maybe are a hindrance to production. Uh, I think one of the things that's really valuable around that group, uh, just to be candid, is it's not just state agencies. There are other folks that play and have a critical role in the production of affordable housing. I would have to imagine that what would come up amongst a number of things in that in those conversations are ways in which our own financing tools and programs um, need to shift and need to change. Uh, what I'll also say in that is ahead of that uh, conversation and at least that initial meeting, we've already started to generate some initial thoughts based on, quite frankly, community feedback that we've already received where folks have either said this is where your process sucks and needs to change and have given us some constructive feedback around where it uh, needs to change. Yeah, of course. Okay. All right, well, I appreciate your time. Sometimes
fill one of these out and you can just leave it on the table. Tell us sort of sessions you'd like to see in the future, things you wouldn't like to see ever again, um, different ways we can do our systems. That's helpful for us. We try to do one of these every year. We did a pause during the pandemic, but hopefully we'll be back next spring with another one uh, full of interesting topics like the one we're about to do. So uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Ben Schoenberger. I'm a board member for at Housing Land Advocates, and I'm also a land use planner for Winterbrook Planning. Winterbrook Planning is one of the name sponsors of the event. Um, there is a contingent of us here, so shout out to my employer and uh, sponsor of. We do land use and environmental planning. That's a small group of us here in downtown Portland. Um, so now that we've covered that, um, I would like to give an overview of our next panel, which is about uh, system development charges. So um, it's, wow, I saw somebody raise their hands in excitement. So uh, th this may be the nerdiest of our uh, panels in terms of it's a pretty obscure corner of planning and uh, public finance, but I think it at the heart of it is really, really interesting. And I hope to pull some of that apart uh, when we talk about it today. Um, I think, you know, SDC is one of those acronyms that sort of puts you in the know, like FAR or TSP. And there's only, you know, a certain subset of people who understand and care what these things are. But uh, I guess we're that subset. So um, that's what we're going to talk about it. Um, briefly stated, you know, an SDC or an impact fee, we can sort of talk about those in equivalent ways, uh, is a per unit charge on new development that's used to pay for public infrastructure, like water pipes or parks. I think that's a fair elevator pitch for what is an SDC. So it sounds simple, but there's actually a whole lot to it. Um, you know, quietly, they're, they're a key piece of the puzzle for how local governments pay for their infrastructure. And without them, uh, these governments would have a lot fewer dollars available to provide things like sewers that we need to make our cities function. On the flip side, though, as we all learn Econ 101, they're effectively a tax on new construction, which on the margins suppresses housing construction. So the purpose of the session is to unpack the issues around SDCs. First of all, what are they? Uh, how do they work? How do they impact affordability and production of housing? Do they actually drive development decisions? And how critical are they as a source of funding for the infrastructure that we all use? So the original idea for this panel came out of a report. Uh, there's a new report that is hot off the presses as of January of this year from Oregon Housing and Community Services that is all about SDCs. It discusses these issues. Um, I do want to give a shout out uh, to uh, Eco Northwest, who was a consulting firm that led that project. And one of our panelists is the project lead from OHCS, so she knows a lot about it. Um, so Becky Hewitt is here. I wanted to acknowledge her. Um, this is a very thorough and deep study. Uh, it's 236 pages all about SDCs. So I encourage you to uh, look it up and uh, dig deep into every last detail of it. Uh, I think it's important to pull out one quote from that study. It says the study is explicitly, quote, not intended to pit SDCs against housing production or affordability, but rather to clarify how they interact, end quote. So I think that's in the spirit of that. Uh, that's what we're doing here today as well. It does raise a ton of interesting issues, and it goes into a lot more detail than we can cover here, but look it up if you have more interest in it. Um, this panel, I think, walks the same ground as that report, uh, and it brings the idea of impact fees and SDCs to a wider audience and a more interactive setting where we can talk about pluses and minuses and things that are, could change or not about them. And we have a lot of smart people in the room, so let's let's dig in. So speaking of those smart people, I'd like to introduce my esteemed panel of experts uh, on the topic. Um, begin with, as I said, the project lead for that report um, to my immediate left is Elise Cordell Kennedy. Um, I wrote down her bio just a second ago that she gave me. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. So Elise is Senior Research Analyst at the Oregon Housing and Community Services. Uh, she specializes in data visualization, data and research uh, justice, and equitable program evaluation. Before she worked at OHCS, she worked at the Oregon Community Foundation. And I think, as we all do in uh, planning and housing, had a previous career as an opera singer. I, I didn't make that up. Um, 
She was the project lead for the SDC study that came out in January. Uh, to her left is Paul Del Vecchio. Paul is president of Ethos Development. They are a Portland-based real estate development firm that's active on the West Coast. So he actually builds the housing that we're all talking about uh, today. Uh, prior to founding, founding Ethos, Paul worked in development and construction management, financial analysis, and consulting for both public and private organizations. Uh, he has an undergraduate and graduate degrees in engineering and also a master's of business administration. And he serves on advisory groups for both the Portland Housing Bureau and Central City Concern. To his left is Anna Slatinsky. Uh, Anna has been planning division manager in the city of Beaverton, Oregon, since 2016. Uh, she was previously deputy director of the Brooklyn Office of City Planning in New York City. Uh, she engages in policy and regulatory approaches for housing, transportation, sustainability, industrial areas, and urban design. Uh, she has degrees from Hampshire College in Massachusetts and Hunter College in New York, and she is currently on the board of the Oregon chapter of the American Planning Association. So we have, I think, some really interesting perspectives on the topics of SDCs. And with that, I'd like to kick it off. Uh, we're going to go in the order that I just announced people. So we'll go first with Elise. Thanks, Ben. <clears throat> Thanks. Good to be with all of you. Uh, I just want to say I have to follow Andrea, my boss. So whoever did the sort of program lineup, I'd like to have a word with you on that because this going in a very different direction from aspirational and inspirational to very nerdy. So uh, come along with me as we talk about system development charges. Oh, I need the little, I need the clicker. So that's the wrong direction. No. Do I have to be closer that way? Okay, I got it. One more. So Ben kind of talked us through this sucks. Um, <laughs> it's kind of tough. I don't know. Maybe it's me. It's probably me. It's yeah. So Ben talked us through what a system development charge is. Um, I'm going to talk quickly about the report. Um, so in, in 2021, the Oregon State Legislature passed House Bill 3040, which directed us, OHCS, Oregon Housing and Community Services, to study system development charges and their role as a cost driver in developing housing. So we contracted with Echo Northwest. Becky Hewitt is here. She was our project manager on that. Shout out to her. Um, if I get anything wrong, sorry. Um, the Gallardi Rothstein group um, and FCS group, who are sort of the methodological rate setting experts, way smarter folks than I am. So um, I got to be a part of working on this report with them. And um, it, they, we released the study in December. And the report is broken up into a couple of key sections, including the history of SDCs, the legal contacts, their role in funding infrastructure, and then how they affect housing costs. I'm going to try again. Yes, great. Um, so what is an SDC? This isn't, now mine isn't moving. Okay. SDCs, as Paul mentioned, um, they're called impact fees, or my personal favorite is a tap-in fee, because it sort of, it, it taps, each new housing unit taps into the system of infrastructure, whether that's water into your house, or there's more people on the roads. And so there's an additional tug on the system that's happening when you, when you build a new place to live. So system development charges provide the additional resources that are needed to fund and maintain infrastructure. There's a survey that's done by the League of Oregon Cities on a nearly annual basis that sort of looks at cities and special districts and how they use uh, system development charges. And of the, I think it was 179 uh, cities that were surveyed, 66% of cities are using at least one type of system development charge. These types are parks, sewers, water, transportation, and stormwater. And the first um, SDC was enacted, sort of passed in Oregon in 1972. An Oregon statute allows local governments to set up their own individual methodology, and it requires them to do a capital or a master plan before they enact an SDC. If you want a deeper dive on the methodology, you see section three of the report. <clears throat> so what, why do we need them? Why do we need SDCs? There are lots of ways to fund infrastructure, and the federal government was a strong fund funder of infrastructure until the 1980s. Funding um, of federal infrastructure, as you see, nope. 
that's not the right graph. As you see in this graph, starts to decline in the 1980s, and local government now has to start to rely more and more on local funding as federal funding declines. So today, federal dollars make up around 25% of the funding for infrastructure, uh, transportation and water infrastructure, which means that when funding federally declines, you need local governments need to rely on other sources of funding. Enter SDCs. At the same time that federal funding is decreasing, other things like costs um, are increasing. It costs money to build infrastructure. So that's the cost of construction, the cost of repair. There's also, this is important to note, an increase in the passing of different regulations, environmental um, and all kinds of other regulations that make things like roads, air, water safer and better for people. And these are great things, but they also lead to costs, costs in the development process. They add time, they add administrative time. So they're important, but they also add a level of complexity to the mix. So at the same time that federal funding is declining and costs are increasing, something else is happening, property taxes. Property taxes are complicated, and I'm not here to give you a deep dive on property taxes in the state of Oregon, um, but I'm sure you could take a, a property tax accountant, economist, someone out to lunch, and they would tell you all about it. I'm going to just kind of quickly talk you through Measure 5 and Measure 50 and how this impacts funding for infrastructure across the state. So um, there is a movement sort of across the country in the 80s and 90s to limit property taxes. Um, the property measure measure five is the first thing that happens in the state of Oregon. If you want an interesting podcast on this, Malcolm Gladwell does this great podcast about the history of property taxes and uses Prop 13 outside of California to take you through this. So that's interesting. You should check that out. Measure five in Oregon is the first thing that happens, and it essentially limits the property tax rate. So before 1991, Oregon has a levy based property tax system. And that leads to a sort of annual revenue generation of about $26 as of an average tax rate for every $1,000 that your home is valued at. Um, this rate is set by taxing districts according to their local needs. I'm not going to talk about how that happens. But essentially, Measure 5 comes along and says, you know what, scrap that. That's too confusing. We're going to limit the tax rate to $5 for every $1,000 of the value of your property, We'll give that to schools and then $10 for every $1,000 for the general government. So that in turn cuts the local revenue by about 51% across the state. Measure five comes along that also changes things that takes us from real value to assessed value. You can see how that really changes over time. And so real value and assessed value sort of used to increase together in, in sort of this nice parallel relationship. And that changes with measure, measure 50. <clears throat> Go to the next slide. So when we think about paying for infrastructure and why SDCs are charged at all, it's important to understand how much is being charged for each type of SDCs. So this graph shows the cost of SDCs in 2007 and in 2022. As you can see, parks and transportation are increasing at a faster rate than others. In addition to the increase in construction costs, which leads to this increase in SDCs, there are other factors other than construction costs for new facilities that make SDCs more costly. These things include other regulations, like we talked about escalating land costs, or possibly just an under-reporting of uh, SDCs in 2007. So this it creates a $15,000 total average for each of the combined jurisdictions for each type of infrastructure um, that we see here. I'm not going to talk you through the SDC methodologies and the different rates that they are set at, but something that's really important to know is that Oregon statute allows governments and special districts to do their own methodology. The methodology is complicated. It takes a year-long process. Um, some of the folks who wrote this report are key individuals in um, designing and implementing uh, SDC methodologies. Those of you who have done this um, have probably worked with them before. And local governments take a lot of things into account when they're setting their methodology, including like what other governments around them are doing, how the costs are broken up between the current user of an infrastructure system and a new user, other grants and funding sources that are available to make upgrades to the it, systems of infrastructure that we all use all the time. And one last thing here to note is that once the rate is set, once the methodology is done and all that really hard, uh, interesting, fascinating work is done, 
the methodology says, okay, you can charge X amount of money for your STCs legally for this type of infrastructure. A lot of local jurisdictions are not actually charging the full amount that their rate is set at. Sometimes they charge below or even well below their methodology for a lot of reasons, but often to remain competitive or stimulate other types of uh, production and economic development. So because SDCs are a cost, they're one of the many costs to build housing, they do affect the cause of housing. However, the ratio of SDCs to the total development cost and how that affects development varies widely across the state, across regions, across housing types, and whether or not there are exceptions for affordable housing. I think this is the part in the conversation where we really talk about the difference between developing market rate housing and develop affordable housing. When we talked to developers, we had a really robust and interesting stakeholder process. And developers were, of course, a primary part of that process. We talked mostly with developers who work in market rate housing. And one of the things that we heard from developers in these focus groups is that they decide what and where to build primarily on the market. So they do possibly respond to SDC costs. And some ways that they respond to that are that they build smaller homes or bigger homes. They develop in middle, they or they develop in, they invest in middle housing. Developers shared that SDCs are one of many factors that determine where they build. There are other factors that may outweigh SDC costs sometimes, and that includes things like land, the cost of land, the market conditions, and permitting time or the permit requirements in that area. SDCs are sometimes, according to the developers that we talked to, enough of a hurdle to make a development infeasible, especially in cost-sensitive types of housing like entry-level or middle housing. Multifamily production can be affected by STCs, but a lot of developers noted that when the STC rates are low enough, they have a relatively limited impact on multifamily development. I love this graph because it shows a cououple of really interesting things, right? It, show, it, sh it shows the cost, the share of SDCs in the cost of development, both for different housing types and in different regions across the country, across the state. So we're looking at two things. We're looking at regional and geographic differences, and then also the difference in the types of housing. So we can see that in the metro area, SDCs make up anywhere from 6 to 12% of the cost of development. And SDCs are a smaller share of the cost of development for larger single family homes. And then for smaller, they're a, they're a bigger cost. They're a bigger proportion of development. So if we think about the average cost of like one to 6% for a single family, and then compare that to the average cost for a multifamily home, which as you can see on the graph averages between five and 12%, we can see that SDCs definitely have a significant impact on development of multifamily or low-rise apartments. This study also, when we look at affordable housing specifically, found that SDCs likely consume millions of dollars every year in the funding of affordable housing. So some takeaways. SDCs affect housing costs and they affect certain types of housing more than others. Um, SDCs for affordable housing, as we mentioned, can cost a lot of money, but what's important to understand is that there are other cost drivers, like we talked about land, permitting time, hard costs, and these really can vary geographically. Um, so we have, we have to recognize also that SDCs can skew development more towards high cost homes because of the graph that we just saw um, than because of the effect that they have on single family high cost homes is lower than what they have on multifamily. Um, another finding was that the timing of payments, there's a whole section that's really interesting on the timing of, of, of when, when this fee is paid. So the timing of payments can make a big difference. The rate structure, um, whether it is applied per housing type or square footage, um, whether there are SDC credits for developers, which is also a really interesting thing that you can definitely talk to Becky about. Um, affordable housing waivers, all of these things make a difference um, how in how and where a developer um, decides to pursue housing. Um, 
SDCs are complicated, they are localized, and they are an important part of local government funding. And so this begs the question of how can we improve this process in supporting and funding local infrastructure as we also think about incentivizing housing development and economic growth? How can we design a system that incentivizes production, specifically affordable housing production, to meet the governor's new housing production goals and ensure that all Oregonians have access to safe and affordable housing. I will hand it over to Paul. Thank you. Good luck. Everyone, um, I'm take a minute to try to work this tech out. It's all lined up, so oh, I'll right just here. roll through to the next yeah. presentation, I think. Great. There we go. That wasn't that hard. Uh, as uh, was mentioned before, my name's Paul Del Vecchio. Um, I run a uh, market rate development company uh, here in Portland. Um, market rate kind of has an asterisk. Um, in a lot of ways, we do things that are affordable, but they're privately funded, and they're also lower case A affordable. So more accessibly priced than um, uh, you know affordable generally means subsidized in some way or, or uh, rent restricted. Um, the only purchases that we do are are uh, related to um, like inclusionary housing, uh, or we got a tax exemption you know in Washington that that requires some amount of affordable. But um, we you know pay attention to affordable housing. I think I think it's worth um, just kind of pausing on that concept for a second because several distinctions have been drawn between affordable and market rate housing. And you'll see lots of needs analysis that will say that so many housing units are required between X and Y, you know, Y and Z percent of AMI. Um, but if you overproduce at the top, uh, you know, de developers left to their own devices will overproduce. Today's luxury is tomorrow's affordable if if uh, it doesn't absorb. Um, so, you know, filtering happens and you can easily create workforce housing by overproducing uh, housing at the top end. And you know, removing obstacles to market rate is generally a good thing for affordable housing, um, because the overwhelming majority of housing produced in this country is private, you know, private capital and, and private delivery. So, um, kind of worth worth noting. Uh, you know, I don't know how much of of this group is kind of on the development side versus um, you know planning and government, but it's just worth noting. Um, so there is a lot of overlap here. I think. Just a much more granular version to of what you just saw. Um, I just broke out some projects from the last few years uh, just to show how the systems development charges. These are all in Portland, um, so this certainly. I know this is you know kind of a wider Oregon lens, but we don't work anywhere else in Oregon at the moment. Um, so you know that that is in the mix for um, what Elise just said between I think five and twelve percent or so. Um, the, the one thing that's tough when looking at that information this granular is that what was on the site previously uh, matters because it is deducted from the SDCs that you're required to pay. So um, if there was a fourplex and we took it down to build 130 units, uh, it is minus four uh, units. And it's not exactly that because it might have been bigger units that have more of a credit and there may have been more hose bibs. It gets very, very granular. Um, but the the other part is um, what you are building. So the smaller the unit, generally, the less impact fees are associated with it. So on the right there, I've got some notes about what they are. Generally, our buildings skew smaller, so uh, there's some consistency, but it's not totally consistent. Um, so I just tried to give you a, um, a broad brush. Uh, and on the one on the bottom, um, had some heavy SDCs that there's a, there was a big offset, which is why it's 4.6%. But um, there, there kind of is a broad upward trajectory, um, you know, and I, I think uh, that's that's something kind of I want, want to get into on the next slide is how construction costs have changed um, and other costs versus SDCs. So, you know, we've seen some tremendous increases in SDCs. And um, if you took the information that Elise showed, uh, that was for single family and then broke out the Portland part, went from 2007 to 2020, you'd see that it was 8.5% annualized increases in SDCs. And in the last two years, 
there's been 8.5% annualized construction cost increases, and we're calling it an inflation catastrophe, and it's halting construction all over the country. How it's justified that that happened for that many years in a row is beyond me, but you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like a, a reasonable thing to burden housing production with, uh, especially at that rate of increase. Um, you know, it, it, as a percentage, when you look at, you know, what the SDCs are as it relates to the total project, everything increased, that just increased more. So you're not going to see that level of increase as a percentage of the total project, but it is becoming more and more of a burden over time. Um, and that that is a drag. Um, so I'll, So the way... Um, one would look at a development project, understand if it's viable or not, is take the sum of the total costs, um, that includes everything from finance costs, um, you know, interest reserves to pay your interest while you're under construction, to the land, development fee, contractor, everything, uh, and divide it by your NOI or net operating income. Um, that produces a yield on cost, which is you know, as close to a financing agnostic uh, return metric as you can get. Um, so if you just removed um, SDCs out of a project, you know, we're seeing 20 to 25 basis point or 0.25% uh, change in performance. Um, th that is enough for someone to invest or not invest in a project. It is like very clear. It's meaningful enough to mean go, no go. And, um, you know, I'm not naive to the reality that the infrastructure needs to get paid for somehow and it is necessary the question is who is paying for it and when and who does it benefit um so you know new new developments are also burdened with other infrastructure costs um, that are not sdcs and it's not you know sdcs are not a net of those costs so local jurisdictions will also often say well your building is affecting the near nearby intersection in a certain way you know change it and there's not much leverage for one project or one developer to argue with them. So you eat the 120 grand. That's also an SDC, right? It, it is literally the same thing. It is the effect that your building is having on the infrastructure nearby. Um, so it, there's a lot of double dipping that happens and, and it sort of flies under the radar. Um, I don't know that there's any real data on it because this is a whole host of individual actors trying to get their projects through. Um, and the, the, um, the jurisdictions collecting the money are, are different. Um, and, uh, you know, I think practically what all this means is that um, you've got, you know, new residents that are not yet represented or identified bearing the burden for this new infrastructure that the entire community benefits from. And especially considering the dramatic cost of SDC increases and the fact that they didn't previously exist, You've got housing stock, be it for rent that's owned, you know, by a corporate entity or, you know, uh, individual owners increasing in value because the cost to reproduce it is higher. So parties that are not contributing to this new infrastructure are actually getting the benefit of other unrepresented people paying for it. Um, and it, it, it's, it's not really an equitable distribution of these costs. Um, for what it's worth, um, we also work in Washington. Uh, there are not these costs, but there's a 10% sales tax. So economically, the projects work out almost the same. It's just a question of how you know how the how the fees are paid for. So um, you know, I, I I don't think just deleting them is ever a possibility. But you know, I think rethinking how how the money is collected and, and where it goes is is worth considering. Um, and just for, you know, on our projects, the annual property taxes, which, you know, if the system weren't so broken and frozen in time, um, again, you know, have lunch with your friendly tax attorney to discuss in more detail, um, you know, it, it, that would be the likely source of income. Um, you know, for us, you know, if we build a new building, the uh, SDCs are made up for in about six or seven years, but the tax keeps going forever. So, you know, why, why is that not sufficient? Um, and this, this, this point, um, the second bullet here, you know, I think this one is, is really important. And, um, if we're you know, getting very granular on this, when SDCs are paid, um, I think is, is really worth considering. They're typically paid up front as a condition of getting your building permit. 
Um, but if they are literally tied to impact, um, you know, there aren't occupants there for another two years on a multifamily project, maybe nine to 12 months for a single family project. Um, you know, they could be paid in arrears and that would help projects a lot. Um, you know, right now construction debt is, you know, north of 6%. You paid 2 million bucks. It's, you know, more than $120,000 you just paid to finance the 2 million bucks. So, um, just the fact that it exists so early is a meaningful component of the story. Um, and I don't know if, if uh, you guys all know what an LID is, um, Local Improvement District. Uh, it's a mechanism governments can use to um, basically impose infrastructure on you. So if you had a, a home, you know, and it didn't have sidewalks or the road wasn't paved and um, collectively uh, the government thought it was a good idea to, to put in sidewalks and pave the road, they could just do it and then, uh, you know, assess your property. I believe there is some public engagement process to, for you to be able to, to agree to that, at least as a community. Um, but then they carry it um, and it's carried carried for, uh, I don't know, I think it's a 30 year uh, mortgage, essentially a second mortgage at a relatively modest interest rate. Um, I don't see why SDCs would be any different. Um, I think something like that, they could be subordinated to a senior loan would be very helpful. Um, and then one, Kind of last point here, it's hard for me to understand why we're providing new infrastructure to agencies that can't afford to maintain the existing infrastructure. It seems like we're creating you know, sort of a, a worse problem than already exists. Um, as the SDCs are limited to creating new infrastructure because the, the whole concept is that um, they're meant to be paying for the use of the new people, not paying to maintain what already existed for the existing people. So, uh, but it's hard to understand how um, agencies that can't maintain their assets with the, the funding they have will be able to maintain new assets when they build them. Um, I think, yeah, okay. So yeah, that's that's what I've got. Um, maybe we can uh, get to questions and answers I'll, I'll, uh, later and I'll turn it over to Anna. All right, my turn to make sure the clicker works. <laughs> All right, cool. Hi. Well, this is awesome. I'm really happy that um, I have the chance to participate in this panel. I also want to start with the disclaimer, which is that I'm a city planner. I'm not an SDC expert. I'm not an infrastructure finance expert. I'm not a city finance expert. I'm also going to be in a little bit of a vulnerable position here. You know, that thing where they're like, oh, you know, if you're nervous about public speaking, imagine the audience in their underwear. Well, I'm going to be sharing some specific information about Beaverton SDCs. So you can just imagine that I kind of feel like I'm up here in my underwear. So, so um, be understanding SDCs as has been, you know, clearly discussed is important for building infrastructure. Um, it also has an effect on housing. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about city finance at a really high level. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Beaverton and Beaverton's kind of somewhat unusual status with regard to service provision. And then I'm going to share some case studies of some infrastructure projects that were funded by SDCs and also some specific projects um, and show exactly what the SDCs, well, okay, I rounded, but what the SDCs were for a multifamily project and for a detached single unit home, um, all kind of in the same area. So um, here we go. All right, what do cities do? Um, this is kind of about how cities pay for stuff. Well, why do they need to pay for stuff? Cities provide services and governance to a particular geographic area. There are probably academics who can have a much more subtle uh, definition of what cities do, but I think this is efficient for today's conversation. Those services actually vary a lot. We heard that 66% of jurisdictions in the state levy SECs. I'm like, only 66? How do they do their stuff? Um, but part of, part of the variable is that different cities actually provide different services. Um, and those services often include utilities, public safety, transportation, social services, permitting, code enforcement, but they are not all the same. 
how do the cities pay for the stuff that they do? Right. At least did a great job talking about the history of property taxes in Oregon. There are, you know, similar stories in other states, but property taxes are really um, fundamental way that cities fund their operations. There are lots of variables. There are fancy things like urban renewal, tax increment financing. We're not going to talk in detail about any of that, but it's all property taxes. Those, those are very flexible funds. Usually they go to what's called the general fund. There aren't a lot of strings attached to that, but there are a lot of demands on the general fund on that property tax revenue. Um, utility rates and fees, right? Water, sewer. We have miscellaneous other taxes. Beaverton has a hotel lodging tax. Some of those usually have, they usually have strings attached to. They can't be used for just anything. We have state revenues. Cities get a share, not a big share, but a share of things like income tax, gas taxes, et cetera. Um, we also have grants from the federal and state level. We love to have more. They're also not like reliable ongoing sources of revenue. They tend to be specific for particular purposes and projects, and they tend to be competitive. So some cities may be very successful in winning grants, but that often also means that there are cities that are maybe have the same needs, but are not successful in securing that grant funding. Um, we have system development charges, which we're talking about today. And then I put down here debt. Debt is not a funding source. It's not revenue, but it's a really important tool, funding tool, financing tool that cities use, especially for capital projects. Um, and so that's where SDCs kind of come into it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so Beaverton context. So this is a kind of rudimentary map of Beaverton. The colors are different neighborhood organizations. You may notice the boundaries are a little complicated. Um, Beaverton is, is in Washington County. We're bounded by Portland on the east. We've got Tiger to the south. We've got Hillsboro to the west, but we've got also a lot of unincorporated urbanized Washington County around Beaverton, which is part of why we've got this crazy boundary. So the county actually provides governance to a lot of areas that are not rural, that are around Beaverton and Washington County. Um, we have also multiple service providers that levy SDCs. There are actually four water districts that serve Beaverton properties. One of them is controlled by the city, but not all of them. Um, <laughs> We also have countywide sewer and stormwater service called Clean Water Services, and the city and Clean Water Services kind of share responsibility for providing those services. And there's complicated agreements that govern who's responsible for what, but generally speaking, CWS is responsible for like the countywide regional stuff, and the city's responsible for like the local granular stuff. Um, and then we have on the county side, we have a countywide transportation development tax. So this is a tax that applies to development in urbanized Washington County, and it's actually set by voters. So it's not subject to the SDC methodology that Elise alluded to. It's actually, it was on the ballot. And so it's extra inflexible because changes to that require literally going back to the voters. So it's actually a major driver in SDC costs. Okay, that was a pun. Transportation puns are, they kind of sneak up on you. Um, but um, but it's a, you'll see when I, when I kind of expose our SECs for a particular project, it's not a small amount. Um, Beaverton is a suburb evolving into a more urban community. Um, it's an exciting process. It's sometimes a painful process, but there's a lot of, a lot of really exciting changes that are happening that require us to rethink the way we do things in a kind of fundamental way. So it's good, it's hard. And we're almost at 100,000 population. Like I feel like calling up PSU, like, like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? So just briefly, Beaverton uh, takes housing seriously. Uh, it's a major city goal to find ways to better meet the housing needs of the community. We've had a five-year housing action plan. The first one was in 2015. It's been updated a few times. Um, it includes a lot of things that we do across the city to facilitate housing production. We also have diversity, equity, inclusion plan, climate action plan, 
I'm not going to talk about any of these in any detail, but I'm just kind of pointing out that there are a variety of overlapping policy visions and goals that shape city decision-making and sometimes also shape infrastructure investment decisions. So I at least did a good job on this one. So I'm not going to go too deep, but what can SDCs be used for? So capacity improvements, what does that mean? That means that we've got greenfield development, no sewer, maybe rural roads, no infrastructure. In order to produce housing in those areas, you have to build everything, right? It's kind of easy to understand what capacity improvements mean in that context where you're kind of starting from scratch. There's also infill development where you're creating more density, right? When, you know, a Beaverton neighborhood that was developed in the 1950s or 60s with, say, 100 homes, when that infrastructure was built, it wasn't built to accommodate 200 homes. It was built to accommodate 100 homes. So as infill happens, as redevelopment happens, the capacity of that infrastructure needs to be increased as a result of that development. And that capacity increase is that tie to SDCs, both in terms of the SDC charges for development and also in terms of the way the capital projects that construct those capacity improvements are funded. And the funding is sometimes complicated. Um, SDC revenue can be used to pay back um, debt service on improvements that were already made. So for example, when the city undertakes a big capital project, a lot of times that's not, that's not paid up front. We kind of mortgage it, right? Through selling bonds, through taking out loans and the service on that debt you got to you got to make those payments those are funded by sdcs as well as by utility ratepayers so sdcs are important as that kind of one time thing but also that flow of of funds is what helps us and make big investments in infrastructure that need to last for a long time um and finally just to say it again SDCs can't be used for operations and maintenance. We can't use them to fix a sewer pipe that cracked unless it's it needs to be a bigger sewer pipe to accommodate growth. SDCs can't be used to just pave a street or fix potholes. Um, they need to be used to, um, to serve uh, a larger population of residents um, or businesses uh, that basically is about the impacts and needs of that development, not simply the ongoing maintenance of the existing system. Um, and again, this gets back to the methodology, the amount of those SDCs is based on um, the impact of that development and the relationship to specific projects and the estimated cost of those projects over time. So state law determines that methodology, um, setting the SDC, requires basically master planning. You have to look into the future and say what, what needs to happen in order to serve that future community. There are projections made for population growth, et cetera. And that's how we basically get to a project list, estimate the cost of that project list, and then say, okay, how does that then get fairly divided among the different, um, the different types of development? And so that is when we say SDC methodology, that's what it's talking about. You have to define the universe of stuff that is going to be built by SDCs. And then you figure out how do you allocate that among the different development types? And there's room for that to be a nuance. There's room for that to be strategic, but it has to come back to that impact. Maybe the impact from an ADU is less than the impact from, um, from a, a detached single dwelling. Maybe the impact from a townhouse is different than either one of those things. Those are exactly the types of distinctions that the SDC methodology can and does draw. But if you haven't drawn those distinctions when you did your methodology, you can't just change it on an ad hoc basis because then you're messing up your relationship between those SDC fees and what they're actually paying for. Um, and then and then one of the other things that's, that's important is that um, uh, there are also these things called SDC credits. And I'll talk about that a little more in relationship to the infrastructure required to be built with development that is not actually an SDC. 
Okay. So this is where I start sharing the Beaverton specific information. So Beaverton updated the water SDC methodology recently. Um, the time frame that that included was 2020 to 2038. A total of $279 million in projects needs was identified for that time frame. Um, and the SDC portion of that cost was identified as 164 million. Um, and that again would be through either credits for work developers do and get reimbursed for, or um, or direct payments. And then the difference between 279 million and 164 million comes from other revenue sources, usually ratepayers. So when you pay your water bill, right? If there are higher SDCs, that water bill can be lower. If the SDCs are lower, that water bill will be higher. Um, a sample year for Beaverton revenue. Again, we're sticking with water here. This is 2020. Now, years, years vary, right? This is just that snapshot. Um, but in 2021, the city collected $1.5 million in water SDCs specifically and $21 million from ratepayers. Now, remember, the ratepayers also pay for maintenance and water and water treatment, not just the capital projects that address growth in the system. Um, and then on the spending side, again, snapshot, the city spent $30 million on capital projects for water. It didn't include maintenance and repair. That's that's those growth-oriented projects. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. The point is that different revenue sources have different constraints and strings attached. They are not all fungible. Again, that general fund money that comes from property taxes, very flexible, but in very high demand, limited by state law. Right, payers? Yeah, you can jack up those rates, but that's going to impact everyone, perhaps disproportionately people who are lower income. Um, here we get to a couple of specific project examples. These are both in South Cooper Mountain, which is a greenfield development area at the edge of Beaverton. It was added to the urban growth boundary in 2011. We did the community plan in 2015. And as development started, right, developers start coming in, filing land use applications. They've got to get water. They've got to get sewer, stormwater. So looking at water specifically, You'll see, and it's a little bit hard to see, I've got this arrow pointing to this green oval. Um, there was a developer that was ready to come through the land use process to get entitlement to build a bunch of housing. There was no way to get water unless they went through the property of someone else, right? This was a, this was a major impediment. So uh, we worked out an approach where the city negotiated purchase of an easement to build the water line through the neighboring property. There was a, a lot of persuasion involved, right? That's the kind of thing you can use eminent domain for, but you don't want to. <laughs> you want to have a willing seller, um, but it was, you know, we got there. The city built the portion of the water line that went through that neighboring property. The developer built that water line on their property that they controlled. That completed water line unlocked the development of thousands of units of housing, not only on the property of the developer that we were working with directly, but also in other parts of South Cooper Mountain. So SDCs financed this work in two ways. The city used $5.3 million, excuse me, $910,000 from our SDC bucket that we had, right? Um, and 4.5 million from bonds. Those bonds, again, backed by future SDC and ratepayer funds. The developer constructed portion was partly something that they were responsible for doing because it fell on the direct impact to development side, right? It was the, the water demand for the homes that the developer was proposing to build. But part of that project was also creating water infrastructure for other development that this developer was not proposing. And that portion of it was eligible for SDC credits. That means that developer built it, they got a coupon, 
And when it came time to pay the SDCs, instead of writing a check, they're like, I've got a coupon. <laughs> so I don't owe as much because I built that stuff up front. It's a really important tool. Okay, here's the here's the painful part. SDCs in Beaverton are high. This is SDCs for a single detached dwelling. I'm gonna show a multifamily building next. Um, I also am gonna point out that um, this is where those other service providers come in. So the water, this was all Beaverton Water District. We've got four water districts in Beaverton. This is all the Beaverton Controlled Water District. The first one is that water SDC. We've got sewer, that's clean water services, and also the city, it's pretty much set by clean water services. So we collect it, and then we send most of it to this other service district that's independent jurisdiction. Uh, stormwater, same, clean water services in the city. TDT, the county transportation development tax set by voters on the ballot, it's a lot of money. In South Cooper Mountain, we have a supplemental transportation SDC because when we did the comprehensive planning, we had to look at how much it would cost to build all of the roads for this community. And we couldn't build it without extra SDCs. We set this, we set this figure at 75% of the actual cost, right? It's it could have been higher, <laughs> right? And you know, basically, like you look at it, you're like, oh, that's a lot of money. Okay, maybe we can do 75%. But then where does the rest of it come from, right? So that, that's where, well, that's going to come from ratepayers, which is a citywide income source. Um, then, um, then we have parks. Walton Hills Parks and Recreation District um, provide wonderful services, beautiful parks, very expensive SDC. Um, and they actually had a higher level SDC for South Cooper Mountain for a similar reason that the city has a supplemental transportation SDC there. The total cost is, you know, $48,512. It's one unit. That math is easy. So that's the per unit cost of SDCs for single detached housing in South Cooper Mountain and Beaverton. It's a little lower in other areas of the city because you don't have those supplemental SDC costs. Multifamily. This is a 75 unit building. Uh, the SDCs, again, <laughs> it's much higher. We're talking about a bigger building. Um, on a per unit basis though, it's much lower, right? It's 27,000, I mean, it's big, but it's lower than the single family, $27,492 per unit. I thought it was really interesting, the relationship between the proportional share of SDCs for different housing types that for multifamily, it's that higher share. It might be a lower cost, but a higher share, right? So for those detached individual dwellings, those might be selling for $800,000 per unit. So even though the SDC is higher, the proportional share of the cost might be lower than the multifamily, even though the multifamily SDCs are lower per unit. So again, the, the relationship becomes very, very dynamic. Um, Beaverton does a few things to mitigate the impact of SDCs on housing. I don't want to tell you that it is like perfect or enough. It's an ongoing process. Um, we still have to pay for the infrastructure. So there are a lot of difficult judgment calls that are made. Um, but we do defer payment of SDCs to occupancy, but not for detached single dwellings. The reason is that there's often a gap between the people that would pay the SDCs and the ultimate buyer. And if you go and you buy this new house and then they say, oh wait, you, you can't move in yet. You have to uh, you have to pay this bill. You're like, what? So there, there are some reasons why that, that particular product is um, we're more hesitant to defer SDCs to occupancy for that. However, for commercial and multifamily construction, we do defer to occupancy. Um, we, as I mentioned, we will sometimes set SDC levels at lower than the actual asset, like analyzed cost. Um, SDC credits, they're very useful. They're really important tool. They're complicated. There's room for improvement there too. Um, City also has a policy to backfill SDCs for regulated low income housing development. We have to budget for that from the general fund. So it's not, easy and sometimes sometimes it's hard to do that. I don't 
I don't think that we that we promise to do it every time, but that's the intent. And we have been doing that in recent years, but we don't we don't backfill for SDCs that we don't ultimately have. So we don't backfill, for example, for the parks SDC. Um, we do it for the SDCs where we're actually going to be receiving the revenue. Um, but we do work with our partners like THPRD to encourage them to also think about how their SDCs affect housing and to encourage them to think about the community in a broader sense rather than what their very focused individual mission might be. And then just a few concluding thoughts. Um, the report's great. Um, the executive summary is wonderful. The conclusion is wonderful if you don't have the stomach for like 200 hour pages, but I have read all of them and I think the analysis really supports those conclusions. Um, funding for infrastructure, it's limited um, and we need infrastructure actually in order to create housing. So there is, you know, there's, it's a double-edged sword. Infrastructure costs like SDCs can, can be a hurdle that not every potential housing development can overcome. But if we can't build infrastructure, to a certain extent, we can't build housing. Um, and then finally, I, and then we haven't really talked about it a lot, but there are these, all these policy goals, they're sometimes intention that we, you know, there's, it's like a lot of aspirations and not a lot of resources and making those judgment calls is really hard sometimes, which is not to say that there aren't win-win situations. We always are looking for those. Um, and as we think about state policy with regard to SDCs, you know, there's a, there's a whole construction here and there is definitely concern that if you just start pulling out pieces, then you might lose the ability to kind of do what it's intended to do. So that's just that kind of, kind of cautionary note. So I'm done. Okay, hey, great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask the first question, but I encourage anybody else who has a question to step up to our unfortunately fixed microphone um, and we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. So one thing I like to consider when we're talking about an existing system that's been in place for a long time and the potential for its reform, which I think is one of the ideas is how can we modify or reform this is what if we had a different history and what if we were to uh, change it radically in a way that we'll all stipulated it's not going to happen because this has been in place for for many years 30 years 40 years um what if there were no sdcs would we have a explosion of housing production would we have a collapse of public infrastructure um would we be able to find those sources from elsewhere um how would the system look so I was just curious if you had any thoughts on if we could start over, how might we distribute those costs differently using the existing funding mechanisms that we have? Sure. And I'd be happy to speculate on what I think would happen to the production side. Um, if you just deleted 5% of costs, you'd get a whole lot of folks moving to the market quickly to try to deliver into that lower cost environment. Um, land would get bid up over the course of 12 to 18 months and make up the difference. Um, so you'd probably get a short-term uh, increase in supply. I mean, you, you can maybe draw a parallel to what happened between 2016 and 2017 in uh, Portland. Um, there was a, it was the inverse. There was a new cost of sorts coming in inclusionary housing. So a bunch of people rushed to market before it happened. Mm -hmm. um, so same type of thing. That was avoidance of it rather than than benefiting from it. But um, that's that's what I suspect would happen. If SDC disappear as a funding source and is not replaced by something, um, the um, the there will be many infrastructure projects that cannot move forwards because there's not the funding for either doing the paying for it upfront or financing it over time. Um, and that will have an impact on housing production also. And I think, you know, maybe not right away, but it, it will certainly. I think the, the examples of the waterline projects um, illustrate that. Um, you know, and, and, then, and then in the, in the longer term, there's the question, right? Do rates go up? 
um, is the share of property taxes that is spent from the general fund on infrastructure. Is that going to have to go up? Um, what happens when you, that runs up against state law, which of course it kind of would immediately, um, what kind of other services would need to be cut in order to pay for the infrastructure that is deemed to be the highest priority. Um, and that's going to look different in every jurisdiction because jurisdictions have different tax rates under the state law. There was a kind of arbitrary nature to that actually that at least didn't mention, but jurisdictions kind of were caught at different points in terms of what they could levy for property taxes. So they're like Tigard has a very different maximum tax rate than Beaverton does. It's it's like we're right next door, but our situation is different under state law for, for, for that. So it has implications for both the ability of jurisdictions to provide services and tough, tough decisions that get made about how public resources are allocated if there is no, if there's no replacement for that SDC revenue to create infrastructure. I'll just add I, one of the details of the report, which I thought was pretty interesting, is about a third of Oregon cities don't have SDCs at all. So there's a interesting natural experiment of places that we've worked recently, like Almsville or Island City, that just they don't have them. So, um, but they those places may not also have much demand for new housing production. So these things kind of balance out. So please, Michael. Thanks. I I think so. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, thank you. Is. I uh, at least mentioned timing. There is there are two two bills in the legislature right now that might make incremental changes to SDC policy. I would love to know how much Paul likes them and how much Anna is scared of them. Uh, <laughs> the uh, on the timing issue, SB eight forty seven might possibly include something that would shift collection of SDCs to the occupancy permit. Uh, the uh, I, guess, I guess apparently the home builder is working on a, drafting a possible carve out for the case that the cities are most worried about, which is a subdivision, single family subdivisions where you have to collect it from the buyer, the individual. Uh, and the other case is in 2984, uh, House bill to exempt some or all SDCs for adaptive reuse of commercial properties. Uh, downtown switching from commercial to residential use, that sort of thing. I'd love your takes. On the first one, I think, you know, moving um, collections from, uh, said you were at me. Yeah, from moving collections from um, uh, your building permit to certificate of occupancy is, um, The example I used, uh, it's just the finance cost to carry from that, you know, point zero in your construction process to whenever you occupy. If I use two years and, and $2 million, uh, 6% or thousand dollars um, certainly helpful. I mean, that, you know, but that's, that's sort of on the margin. Uh, I think what would be much more helpful is getting it out of the capital cost stack entirely and moving it into some period of occupancy because that, you know, dealing with it with your sale or refinance would be so much more helpful because then it doesn't show up as a, you know, as a cost to the project and doesn't require financing at all. Um, the government is, is providing that minimal amount of leverage. Um, that one, the, uh, the second one was, um, about the adaptive reuse. I, you know, I, I think that's a whole lot of effort for, uh, what will ultimately be very little fruit. Um, you know, the, uh, the bar depths of office buildings are too deep, uh, about 70 feet is as wide as you can make use, um, efficiently for a residential. That's two apartments in a corridor. Um, once you start getting wider than that, which most, most office buildings are, uh, you've got a lot of wasted space. Um, so that's one, one challenge. Um, the other challenge is, um, it, well, the buildings that tend to be smaller also tend to be older and need seismic upgrades. Um, so that's tremendously expensive. Um, the cost to retrofit isn't that different from the cost to build. So I, I personally don't think we're in need of, um, adaptive reuse. I think we're in need of demolition. Um, with that said, you know, if you can, uh, start removing some of the policy obstacles, then, uh, yeah, sure. It helps. It all helps. Um, someone advocated recently that we should exempt, uh, retrofits from seismic upgrades. And I sort of winced at it because that's a life safety thing. Um, and their point was, well, there's 
old buildings all over the city. What makes them any different? Um, I don't know. I don't know what, you know, I'm used to building new buildings that are seismically resilient. So I sort of live in that space, but yeah, maybe um, putting money into old buildings that aren't seismically resilient is worth doing because we need housing. So someone needs to deal with the clash of virtues on, on, on this stuff. Um, on the deferral to occupancy, I, I think I actually described it. Beaverton already does that for a lot of development. Again, the concern would be for where the buyer isn't doesn't have transparency. Um, and sometimes there's a, you know, if you're talking about a subdivision with hundreds of homes, the record keeping on that would probably be kind of a nightmare. Um, hi, I'm a bureaucrat. Um, the, uh, the adaptive reuse, you know, honestly, I don't, worry about that too much. Beaverton has a very low commercial vacancy rate. And so it doesn't, it wouldn't really affect us. I don't think nickel and diming SECs is really that helpful. I think if we want to think about other ways of funding infrastructure fundamentally, we should ask those big questions um, rather than just kind of ticking away at it. But I did see a piece of draft legislation that I liked, which is, and I can't remember the number, but it would basically, the state would reimburse jurisdictions that um, that waived SDCs for low-income housing. Um, that would be something that I think would have a direct benefit for affordable housing developers. Um, and it would be able, it would keep that SDC methodology intact for cities. Um, we wouldn't be pretending that that affordable housing development has no impact because it does. <laughs> um, you still need to provide services for those people. Um, my question though, I, I don't know how, I don't know how that proposal will fare. I don't know how the state plans to pay for it or whether it's long-term. Um, but that would certainly be something that would be, um, probably fruitful to implement at the local level. Do you have a take on Paul's, uh, amended time moving the, into the occupancy period for collection? Um, I, I mean, beyond occupancy. Well, so you mentioned LIDs which is interesting. There's another tool called reimbursement districts that Beaverton just created some enabling legislation for. I think, you know, it's interesting in South Cooper Mountain, when we were trying to figure out all the funding tools, the city actually said, hey, property owners and developers, let's do an LID. And they were like, oh no. The way an LID works is that the property owners start paying that tax immediately, <laughs> even though they might not actually develop for X years. So I understand what you're saying. It's a really good tool for the toolkit. I don't know that other developers would necessarily agree with you. I was thinking more about the financing tool rather than the literal implementation. Um, the, the idea of just carrying the sum, you know, via a long-term debt vehicle, um, that subordinates it to be clear. So the reimbursement district is an, is an it works slightly differently. Um, it allows for, um, a developer to build a piece of infrastructure that's needed in order to unlock their development potential, basically. Let's say there's an intersection that needs to be signalized four corners. What a property owner on one corner wants to move forward, well, they need to upgrade the intersection. A reimbursement district would allow the cost for that to be distributed among all four corners. Um, but importantly, those other properties wouldn't have to pay until they develop. So it, it allows that cost of that piece of infrastructure to be shared um, in a way, though, that um, uh, is maybe not 100% certain for the developer that builds it, but is fair in terms of allowing for it to be shared at all. I don't think that it would replace SDCs, but I think it's a good complement. Let's get a couple more questions, please. So you mentioned that um, jurisdictions can come up with their own STC methodology, and I was wondering if there was any appetite or interest in a streamlined SDC framework or like a model code. So the question is about why does it take a year and a hundred thousand dollars to set STC rates? And I, I mean, not that. You have direct answers to that, but it's a very careful, very complex process for even establishing the rates at all. Is there a way to streamline that? So I asked our city engineer about this because I thought the answer would be, oh, the state makes it so hard. That is not what I heard. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, he's the last word on it, but um, I think it cost about $75,000 to update the water SEC methodology for Beaverton a few years ago. and 
uh, again, from that engineering perspective, they thought that it was a rational process. I would not say that there wouldn't be room for improvement, but I'm not an expert on this. Um, I think this is one of those areas where you see sort of the differences between what's happening in affordable housing and some of the recommendations, not recommendations, the report was not for recommendations. I, um, some of the observations that the report saw in ways to make this process a, a little a little easier and a little more streamlined. And so I think that there were findings that showed that exemptions can have an effect on how um, and where affordable housing is developed. And I think that if I hearken back to sort of what Andrea was saying after our lunch was the need to get really creative about the way that we finance. And again, I think about affordable housing because I work for the housing finance agency. So I have a different perspective, but, but I think the need to get creative of additional financial mechanisms that support specifically the development of affordable housing, because what we see from the Oregon housing needs analysis is they're you know, when we break it up into income brackets, the folks that need housing so severely are are those who are living at 80% or below the area median income. And so I, the the bill that Anna was mentioning, I think is, is a step in, in, a, in a direction to say, what are other sources of financing specifically that we can use in the development and incentivization, the way that any other development, whether that's Lyft or LIHTC, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, it incentivizes development what incentivizes the infrastructure for development of affordable housing, I think is a conversation of of minds and, and brilliant folks to come together and, and really look at what that could be and the ways that we can fill the holes that isn't that is that is creative and beyond um system development charges. Great. Um I think we're over time. Madeline Shane, can we do it after? Okay, sorry. Uh, so we're yeah, four minutes over time. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, especially to the panelists. I really appreciate your taking the time to prepare and speak with us today. And let's have a hand.
Is everyone ready to get started on the next panel? Hello? Hello? Is everyone ready to get started on the next panel? I think we are right on time. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Angel Falconer. Um, I have the honor of being the newest HLA board member um, and very grateful to have been asked to moderate this panel. Um, in my, let's see, so you all know why you're here. Natural disasters exasperated by climate change present existential challenges for Oregon communities, particularly for those who are already marginalized. However, efforts to plan for these threats can run counter to our equally critical housing goals. This panel will highlight research on how flood and wildfire prone areas navigate this challenge, as well as a project on the coast, which incorporates resiliency from the ground up. Um, so in my day job, I, um, I have a little bit of a personal interest in this topic because I have the privilege of working with a team uh, who represents a class of 2020 Labor Day fires uh, victims. They, some of them lost everything. Um, so I've spent a little bit of time reflecting on the challenges um, that we'll discuss on this topic. Um, in my previous life, I was not an opera singer. I was a city councilor in the city of Milwaukee. Um, our planning commission and our city council uh, would often grapple with the tension between the critical need to build housing and also our responsibility to plan for threats from increasingly powerful storms and other, event, other weather events driven by climate change. Chatting earlier uh, today with some planners, I won't point you out, um, but we were sort of wondering about, you know, whether some of the same fights that I would see at those hearing, in those hearing rooms would break out today. I hope not, but I do know that there are a lot of very smart, passionate people in the room who care deeply about these two topics and the intersection. So I hope that you'll join us for a very lively discussion. And with that, I will introduce our panel. We have with us uh, Elena Taylor Doss. Um, she joins us. She has a special interest in collaborative governance and hazard planning. Elena is contemplating her master's in public policy at Oregon State University. She's a graduate project assistant at OS OH, sorry, OSU's Fire Extension Program and OSU's Policy Analyst Lab, Analysis Lab working on projects centered around wildfire preparedness. Her research aims to highlight proactive, mitigative, mitigative and adaptive policy models for environmental hazards and other considerations for fostering collaborative community networks. We also have Katie and Kevin Schluka of Coyote Gardens, Inc. Um, they join us, they, they lead the development team for the Kingfisher Apartments a 23-unit workforce housing complex in the heart of Pacific City. They own and operate a small landscaping business on the Oregon coast, specializing in the design and installation of organic gardens. The Kingfisher is their first development project. We also have Trisha Patterson. Trisha Patterson is graduating in June with her Master of Public Policy from Oregon State University. Trisha studies housing, disaster planning, and how institutions hold it all together. She strongly believes that we can have nice things and continually inspired to advance fair and equitable housing and land use planning processes to foster resilient communities. And with that, well, let's get started. Hi, thank you for the introduction. I'm Elena. Just as a refresher, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about reaching consensus in the age of fire. I know a very dramatic um, title is still in the works, but to give some background, my identified problem is the rise in severity and occurrence of wildfires in the Pacific West. And so that also includes California, um, especially since they are quite ahead of us in wildfire preparations. 
In Oregon, the 2020 wildfires were much more extensive and impactful as, much, mo as most were, were in timber, uh, resulting in 1 million acres burned. The fire consumed at least 4,500 structures and nine people lost their lives. And so in 2019, Senate Bill 762 was proposed to the Oregon State Senate. And then following the 2020 wildfires, we saw a policy window open. And with this policy window, the bill was enacted in June of June 25th, 2021, and was designed to assist Oregon in modernizing and improving wildfire preparedness through three key strategies. First, they outlined creating fire adapted communities. Second, developing a safe and effective response. Third, increasing the resilience of Oregon's landscape. The bipartisan legislation implicated 14 state agencies and allocated approximately $220 million to address wildfire mitigation and adaptation in Oregon. And in total, it outlines 15 objectives to address this. The top priorities, which has been outlined by existing literature, is to define and establish classes of the wildland urban interface, to develop the statewide wildfire risk map, the establishment of local defensible space requirements, the development of landscape resilience and fuel reduction programs, and establishment of small forest grant programs. And this is gonna be a slide more so as an informational slide, um, but I'll be talking about the defensible space requirements and new building cones since they relate to my research. Um, for defensible space requirements, this will give financial, administrative, technical, or other assistance provided to local governments for administrating and enforcing defensible space. Defensible space is a buffer that homeowners can create on their property. This can be managed through the types of plants they have, the tree coverage, and then also the type of litigation they have, or not litigation, um, the type of water management they have on the property. And then also I'm looking at the new building code standards, uh, which will have additions to existing dwellings and future dwellings in extreme and in high wildfire risk zones. These new building codes will actually be established following the publication of the map, which is the state wildfire risk map. And this map is going to set extreme, high, moderate, low, and no risk class, parcel class um, for Oregon. And so the fun good map, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is of this map, but it has created a fun conversation, especially within wildfire management. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, the, it was originally released in June, 2022 and OSU published it in conjunction with ODF and the State Fires Marshal's Office. It considered topography, climate, weather and vegetation and, and determining parcel level classifications. There was also a layer on the wildfire explorer that identified socially and economically vulnerable communities. And this is a vital step to the bill because it informs which communities will be required to uphold the regulations and protocols outlined. And as you note, um, the red and orange are our high and extreme zones and then the yellow to green and blue are gonna be our moderate to no risk zones. And so what are my questions? Um, I am looking at how did state agencies interpret their roles and responsibility in 762? And then I'm also looking at the barriers and opportunities agencies have experienced in conducting community outreach for this bill. And my overarching question is how might consensus be achieved in wildfire preparedness state legislation? To address this question, I have quite a few uh, methods that I'm using. I first started by interviewing Jackson County residents who are in a high and extreme zone. And I'm also in the process of interviewing agency representatives from ODF, OSU, and then hopefully the State Fires Marshal's Office. I also did a thematic coding of wildfire risk map community information session that was held in Medford, Oregon in July of 2022. I'm doing a few literature reviews. I looked at best practices for CWPP creation publications, and I'm currently looking at Oregon County CWPPs that were published before 2010. I'm looking at community outreach on Senate Bill 762 by selected agencies proceeding, or yeah, preceding the publication of the map. And then I'm also completing a cost benefit analysis of Senate Bill 762 on the defensible space and home hardening regulations and requirements. And finally, to wrap it up, I did a quantitative analysis of ODF, who we 
risk map appeals. Um, this was doing a 21 code thematic code book, and it included both call in, written, and electronic appeals, which was quite a few. So, our top three counties um, were Jackson, Jesus, and Josephine's uh, County, and they were quite frustrated, to say the least, about the map. Um, <laughs> While I won't be expressing any of the comments in those appeals today, hopefully they'll be public soon and it is a nice fun like reading. <laughs> and when we looked at these appeal changes, we actually saw our two top categories were high to moderate and high to low. And these changes would mean that it, they would no longer be responsible for upholding the new regulations that would be in place. And these are a few of the quotes that I captured in the Senate bill hearing in Medford, um, the top themes that we saw was interpretational differences of risk. A lot of people cited arson and it should have been included in the map. We also saw a distrust in government management. A lot of people cited how BLM land is being managed currently um, and certain forest service um, involvement with the bill. We also see insurance concerns that has most likely been the most prevalent concern that we've seen. A lot of people are very confused on why their insurance is reaching out to them during the same time the map was published, which was a coincidence. Um, and then we have a distrust in science that we're seeing. Um, there, most people stated that there was no analysis, there was no study. We saw a lot of people cite that no one ever actually came out to their property. And so how do we define science in the age of comprehensive environmental um, problems? And then bringing it down to a localized view, um, when asked if they thought the regulations would help, we saw a split. 30% um, felt that it doesn't, they, they do not think it will help um, versus 30% did feel that they would help. And when asked about awareness of programs and regulations, while majority of our participants were aware, very few actually cited Senate Bill 762. They had cited older regulations in place, especially for defensible space. And then when seeking assistance, most people cited their neighbors were seeking assistance. However, they felt that their dispensable space was up to protocol. Notably, I would um, like to point out though that with our respondents, we had a high volume response that we're actively doing um, fuel management practices on their property. And a lot of them had had experience with wildfires. And we defined experience either through wild fighting, having a fire come up to their property or personally having their property burn. And then the general, uh, it was a wide range, but generally we saw about about a thousand to two thousand dollar investment, with our highest being thirty two thousand dollars invested in their defensible space and a hundred dollars invested in their defensible space. So seeing that I'm still in the process of kind of wrapping this up, um, these are a few of my findings and considerations that I've noticed so far. Um, you do see a difference between reactive and proactive community outreach. Currently, we see more reactive community outreach versus proactive, um, which has resulted in more issues rather than benefits. We also see a need for region-specific communication models, um, extensive knowledge on audience, the balanced conversation dynamics, framing, and then accessibility. A lot of these populations in these high-risk zones are notably older. About 10% of these populations actually are older through census demographics. And so meeting them halfway and how they respond to our communication styles is really important looking forward. And then also interagency collaboration, um, seeking consensus among agencies and their role and how we define our roles among each other is a really big step, especially with these new age environmental bills and then rebuilding or improving social acceptability. And so that is public trust and agency management, public experience with science, public understanding of science, and then community scale and collaborative networking. Fortunately, that's all I have for you today. Um, but I am presenting my research at the end of the summer. I hopefully will have a more comprehensive view, but it is a quite interesting topic. And if anybody wants to talk a little bit more about it after, I'd be happy to chat a little, but thank you for your time. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, we're Kevin and Katie Schluka. Thank you for our first slide here. 
16 or so years ago, Katie started our business, uh, Coyote Gardens in Southern Tillamo County. Uh, it's a landscape company, she said, specializing in creating coastal and organic gardens. Our business connects us with a lot of diverse uh, aspects of our community. You know, we're part of the construction industry. Uh, we also work with a good portion of local environment, environmental concerns, like the Watershed Council. And we know a good portion of the area's citizens and leaders. So when we decided to do something about our local housing crisis, we knew who to ask for help. And uh, we proceeded not, not with profit as our primary concern, but uh, with the goal to create healthy habitat, which is very much the same goal we have in our business. So the Kingfisher rendered here is a 23 unit building designed for long-term rentals at workforce rates. Um, a lot of our a lot of our presentation here focuses on the nuts and bolts of just getting the structure built. Uh, in order to make these apartments climate resilient and climate friendly, we frankly needed a bit of luck in finding an appropriate building site, uh, and we needed to manage our expenses efficiently in order to afford, uh, in quotations, the luxury of a place-based design and a landscape that would make the Kingfisher both climate resilient and climate friendly. Uh, much of our presentation therefore may feel a little off topic, but for better or worse, the financial and bureaucratic um, goes hand in hand with the environmental. So uh, there we go. Our first step was to select the right piece of land. Uh, on the coast is, as demonstrated in this map, um, the areas sort of central to um, our towns and communities coincide with special areas of, um, of flood hazard. Um, so if you were to find a suitable parcel of land that would be, you know, within walking distance of mass transportation or riding distance of a grocery store or other services, chances are you were going to be dealing with either a tsunami zone or a flood zone or the flood way. Um, if you were fortunate enough to find uh, a parcel of land that physically fits the bill, it'll also need to be zoned appropriately too. Um, if in that zoning, multifamily is not an outright allowable but instead a conditionally allowable use, then you'll need to design the structure prior to acquiring your land use permits. So this is the site plan for our building and I've outlined in red the, um, the delineation of the flood hazard area. Um, so you can see we managed to keep the structure, not a lot of rooms we get this. Yeah. Okay. We just managed to keep the structure out of this. This has real world implications, one uh, in terms of cost, certainly not just construction costs, but ongoing insurance costs. Um, but there's also an element of safety and assurance that it provides to our tenants. Um, but perhaps more importantly than all of that, it, it demonstrates, it, it correlates with a real world situation on the ground, real wo world topography. And so, uh, the fact that our building sort of follows that topography has design implications that are positive. It fits the landscape. Um, and we owe a lot of credit to our design team at Jones Architecture, which is a Portland-based company, although Alan Jones, the principal, has a place in Pacific City. Um, they did an absolutely wonderful job at creating an efficient building. It looks and functions wonderfully within its unique environment. Um, and it was it was an enormously rewarding investment we made, um, having found a really good team of architects. Um, by the way, they're also responsible for the renderings. Uh, here, here's one rendering that when I first saw it, uh, made me quite emotional actually, because uh, Katie and I have lived outside of Pacific City for almost the last 20 years. And within Pacific City, uh, we've never known a child to have been born and raised there. Um, and so when I saw this corner unit with what I assume is a mother pointing out uh, probably a pelican to uh, her son or daughter, that, that really made me excited, excited for this project. Um, the property we brought for this project was zone C2 neighborhood commercial. It's an all residential structure uh, requiring 15 foot setbacks from the front and side. 
Uh, the property also in its particular zone had a 24 foot height restriction that might necessitate a flat roof, um, which is a difficult proposition, both structurally, structurally and aesthetically um, on the coast. Uh, this all posed a unique problem that meant we would probably have to add a variance request to our conditional use application. Um, we needed some additional allowance on the height of the building, and we also needed to push the building as far to the west as possible, which is away from the river that you see there. Um, the reason for this was to create as much distance as possible from the river, from sensitive riparian areas, and the flood zone, as you saw. Um, and the second reason, oddly, was that um, that property has an east-facing slope, and the more we push the property into the slope, um, the more advantageous it was, uh, according to the, the the equation the county uses to determine allowable building height, um, it would give us extra headroom and perhaps the ability with a modest variance to do a slope roof rather than a flat roof. Um, The idea of headroom and a sloped roof plays really importantly into an easily overlooked concept that I think is an integral consideration towards workforce and affordable housing and climate resiliency, and that's the issue of dignity. Um, if we're looking to build housing that will survive the increasing climato climatological vagaries that we anticipate, then it's equally important to design for dignified circumstances using enduring materials. Um, really, we've only created a new problem if the houses we're building uh, look like they're falling apart in 10 years. Um, we shouldn't be really in the mindset of storing people. We really want them to be homed. And if a home import, imparts stability and imparts dignity, It'll pay great dividends for the tenants, um, for their employers, because that dignity really means something through the course of a day, um, for the neighbors, and for the entire community. Uh, on the other hand, if a complex ages quickly, it will likely create a negative feedback loop that limits future investment and maintenance and diminishes pride of ownership. It's a tough sell to make um, the investments, you know, in handsome design, landscaping, interior volume, et cetera, um, particularly in our current economy. <laughs> uh, look closely at this one. Uh, the price and availability of building materials have skyrocketed these last two years. Interest rates are making it more difficult to pencil these projects too. This is our receipt for the sewer and water connections, the SDCs with the sewer and water. And I wish I could tell you that this receipt was like a publisher's clearinghouse style check that you get on that man. But I, if you bought a headless Barbie at a garage sale, it would come on this receipt. <laughs> There's no way around most of these expenses. Uh, and our secret sauce uh, to get there involved a shameless and continuous appeal to all parties involved for free or reduced services, for grassroots solutions from knowledgeable locals, for creative financing, for state and county incentives, or incentives from local businesses and organizations for elbow grease, but probably most importantly, emphasizing to our, our investors, our private investors, this is a for-profit project. Um, the need for low expectations on their financial returns and high expectations on the social returns. We really pushed a double bottom line on this project. So as an aside, and I apologize, this is kind of where I'm straying from the topic of climate resiliency. Um, we paid for two appraisals a little over one year apart. Again, I want to import um, the fact that we were able to save money where we needed to and earn money in this case where we needed to in order to make the decisions we were able to make that this make this project climate resilient and climate friendly. So as you can see, in a little over a year apart, there's a pretty big difference in the appraisals there. And I wish I could tell you as an exact science, it's not. Uh, so when you get a, an appraisal, if you get a good one, it makes a world of difference when you're talking to lending institutions. You really need to provide for the appraiser tons of unabashedly rose-tinted background on the project. And if you don't like their conclusions, send them polite reasons to reconsider. And if they don't reconsider, get another appraisal. You know, it's painful 
It's costly, it's time consuming, but it's well worth it. So this slide, uh, I've outlined the zones in unincorporated Tillamook County that allow for fourplexes uh, or smaller as an outright use. They're outlined in red. The zones that allow for a larger multifamily are in polka dots or they're in chartreuse or it doesn't really matter, there are none. Mm -hmm. It's it's generally assumed that the county was a big roadblock in this process, and people are fond of defaulting to our Department of Community, community Development as sort of the standard scapegoat and all things red tape. We approached community development early and often, and frankly, unceasingly, and the folks we worked with were very, very smart. They're very diligent, and they provided invaluable assistance helping us through the long and confusing, arduous, and frankly, soul-crushing process. <laughs> We, it was. we want approval at every stage of permit and appeal. Tillamook County uh, Planning Commission decision was appealed. Uh, then the Board of County Commissioners decision was appealed. Then LUBA was appealed all the way to the Oregon State Court of Appeals. Uh, it cost us a lot of money. It cost our detractors a lot of money, but it cost the county an enormous amount of money. The amount of work that community development, public works, and county council had to put into this to see it through cost a ton of money. Uh, a lot of expense and energy that's being lost fighting NIMBY in the courts should be going towards making housing more affordable and better. Homes can be created that are in harmony with the environment, dignified and enduring, but every penny and every ounce of energy needs to go towards the tangibles. Not spent fighting folks who misunderstand the import of attainable housing to a healthy community. The bar for appeals, I think, needs to be higher, or alternatively, the disincentives like counterclaims for legal reimbursement need to be stronger, or even better, zoning needs to be more inclusive, avoiding uh, the opportunities for appeal altogether. So, one last consideration. Like all of the coast and much of the country, South Tillamook County is a long-term rental desert. The nearest multifamily rentals to the south of us are in Lincoln City, about 24 miles away. To the north uh, in Tillamook, about 20 miles away. Actually, I have that backwards. Tillamook is 24, Lincoln City is 20 miles away. To the east, it's about 40 miles away. And to the west, it's about 2,600 miles away. <laughs> within, that, within that area I just described, there's literally hundreds of vacation rentals that are usually empty. So if we want to talk climate resiliency, if we want to talk climate friendliness, there's a lot of available land and available resources that are going towards empty houses. This problem is very much like our global food supply. It's not necessarily a question of supply, but a question of distribution. And I think that's a really, really important consideration uh, when we're considering the overall equation. So thank you very much. What? You can keep clapping. That was, <laughs> he's great. Thank you so much um, for setting that up for me. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So, hi. Uh, can you hear me okay? I could just yell. Okay. <laughs> So my name is Trisha Patterson. I'm a master's of public policy student at Oregon State. I go to school with Elena. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about kind of a continuation of the Kingfisher apartments. They're a major case study in my work. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about the hazards housing nexus and resilient coastal housing strategies. What does that mean? Do those exist? First, I wanna give a land acknowledgement. I'm sure this was down at the beginning. I'm sure that it's in your heads throughout this uh, day together, but I think it's personally important for me to acknowledge the room that we're in, the land that we're in, in this conversation that we're having. And Kevin, you, you gave a, a great introduction to this of why study housing and hazards? What's the connection here? Um, that these are inextricably linked, um, these challenges, 
vary in scale. Um, there's the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake that we are all viscerally aware of, um, but there's also smaller scale, more common um, hazards like flooding that you had to contend with, right? And then there's also this issue of housing, a housing shortage, especially on the coast. And the ways, so my project really studies the ways that these are linked, the ways that they consider each other. And um, each sphere is exacerbated by the other. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so this is a photo of the 1964 um, Tillamook, uh, earthquake. So there was a an earthquake that occurred off of the coast of Alaska, and it sent a um, tsunami down. Um, oh, I think only four people died technically, but it was very expensive, a million dollars in damage. Um, and this is this is from the Tillamook Headlight Herald. Um, it, it can cause some damage, right? So th so these things are are alive in our memory. This is within living memory. The role of governance. I approach this um, from a public policy perspective, as one should, it's my degree. Uh, and in exploring the role of governance in institutions, right, my, my degree is in public policy, my background, um, I'm looking at how institutions influence or enable community adaptation um, from a new institutional economics uh, point of view. A good quote, that I've uh, carried with me throughout my research is that uh, public policy should facilitate the development of institutions that bring out the best in humans. And then I have a question for the audience, who said this? Do we know? There are institutional scholars among us. Eleanor Ostrom. Right, she uh, wrote "Governing the Commons." She was she has actually this amazing um, background history. Y'all should look her up. Um, she was an adjunct uh, a hire at uh, the University of Indiana. Her husband got the big tenure job. They gave her a small office, and she started collecting case studies about governance and institutions and resources, um, and wrote a book and received uh, the Nobel. Um, prize in economics in 2009 for it. Amazing. She, I think she recently died. So, you know, she's not with us anymore, but um, this photo is of Astoria, Oregon. I show this photo uh, to kind of ground us um, in this idea that um, institutions make choices. They make trade-offs. Um, I show this photo because the city of Astoria chose to not include seismic upgrades when they redid their city hall. Oh, here we go. And the Kingfisher. So I'll be talking about this later. Um, Kevin, you, you set this up really well for me. You gave all of the background. Um, so Kingfisher. So we know, we know that hazards are a part of coastal living. That's just, it's just a part of life. Are there housing, resiliency-driven housing production strategies, and do our institutions enable us to get there? That was my guiding question. My research questions included these. I looked at how are coastal planning institutions enabling adaptation? So not is the institution itself adaptive, but how is it enabling community adaptation? What is the relationship between coastal hazard mitigation planning and goal-based comprehensive planning? Do, how do they consider each other? Do planners look at hazard mitigation plans? That was a very simple question that I asked. And are there housing strategies that are safer in a hazard and meet coastal housing needs? So this fall, so, so those are my questions. How did I ask those questions? Uh, I talked to a lot of people. I conducted interviews. I talked to 20 people between four stakeholder groups, um, planners, hazard mitigation specialists, developers, one architect, um, and housing advocacy nonprofits. There we go. Oh, okay. No, this wasn't supposed to be in here. So we're skipping past this. Uh-uh, no. Okay, um, so what what did they say, right? Those are, that was my framework, but we're not going to talk about that today. So what did they say? We got the four L's: land, lumber, labor, and laws. 
That's what affects housing. We know that. Also housing design, architecture, building codes, hugely important. Location, community characteristics. These are all things that influence housing resiliency. So my question, are there housing production strategies that enable resiliency? Yes. And thank God. That's I, I was happy to know that there are strategies that are currently being implemented um, that have these co-benefits. Um, so one of them was hold on to what we have. It's kind of like uh, maintain what we have, maintain the, where we are, uh, talking about continued integration of natural hazards plans into uh, community comprehensive plans. We also know that denser housing types are safer. Triplexes um, are built to the commercial code. That's what I've been told. Um, and that there are ASCE building, tsunami resilient building standards. And that process of codification from getting to a standard to a code can sometimes be arduous, but it is possible um, and is frequently done. Um, another thing that my interviews told me is to consider updating risk categories uh, for housing, to update them to be safe enough to stay. That would be a category four that came from architects. Um, and then always continued education and community outreach about these hazards. The other half of this coin is considering moving communities to safer areas. This would be like a managed retreat kind of strategy. So that's utilizing hazard mitigation as a basis for UGB expansion. That was top of the list for a lot of people that I talked about. Um, mentorship of coastal developers, new coastal developers. When I asked y'all, Kevin, Kevin and Katie, if, would you do this again? They said, uh, I don't know, because it was so hard. It was really hard. And I'll get to them, I'll, I'll come back to them on why they were successful. My last one here is um, streamlining and simplifying uh, zoning codes. The county planners that I talked to so that they would like to see updated model codes from the state. They want more resources from the state. So we know, right? The, we know what we need to do, but will our institutions allow it? That was really exemplified in this example of the Kingford Show Apartments. That's wrong, it's a 23 unit, not a 25, um, but they were special, right? They are workforce affordable, um, they had flood hazard considerations that was top of their mind when they first embarked on this journey. And it's right in the heart of Pacific City. So it's denser, it's infill homes. But it took four years. I don't know if you really stressed that. It took four years to permit and develop. And statewide, the statistic is that it takes seven months for a single family new home to be permitted and start building. So the, the discrepancy there is pretty huge. Yeah. So why, why were they successful? From my institutional lens of, of what enabled them to be successful. First, it was that they were persistent. They were so persistent and also that they had a highly localized building team. That was something that you really stressed to me was that everybody was local. They had mentorship from other coastal developers, people who were building in their area. They had um, the mentorship from the community development team. They were reaching out proactively. They could name people, you like able to name the folks who, who were, um, had their back essentially. And they had their own thoughtful developer vision and passion. And I want to go back, actually, because I want to continue to uplift that point that they made about the first architect's rendering, um, that when I asked them, how will you know if you're successful? They said, children. We will hear children in our communities. We will see young people in our communities. And I just wanted to uplift that again and, and spend some time on that, that 
that's it's important what this idea of community can i can i also yeah add, i'd like to add that we will hopefully see more people of color as well and that looks exactly like quite community exactly exactly so it was a housing success story that almost didn't happen um from my perspective, and I know from probably many of yours, if I had um, gone up against that many hurdles, I don't know if that project would have been successful, as successful as it is. Most, I mean, housing delayed is housing denied, right? Um, and so what are the consequences of uh, this institutional uh, preference for public involvement? This is um, sometimes described as a hijacking of the public process. Um, an institutional prioritization of goal one. And we saw that as well um, at the Oregon Housing Needs Analysis um, Amendments hearing. I think it was two Tuesdays ago, Rep Dexter um, made the same comment that not, shouldn't say that the public process has been hijacked. She said there should be parity amongst the goals, that goal one should be equal to goal 10. And these cause inequities in housing choice, right? So how is this being addressed? Like I said, with ONA, um, local advocacy, very persistent local developers um, who, and then also folks who are working to codify ASC, ASCE tsunami resilient building standards into the code. So in sum, it's, there's a lot of contending issues, right? And especially as we look forward to the next 50 years of land use planning in Oregon, and, and we are rewriting goal 10, and we're considering climate in, in housing, and, and we're, we're faced with almost a new set of challenges, a new paradigm. Um, and coastal institutions, planning institutions, face these concurrent environmental and social challenges. Um, institutions shape social practices and are themselves shaped. They change and can be changed. Uh, and that, I think, is its strength. That gives me hope that we can change. We can have positive influence. Um, yeah. Stakeholders are already engaging. The 20 people that I talked to um, this fall are already engaging in these adaptive actions, and they're is an appetite for more. The coast can sometimes be forgotten, I think, in, in sometimes of statewide housing conversations, but there was collaboration happening. There, there, there was um, intra-jurisdictional conversations, leadership happening. Um, and so they're, they're already doing it. Um, and then what's on the horizon? So I have um, a bit at the end, yeah, about my uh, funding source. Um, it's the Cascadia Cup Copes Hub. So it's the Cascadia Coastlines and People Hazards Hub. It's an NSF grant funded um, collaboratory. Um, OSU Extension Services as well, Elena. Um, yeah. So if we have questions about the COPE's hub, I can get into that, but I just wanna offer, thank you so much. I know that I'm the last person to speak at the end of a very long day. And so I'm so grateful for your time and attention. Um, I am looking for a job starting in June. Shameless plug, shameless plug. And then, um, I think that's it. Up ONA update is that it passed out of House Housing on Tuesday. It's being incorporated into House Bill 2001, which the irony is not lost on me. I love that. Um, and it's fast tracked to passage. So upwards and onwards. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, thank you so much. That was really um, inspiring. Also, a little depressing. No, 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 no. no I don't mean it that way. I, it. I have a call we to. <laughs> I agree with you. Um, and here's I'm gonna have a little call to action. Um, 
run for office and change the system or show up at these these hearings are happening all over the state all the time and there's probably a development near you that needs your love and support <laughs> Um, I don't have any open questions here, but I do want to kick us off because we did have one come in um, in, in advance of the panel today. It comes from um, Eleanor uh, Panomaroff. She's uh, with the, ta the, the Talent City Council. As you know, um, that city, of course, was, was deeply affected by the 2020 fires. Um, lots of loss. Um, she asks some questions uh, related to, you know, the inter that intersection of housing and, and resilience um, she says, the questions I would ask have to do with equity. Our data shows that homeowners are recovering from the Alameda fire da disaster far faster than renters, seniors, people of color, and folks with lower income. What's more, once houses start coming back, some people seem to feel that the recovery is taking care of itself, market forces, uh, and forget about the folks still struggling to get back, and may even resent resources directed towards getting those folks housed when the crisis seems to be in our rear view mirror. Um, years after a disaster, how do we ensure that displaced folks still struggling to find permanent housing in their communities continue to stay on our radar of the public local government and that we don't fall into a business as usual posture when there is still a need? I wondered if any, if you all had some reactions to that. Um, and I guess sort of relatedly, how can local governments combat the gentrification that seems inevitable after a natural disaster? Um, I wanted to open that up to see if you all had some reflections on that or, or maybe if, to maybe inspire some questions. I don't see anybody at the mic yet, but um, thank you. I have some thoughts. Yeah. Do you have some thoughts? You go. Oh, no. Okay. Elena. Yeah, I'll, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm, I currently completed a CWPP best practices recommendations for counties. Um, they're in the process of redoing theirs. And some of the key findings that I found in existing literature actually relates back to vulnerable population registries, which is this idea of using existing data and then also going out into your community and actually getting to know these populations and finding grass top people um, to first facilitate collaboration and conversation with these people, but also have an idea of what these populations will need in designing that post-fire recovery. Um, most CWPPs are very effective in designing preemptive measures and during fire measures on like how they will actually address it. But post-fire um, reactions have not been as strong and that will actually be a huge emphasis, I feel, in the new revisions that we'll be seeing moving forward. Um, but there is a huge, um, understanding that there needs to be more inclusion, um, especially as we can see that there are currently still populations um, that are displaced. And I'm assuming that's with Trisha. I'll let Trisha talk on that a little more. Yeah, I was going to comment that uh, climate gentrification is this emerging term in the literature um, and that we know that disasters, whether they're climate related or geologic disasters, that they break open existing inequalities. And um, there's really interesting work being done in my research group actually um, about a uh, queer methodology to disaster risk reduction and incorporating um, queer and um yeah like uh epistemologies into disaster risk frameworks because normally those disaster risk frameworks are um geared towards like you're saying homeowners single family nuclear family um and they don't consider multi-generational families they don't consider alternative family structures um, folks, if your first language is in English, citizenship status, they, they don't, that's not their first look, right? The, the mainstream disaster risk reduction frameworks. But then when it comes to displacement, maybe like elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, well, I don't have a firm number, but I want to say about 5,000 people are still displaced after the 2020 wildfires. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
So there can be preemptive measures in place to where if you were to do more of an equitable stance when designing your CWPP plans, um, generally uh, you hear the phrase of equal equality um, within planning. However, shifting it to more of an equitable stance within hazard planning tends to be more of an effective model, especially since hazards can affect communities differently. As shown by homeowners, they had the resources to rebuild their houses. And so these models that we're designing, especially within CWPPs, should be best serving the communities that will be impacted the most. Um, and that's why yeah, going back to having multiple translations of the plans, going out, having registries of these communities, and then making those connections before um, the fire event, rather than so that roots back to that proactive outreach rather than reactive outreach. Um, in that general mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, and I think with that, like, one thing that really came up in interviews was a community that is resilient to hazards is also a really great place to live in normal everyday life. Um, mm -hmm. A place that is walkable, where you know your neighbors, um, is safe, you feel safe, you feel a sense of community is also, you know, it's it serves both needs. Um, and so there's this idea of blue skies planning and versus gray skies. And so incorporating equity from the get-go, that that is your first thought. That That's a critical part. And that's where that institutional change comes in, that the inception of these institutions was not on equity. So... How do we change that? How do we adapt to that? Thank you very much. We have we, we have a question or a comment. No, I have a, a question uh, for the Kingfisher projects. Could you tell us the I was guess best argument against the project? What was the content of oh the gosh. people fighting you? I don't I didn't understand that. I think it was a. Uh, kind of smack dab in the beginning of the pandemic. And quite frankly, I think uh, there were some people on the street that just thought it was a conspiracy. They didn't really understand why we would be doing this because it didn't seem to be for a great amount of profit. We had people say to us things like, why are you building it there? That is a beautiful lot. You should be building condos there. You know, and our whole point was everybody deserves to live at the beach. You know, this is not just a place for the privileged. Um, and I think, I think in some ways, people just thought that it was going to wreck and change their community, just sort of a fear of the unknown, a fear of people that maybe weren't just like them. Um, but the, the hardest part for us was there was a lot of misinformation spread. I mean, it was just incredible. And so there were a lot of people that were against it. And we would kind of see those people on Facebook saying things and call them and say, you know, just wanted to reach out and see what questions you have. And I noticed you said some things that weren't actually true. And do you want to meet and look at the plans? And, you know, it, it really didn't seem to matter. Um, people didn't really want to hear the truth. They really just wanted something to fight against. So... It was a very small number of people too, <laughs> but we had it's a like lot of very support. notable to me though, that you were like, you could call them and be like, Hey, oh, yeah. so I saw you at the grocery store. Um, you want to tell me what's up with these comments? Like <laughs> it's like, it's a community. You are it's really small. in the community. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. Um, I definitely hopefully this is an observation that turns into a question or maybe you can, I can drop it down and you pick it up. I'm getting exceedingly tired of the idea that people who do not live in local communities get to extract wealth from them while not bearing personal responsibility, boots on the ground to surviving crisis. And is there a way that, I don't know, in terms of whether it ends up being a land value tax or we look at the 
um, different partnerships between private and public entities, say, for example, Blair BNB, there's a company that rhymes with it, where it's like, you're taking a lot of value directly out of these communities for years. And the, the idea that people cannot grow up in a place where they literally have to live and may suffer a tsunami, that met metaphysics doesn't pencil out for me. So that's one observation slash question. And then the secondly for Coyote Gardens is like, how are there ways in which um, environmental resilience strategies can not only um, make projects more feasible, but also argue for the beauty aspect of living around? Because I've worked in a uh, sustainable landscaping company called Symbiot myself for about half a year. And it's just really amazing to see that you can have more beauty and more ecological diversity and fecundity by literally just putting roots in the ground, like metaphorically, but also very much important physically. And those two things from this presentation are the things that most weighed in my mind. Thank you. Um, so I, I assume the first portion of the question was primarily about vacation rentals, short-term rentals. I mean, there's there's other... There's another aspect to money leaving our community, and that's in, in the construction itself of a lot of these homes, because um, generally speaking, we've seen con in our 20 year career, we've seen contractors disappear from the coast and start coming in from the valley. So um, that money for construction is, is leaving our community um, because there's no place for contractors to live or their labor. Um, and then, and then same goes with vacation homes. It's really, um, a, a fraction of the services takes a fraction of the services that a, a lived in home would, would provide, you know, in terms of landscaping, house cleaning, um, shopping at the grocery store, going to the restaurants. And it's really, I, I I'm not going to profess to have the answer to that, but Lincoln County to our South and now Tillamook County is grappling with it in um in very sincere conscientious ways and so stay tuned is the right answer to that one uh, i have one point too which i thought was kind of interesting so our local schools actually waived our excise tax for the apartments because uh, they said that if we have families there with kids that'll actually bring money into the schools they actually need more kids in the schools that will help them make money um, and they're hoping to pre-lease a couple of apartments too for teachers. So, I mean, this is like a really dire situation. Um, it's also, you know, firefighters and police are living outside the county, commuting 45 minutes or more. So if you think about in an emergency, when you have a tsunami happen, for example, and you have 85% of the people are there on vacation, that's going to be mayhem, you know, even if you just have a small portion of people that live and work in the community and know what you do in these sorts of events, that's going to bring about some resiliency for sure. I love your second question too, about um, the power of landscape and beauty. Um, and, you know, like so much of this project, the proof is going to be in the pudding. Um, and it does track back to all these vacation homes because um, people that own vacation homes will not put much investment in the landscape. Um, and it's understandable. Um, we, on the other hand, uh, really have set a goal of creating sort of a, a flagship riparian planting for the Watershed Council and work in conjunction with the Watershed Council and also sort of take advantage of the unique uh, ecology that can exist there. So we're looking forward to the experiment of making things grow there. Um, just sort of out of our own personal interest. But I think um, I'm really looking forward to there being this gorgeous centerpiece in Pacific City that people drive by and eventually, you know, and ask, what what is that lovely building? And hopefully somebody will say it's workforce housing. Yeah. You know, and be proud of it. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. Sam. Hi. So this is kind of a pitch because I am with the Fair Housing Council. So I got to represent the fair housing perspective. Um, so, uh, in response to, uh, Councillor Panamaroff's, uh, uh, really well-articulated question, um, you know, the LCD is considering statewide affirmatively furthering fair housing rules and working that into the new, uh, land use processes. None of those things have been finalized. 
generally in AFFH stuff, uh, what gets measured are things like school performance or access to occupy to uh, you know sources of of employment or um, maybe access to transportation. Salem is a rare example where they actually measure like exposure to hazardous chemicals and seeing you know if if environmental pollution is there's a racial difference um, in, in those things. Why not make uh, hazard planning part of that as well, right? If you have racial discrepancies or other protected class disparities in terms of who is actually at risk um, to these these hazards, which are getting worse over time, um, then that should probably be something that DLCD is including in their um, evaluation of housing production strategies. So that's my pitch. Uh, looks like Ethan might be the last person from DLCD who's here, so get him, get corner. <laughs> I think that's it on our questions. Thank you so much again to our. All right. Well, you should all uh, feel very proud for making it through an incredibly uh, eventful, fact-filled, uh, fun-filled, inspirational day of policy discussion about housing across Oregon, uh, taking a look back, but really taking a lot of looks forward and how we can solve these problems ahead. So, Thank you so much. Thank you to our sponsors, Tomasi Brigger, Dubay, Winterbrook Planning, Fair Housing Council of Oregon, the ABA State and Local Government Section, to all the folks at HLA who helped put this on and all the volunteers out there. And we will see you again next year. If you are interested in volunteering, come talk to one of us board members because we'd love to have your help next year. Thanks.